はい、お願いします。こんにちは。あ、こんにちは。<笑>おはようございます。あ、皆さん、so、we are just about to start. あ皆さん、おはようございます。えー、DevSecOps。Good morning, everyone. DevSecOps Day 2 is going to start. Japan, Spain's World Cup.、Um, Japan won. So I do believe that、uh, you had a very good、uh, morning for、um, all day long. The group、uh, League One, where Japan was able to、uh, go through and qualified. It was good. So let me、uh, share with you today's、uh, list of、um, speakers. Or maybe it would be better to show Japanese version or English version. Nine o'clock. So let me、uh, share with you the Japanese、uh, version. Nine, where we are going to start now, followed by、uh, Mr. Kyle Fox、uh, to present. Rise of、uh, the software defined weapon accelerate or lose,、uh, followed by、uh, Dr. Linton Wells and Mr. Alan Reinhardt. And then DJ Shudin san and Mr. Hassan Yasal, who、uh, spoke、uh, yesterday too, and Mr. Oshiba, and then Mr. Semia from NTT Data, and Mr. Koike from、uh, Richelka, and、uh, a vice minister of the MIC, uh, or ex uh, vice minister、uh, MIC, Mr. Fujisue, and Mr. Fukuzawa. And then、uh, we do have some break、um, at around 2 30 Japan time. NRI, Mr. Huguzawa,、uh, he's going to discuss over the lecture with the、uh, use cases. And then、uh, Mr. Suli Chakdal, offshore、uh, testing services. And then Mr. Sakurai san from、uh, BrainPart、uh, to discuss over the data science.、Uh, what is the depth set ops、uh, to、um, be conducive? And Machinery and data, Kiba,、uh, data Foundation will be、uh, covered by him. And then we have another break and followed by、uh, Mr. Mariot, uh, and he's joining from the UK to discuss.、Uh, lastly, uh, Mr. Nikos Shannon,、uh, he used to be the Uh, Chief Software Engineering Officer for the um, US um, the Air Force and Aerospace. And then starting from、uh, 5.35, we invite the Mr. Okuda、uh, from、uh, METI. What is the、um, uh, deploying cybersecurity policies in Jap Japanese、uh, industries? So, this is the today's agenda item, and we are going to spend up until 6 30 today. It will be a long day, but hopefully, that you are going to enjoy. Has, I would like to ask Hassan to、uh, make an opening、uh, word. Thank you, Yusika. I'm really happy to be part of the second day event as well. I know we have been doing the DevSecOps days last three years. I'm really excited to see that the, the Japanese community is really picking up the DevSecOps and software engineering practices with the security thinking. I'm really, really excited to see a lot of interest. And also, I would like to congratulate the Japanese team as well. So, today's g o i n g to a d v a n c e for the second round. I'm hoping for, for them to get advanced one more time. And congratulations for the Japanese security team as well. So,、Thank、it's、you. really great event having a DevSecOps day s as a team together. It's a community event. And what really community event means as a DevSecOps community, we would like to get people are really sharing and exchanging information to each other. This is an opportunity for all of us exchanging and sharing information because the security knowledge is not just a study as we were thinking, it is requiring exchanging or sharing or some sort of a learning pieces. This is a platform for everyone to hear from each other. s Especially from our great speakers, they have a length of experience and they have a true experience with respect to security. They will share their journey, they will share the knowledge. As a community, we can improve our security postures. Why is it important? Because software is in everywhere, and software is really in every platform that we have been using it. And that's our responsibility to build up a security in our software. I'm hoping that. Having a DevSecOps days and similar e v e n t will increase our security postures, will increase our awareness, and we build up a secure world by using those practices. I'm looking forward to have a great session rest of the today and have a great exchange each of the members and as well as great speakers. 
Thank you, Hassan. And uh, ですね、えー、日本語で今から入りますね。今日は I'm going to discuss in Japanese now. The number of、um, registration is more or、uh, less than 1,600. Uh, so this is a large number. On a concurrent uh, basis, uh, the I can't uh, check uh, the statistic number yet, but yesterday more than 350 uh, people joined uh, in a concurrent manner. I think I see 100 people. Well, yesterday we got、uh, 350. I'm sure that、uh, the number is going to increase. So 1,600 people registered. So this is a very big uh, sized uh, conference, and I do believe that、uh, it is increasing every year. And what I、uh, see、uh, with the、uh, contents as well, it is increasing. As to the number of、uh, audience. And now I would like to、um, invite、uh, Mr. Kyle Fox,、uh, who is the CTO of、uh, Saucy.、Uh, as for Mr. Kyle uh, Fox, uh, Kyle Fox uh, Sam, uh, he, he was the,、um, he has been、uh, experiencing the、uh, US Air Force uh, nuclear um, chief uh, officer, chief software officer, and now he has、uh, been. Transferred to the um, ex the uh, private uh, company, and he recording in progress from Hawaii. So shall I say good morning or good evening? Oh, you see, I'm apologizing, and Kyle is connecting in a minute, and he got dropped out because of his connectivity, but he's connecting in a minute. Okay. Maybe I can say a few words about、uh, Kyle Fox. And he was the one of the DevSecOps i m p l e m e n t e r in a very highly regulated environment under Air Force. And there are a lot of complex systems. There were a lot of、uh, different embedded software development. And Kyle was serving as the chief software officer. s And he was able to show how DevSecOps is really helping. A special regulated environment like nuclear systems. He did an excellent job of creating various DevSecOps capabilities, including agile practices, even of including the software delivery and deployment to the end of the software. Why is important, honestly, for that piece is because usually when we talk about DevSecOps, we always thinking it is only for a web application, but it is not. So Kyle was able to present. Those DevSecOps practices was really beneficial for a safety critical systems and as well as for the very regulated environment because it is really requiring a lot of deployment challenges, a lot of delivery challenges, and very complex systems, very hardware component centric environment, and was ability to have those capabilities. And other things was done under his work, and he's going to talk a lot shortly. Then also, He did a lot of agile implementation as well. So, when we talk about the DevSecOps, we cannot really ignore the agile practices. We really have to connect both practices together. One is really supporting agile practices, and the other one is really DevSecOps practices together. And Kyle was able to demonstrate those capabilities as well and under the and Air Force、uh, capabilities. And, and also, he basically contributed many other initiatives as well in DevSecOps, and like such as the software bill of materials or supply chain implementations, and also the getting a DevSecOps into the classified environment as well. These are the good capabilities he has been done in this space. And I'm looking for his great talk. Then he's going to share the secrets behind it, like how he did it in a very complex environment. So you should be connecting soon. And I'm apologizing for the, that, 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 that rep.、Mm -hmm. And he is about to connect shortly.、I'm, I believe you, Sika. Yes, thank you. Ah, Kyle san, tatta gohun gurai mai. Mr. Kyle, about five minutes ago,、uh, he was here. And actually, we had some chat. And once we、uh, started,、um, I noticed that, that he was gone. So, shall we wait a little bit more? Well, this is a live uh, distribution, therefore. I, this, I think、uh, let's, if, you don't, if it's okay, Aaron,、expected. you want to pick up the Kyle slot? If you don't mind, maybe you can move with Aaron. Aaron is another great person. He is、oh. one of my heroes in the security chaos engineering. Will that be okay, Yusuka? So we can. Yes, or、oh? yeah. So this, yeah, yeah, let's do that. So, Aaron, can you, can you start over? 
Maybe we shall change the order、uh, while we are waiting for、uh, Mr. Kyle.、Uh, maybe we should cover the、uh, third agenda item, that is the Mr. Aaron Reinhardt's、uh, speech. So we are going to change number one and three. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. So it's a live session, so there's a trouble always. So, yeah,、right. so sorry to, you know, welcome, welcome,、uh, you know, introduce you、uh, right away now. But、uh, what would you,、uh, could you introduce yourself a little bit and then、uh, introduce your talk and please start it? Sure.、Um, Aaron Reinhardt.、Uh, I am. Most will be known as being the creator of security chaos engineering.、Um, I wrote the O'Reilly book on the topic、uh, and wrote several, I've written several O'Reilly books on it. And I have actually a version of this book, this size, coming out、uh, middle of next year.、Um, I'm known as being the creator of security based chaos engineering as well.、Um, and、uh, prior to,、um, Yeah, most recently, I was the CTO and co founder of Verica.io. I created that company with、uh, the creator of Chaos Engineering at Netflix. Prior to that, I was the chief security architect of United Health Group. It's the fourth largest company in the world.、Uh, and I also have a background working for Department of Defense and NASA and a few other places like that. So,、um, am I okay to go ahead and start sharing my slides? Hi, Kyle, I think we switched. So, high five.、Uh, Yeah, no, no problem.、Um, congratulations. Appreciate that, everybody. <laughs> okay. Congratulations to Japan on the World Cup. Yeah. Thank you. Promise there. Let me go ahead and share my slides. Okay. Choto mate. Please wait. Can you see? Yes, so you have, about, you have a 30 minute slot, and、uh, we'll take some questions. So, 20 or 25 minutes、uh, for, for your speech, it's up to you. But、uh, yeah, let's、uh, save time for、uh, taking questions. Okay, let's cover as much as we can, then, okay? Yes. All right, so、uh, today I'm going to talk about the application of chaos engineering to cybersecurity, how it can be applied to help instrument your systems. Post deployment or security.、Uh, and I'm going to talk about how that helps you build safe, secure, reliable systems at complex, large scales.、Uh, down here, you'll see my email address, Aaron at se.dev. And at Aaron Reinhardt is my Twitter.、Uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime you want to go in the chat.、Uh, also, this QR code is my LinkedIn if you would like to connect with me professionally. So, yeah, like I said, a little bit about me.、Um, I'm the former Chief Security Architect at the Health Group.、Uh, I have a background in safety and reliability engineering at NASA. I did some work in the DoD. I've written several books about the material we're going to talk about today. So, don't worry, there's plenty of things to follow up on. And if you'd like a copy of the book, I'm sure we can find a way to get you guys a copy over there. All right. So, the nature of the problem is that All these great things we're doing in software, even DevSecOps, even DevOps, the cloud,、um, you know, even modern,、uh, even more modern software engineering practices like WASM,、uh, WebAssembly, is、uh, we don't seem to be getting much better at the problem. Outages seem to be happening more often. Breaches also seem to be happening more often. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why I believe that is. So, why is this? I mean, what are we doing wrong? Well, the problem is our systems have fundamentally evolved beyond our human abilities to mentally model their behavior. What we think the system is in our heads and what it is in reality is no longer true. And the argument is to be made it was probably never true. And furthermore, the speed, scale, and complexity of modern software is hard. This is hard, it's challenging stuff,、um, especially for humans. So, software, furthermore, software has officially taken over the stack. I mean,、um, you know, if you see on the right here, this is the new OSI model software, 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 software. Ha 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 ha, I know. 
It's kind of true though. Well, um, another important thing to recognize about software as a construct. Software will never decrease in complexity. It only increases in complexity. Uh, it, it's uh, because if you have a complex piece of software and you want to make it simple, what do you have to do to do that? You have to make a change, right? There's an inherent relationship between making a change to a piece of software and just adding more complexity. So what we need to start doing is learn to navigate complexity, not try to simplifying complexity does not work in software. Um, there's been many uh, seminal works in the re research on this topic, as well as uh, I'm sure many, many people have tried to actually simplify software. Really, in the end, all you're really doing is moving complexity around. A lot of times complexity comes from uh, the business and how the business operates and functions. It inherently finds its way in do things like Conway's Law. Um, and also the, the ways in which we build software also contribute to that complexity. So it's better to learn to navigate it than try to simplify it. Let's, so for, to make my point a little clear, clearer, let's talk about even in Japan, all across the world, we all have the concept of legacy systems. Most of us think about the mainframe, right? Mainframe is still running most of the world, right? Um, and but we wouldn't have a term called legacy if if we you know if we could get rid of it. Legacy, what legacy has come to mean, it means stable. It means business critical. It means uh, mission essential. The, uh, and also somewhat you know the our legacy systems seem to be somewhat well understood by the business and by the engineers that run and manage them. Uh, and um, they, they tend not to be problematic, right? But the question I started posing to myself was, was this always the case? Was our legacy systems always so well known, always so stable, always so mature? The answer is no, it was not, right? So we, we, we quickly learned uh, about how uh, the system really worked through a series of unforeseen events, outages, incidents. Um, you know, errors, those sorts of things. That what those things do is they inform us that uh, our mental model of what we thought the system was and what it actually was were different. The problem with learning this way is that customers uh, and, and as well as our uh, engineering partners incur pain and loss of productivity. Chaos engineering as a discipline is a proactive way of achieving this maturity without causing the pain. We're proactively making sure the system can do what it's supposed to do before it fails. We're not creating chaos. There's no creating chaos in chaos engineering. We'll clear that up. So another important point is we forget that systems engineering is a messy exercise. In the beginning of the life cycle of a system, right? We love to think it's so clear. We have a plan, we have time, resources, money. We've got our code repository, our, our Docker images, our secrets, our staging. We got a nice 3D diagram of the system. In reality, the system never looks like this and never portrayed anything like it. Uh, because what happens is after, after we deploy the system, uh, after a few weeks or a few months, uh, we slowly learning about how the system really works uh, through a series of DNS outages or certificate expiration or code freezes or Google hires your best engineer. Your system, Sydney Decker, one of the world's experts in complex safety systems, likes to call this the drift into failure, the drift into the unknown. So over time, our system uh, becomes something we don't really understand anymore. So our systems, in the end, have become more complex and messy than we remember them initially being. So what does all this stuff have to do with uh, DevSecOps? Look, I'm, I'm getting there, okay? So furthermore, cybersecurity is a context-dependent discipline, okay? So um, as a software engineer, my job is uh, to build and deliver business value to customers via software, right? So I'm constantly in there changing the system, right? Uh, but I need the flexibility to change the components in the system to, uh, to, to, to try to meet that business value. So I don't know what the permissions are yet. I don't know what, I'm not even sure I can build what I've been being asked to build. So I need the flexibility to build that value and then secure it. So 
so software engineers are constantly in the system changing and calibrating it to move towards business value. Okay. Well, um, cybersecurity is context dependent. You must know what you're trying to secure in order to know what needs to be secured about it. Uh, you need to understand the context of the object, the principle, whatever you're trying to. Uh, so cybersecurity by design as a discipline is forced into a staple understanding. It's not that we're not doing it. Uh, it's not that we don't want to do it any different way. It's just we, we need to know the context before we know what to do. Well, what happens is, is software engineers never stop changing the system. So as soon as we, we come forth, we build some great security on the context we derive, but engineers never stop changing the system. And what we do is we fail to recalibrate or fail to know we need to recalibrate is, the, is part of the problem. We don't know that our security no longer works until it no longer works, which is where the problem resides. So you can think of um, chaos engineering in the world of instrumentation. Remember, all science, all engineering revolves around measurement and instrumentation. So uh, you can think of um, chaos engineering as more of experimentation. I like to loosely define testing as the verification or validation of something you already know to be true or false. You know what you're looking for before you go looking for it. In our world, in security, it's like an attack pattern, a CVE, a signature, um, you know, Yara rule rules, whatever. Um, and um, uh, whereas experimentation, we're trying to derive new information that we previously did not know. By through through sending a series of, of hypotheses to the system. Uh, going on further, um, so like I said before, the current state of, uh, of of operations is we don't know our security controls don't work until they don't work. A lot of times, that's in the form of security incident, some kind of compromise, some kind of uh, tool not reporting in, some kind of error alert or monitoring. Uh, tool telling us it's not working. We have historically not been very good at one, uh, once we've been compromised at detecting that compromise. So what chaos engineering is, especially for security, is we're proactively making sure the technology, the teams, the processes, the run books, making sure all these things actually still can do what they're supposed to do before the problem happens. Because when a problem happens, uh, you, you, you're not, uh, you can't afford it to, to, uh, to do those kind of things. So what normally happens during a security incident, okay? What happens is, what happens during a security incident is people freak out, okay? People, uh, people are they're worried about being blamed for the problem, uh, shamed because everyone knows it's them, uh, and you know, they're worried about losing their, um, their job, frankly, you know? And within 15, 30 minutes, some executive is on the phone saying, get that thing back up and running, we're losing money, the help desk is overwhelmed, the, the press is calling me. This is not, this environment is not where we do chaos engineering. So we don't do chaos engineering here, okay? This is hard, this is a hard way to learn. So we do chaos engineering here. When there is no active problem, right? When there is no war room, there is no active incident or outage. We're proactively exploring and making sure the system can do what it was designed to do. So remember, no, no chaos engineering here. This, this is our world. This is the world we live in now. We're going from war room to war room to outage to outage to war room to war room. And it doesn't have to be that way. So we don't do chaos engineering here. We do it here. Okay. So chaos engineering, what is this stuff? All right. So the original Netflix definition is, is, is the, the discipline of experimentation on a distributed system in order to build confidence, building confidence, the system's ability to withstand the turbulent conditions we designed it for, okay? So it's really, you can think about it as building trust and confidence, okay? More than, it's, more, it's about establishing order, confidence, trust, by just inserting the conditions we designed the system to operate under. It'll make more sense in a second. So actually, let me come back here. So things like, if you can think about things like disaster recovery, failovers, circuit breakers, uh, you could, security detective, security preventative controls. We design all these, all that logic for when X happens, Y should kick in, some sort of trigger, right? So uh, the problem is the system uh, changes a lot uh, uh, since the time we actually built uh, that logic. And, mo and, uh, mo and, and as a result, the majority of the time uh, when the problem occurs, the logic is no longer effective. So all we're really doing is proactively saying, hey, 
do you still do what I designed you to do? And you'd be surprised how often that does not happen. So there are several books on chaos engineering. Uh, I've listed one on the right here. That's the main body of knowledge, chaos engineering from my co-founder, America. Uh, the book in black is this book you see here, uh, which is the, uh, the original rebel report. And then the book here on the left is the official animal book on security chaos engineering. If you have an O'Reilly account, you can go get a pre-release uh, first four chapters of that, uh, but it will officially come out towards the middle of next year. So who's doing chaos engineering? So I made this slide about set, six, seven years ago now, right? So there, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people doing this all across every industry across the world. Um, now, there, there's all, a wide variety of maturity, but uh, this is becoming a regular practice. Furthermore, um, you're not going to be able to get away with not doing it. You're going to have to do this. It's one of the only ways we have to to uh, proactively instrument our post-deployment live running systems safely and effectively uh, and mitigate the, uh, the potential for outages. So what is security-based chaos engineering? Well, ask yourself this question. How do I know the security I built and delivered actually works? I mean, how do I, how do I know? I mean, how do you really know? Right. Well, uh, hoping it works is not an effective strategy. So as engineers, we don't, there's two things we don't believe in, or I don't believe in. I don't believe in hope and I don't believe in luck, right? It's not an effective strategy. It, that kind of strategy works in hoping your security works or, you know, uh, hoping that you're lucky that you don't get breached. Uh, doesn't really work. It works in Star Wars, but it doesn't work for what we do. Um, so what we're trying to achieve in, with security chaos engineers, we're trying to understand our system and it's security gap before an adversary identifies them and exploits them. So there's several use cases beyond this slide, uh, but here's just some high level use cases for a client. I started pioneering the craft of security chaos engineering through architectural control validation. I wanted to verify that the controls were, that I recommended like firewalls or, or uh, API gateways that they were placed correctly, configured correctly, and I need a way, uh, an objective, empirical way to actually skip all the humans and ask the computer questions. Hey, computer, do you do what you're supposed to do? Do you block a misconfigured port? Do you, when a new uh, privileged user is is is, uh, is created, do you launch and send an alert? Like, do you do the things you're supposed to do? Uh, other use cases, uh, the second use case I started applying it to was instant response. Instant response is a reactive exercise. It's hard to know if you're very good at it because you're, you're, you're always reacting to problems. It's hard to compare them. But when you're proactively introducing the conditions in, in a very safe way, you can start measuring things you can never measure before. Do you have enough people on call? Did the technology work? Did you have the right log data? Was the log data readable? Uh, did the teams uh, uh, you know, execute the rumbles correctly? So there's a lot of great use there. Furthermore, uh, it, it's a great way to proactively evaluate and score your uh, logging, your metrics, and your alerting to make sure that's working uh, and, and, and usable during an incident. And the last use case here is compliance. All chaos experiments, whether it's availability, stability, or security, have compliance value. So it's a response real quick. It's a response, the problem, like I said, is you're reacting, you're responding to a problem. Well, security incidents are subjective in nature. No matter how much you prepare, uh, you really don't know very much. You don't know where they're attacking you, why they're attacking you, who it is attacking you, what they're trying to do, and how they're going to get it. You don't know that. You prepare lots of things. You spend lots of money. You hire lots of people. But you're still not sure exactly when, where, why, or how that's going to happen. But So you're waiting to find out a problem occurs, and then you're trying to figure out if it was good. That's not a very good strategy. That's kind of a hopeful strategy. So with chaos engineering, security chaos engineering, we proactively introduce these conditions and failure modes in the system to make sure that we're prepared uh, and that our systems are functioning in a healthy way for when something like that does happen. So how does this, how does it work, right? Well, I originally wrote a tool called Chaos Slinger when I was the United Health Group uh, with a team of folks. Uh, it's open source, you can go to GitHub. Uh, it's deprecated. I'm no longer at that company, 
But you can look at the code. It's AWS Lambdas written in Python. Uh, and there's a simple framework for writing the experiments. I'm going to go over the, uh, the main experiment that we used uh, to start off with the United Health Group called Portslinger. So uh, what we started doing was, so uh, as um, you know, United Health Group, very, very large healthcare company, one of the largest in the world, one of the largest companies in the world, we uh, moved to the cloud, with, we're going to AWS. We needed to, um, we expected that, um, we were very strong and dependent on firewalls. So what we want, our expectation was when uh, there's a misconfigured or unauthorized port change within our AWS instances, that we have that covered, that that is something that we have designed for, we verified. So what we did was we built a, 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 a experiment called Portslinger. What it does is it proactively, it pseudo randomly selects the most EC2 security groups um, that are tagged for chaos. And it will um, pseudo randomly open or close a port that wasn't already open or closed. What we're trying to do is send the signal to the system to, to kick off the chain, right? So we started doing this on our AWS instances. And what was interesting was is the, uh, the firewalls only detected the, uh, the misconfigured ports about 60% of the time. Uh, so that was the first thing we learned. So we United Health Group, we had commercial and non-commercial software. So all we had to do is uh, we had a drift problem. We, uh, we just had to recalibrate. No problem. Remember, there was no incident. There was no breach. There was no problem. We, we proactively found this problem. We fixed it. The second thing we expected was is that uh, we weren't expecting was the cloud native configuration management tool caught it and blocked it every time. So we didn't expect that to happen. It was more effective than the tool we expected. Third, uh, our third expe uh, expectation was, is that a fifth thing we learned was that um, uh, we expected both tools or, or the environment to provide us a good log data to generate alert. Um, I was not very confident because we were new to the cloud that that would work. Well, it turns out it did work. So we correlated an event, I sent the alert to the security operations center analyst. Uh, but when the analyst got the alert, they couldn't tell which AWS instance it came from. And now as an engineer, you might be thinking, um, oh, Aaron, you can get the IP address and map it back. Or, but you know, there, there are things, there are NAT gateways that have SNAP in play. And so it could take you 15 minutes or three hours to figure out wh wh what instance that is potentially. So, um, uh, and keep in mind, one of the largest healthcare companies in the world, largest companies in the world, one minute of downtime is almost a million dollars. So, but, uh, but since there was no incident, we are all we had to do all we, was, is uh, is add a metadata pointer to the alerts uh, and to put that to provide the environment variables and data, and there and, and uh, there wasn't a problem, right? We fixed the problem. We were able to proactively identify all these things and remediate them. But what if what if a live running system and incurred all these problems, we would be, we would, that would be chaos engineering, right? We proactively are just making sure the system does what it's supposed to do by in, injecting faults and failures uh, that we expect to, uh, to have remediated. Oops. And so in summary, um, it's uh, what we're trying to do is navigate complexity with chaos engineering and it's in security chaos engineering. It's about building confidence. Uh, in, in our security proactively, instead of just blindly building things, we are continuously verifying that uh, the system does what it's supposed to do. There are, there are, um, and it's about being proactive, not reactive. Uh, and um, there are several books on this topic. Uh, if you don't want to read, you can always uh, email me or DM me on Twitter. I'm happy to meet with anybody. Oh, that's the end. Thank you. So uh, let's take, <clears throat> excuse me, let's take Q&A. And uh, I'm watching the uh, the chat, but not yet. So uh, let me ask <clears throat> from myself. And uh, two things is one thing is that uh, I, I, I assume or I guess that there's always hesitation to do uh, such experimental thing on the... <clears throat> environment and how do you how what kind of culture would allow 
such you know uh, the experimental culture engineering that's one thing and uh, another thing is that you picked the um uh what did you say but uh, at the united health group that you picked the, a case that uh, misconfigured port injection you tried it and then you find out you know only six percent sixty percent firewall actually firewalled and then such things but how did you come how did you choose the case so two Those things are. about the culture and also how did you choose the case so, which means you know i i <clears throat> the reason why i ask is that that uh, i know that not so many japanese companies have done chaos engineering although you know you we've seen like a six seven years ago that all the logos are already tried it tried it and started to do it but uh, <clears throat> uh i believe that, that there's not much in japan so that what and, and then what's the you know tips to start over the chaos engineering for for first timers so, so actually three things <laughs> complex but Sure. Yeah. No, happy to help. No. So the first one, I'll address the culture for chaos engineering. So actually, believe it or not, chaos engineering was born out of cloud transformation. Basically, Netflix, when they were moving from DVDs in the data center to the cloud, they were building these services, microservices, and the Amazon machine images were disappearing. Right. Uh, and they needed to build their services to be resilient to the to that problem of them disappearing. So they built a tool called Chaos Monkey, which was the very beginning of chaos engineering. But like, so it helped them verify that what they were building in the cloud actually do was doing what it was supposed to do. Still today, the majority of people adopting chaos engineering is kind of starts at cloud transformation. And it's normally like a, a flagship or the main product for a company that does it. Um, and uh, you know, but a good culture in general is an SRE culture. But let me let me um, let me let me actually also make a clarifying point, right? So chaos engineering, we're not we're not creating chaos. We're not injecting randomness. There's no randomness to this. We're not pulling cables. This is not a monkey in a data center doing things. It's a horrible analogy that people, uh, some people in the startup land and people on the speaking on a circuit want to say because it sounds cool. That's not what it is. It's not. So it's it's about. All we're doing, so if you're gonna build um, it's a failover or circuit breaker technology or, sec or security, I don't know, uh, detective uh, capability, wouldn't you wanna invest a little time in a test to make sure it actually works? Does that make sense? So it's like, it's a failure. It's not a, we're not attacking the system at all. We're not trying to create chaos. We're not trying to bring it down. We're trying to just make sure because the system's changing so often so fast, no one knows what the system is anymore, right? So we're just verifying that these key things, these are, are still there. So the culture I question is a software engineering one. And what I mean by that is testing is a core component of what we do as software engineers. What we need now is a way of, of testing the post-deployed world. It's becoming a, a, a living organism on its own. So that's kind of the culture in a nutshell. I can, I can expand on it if you want. Uh, the other one is also a really great question. This th this is all written in the books. I have a huge section on this, but chaos engineering or security chaos engineering, you start with the same place, in my opinion, right? Is go look at your past incidents, right? Ask your incident team to get access to the database and read them. Read the by the priority one incidents and the recent security incidents and see what um uh you know, uh, what, because everyone remembers that outage. Everyone remembers that big incident, right? It probably cost money out of the incident budget. Uh, there was probably loss of productivity. But if you're going to make the case for chaos engineering, what you do is you, you, you say, okay, we fixed this. This was a big problem. This cost us a lot of money. Let's make sure what we did to fix it still works, right? That way you can tie it to dollars, you know, to an executive to say, okay, we're going to, we're going to probably verify that this won't happen again. Uh, all, we, all we're doing is testing it, right? Because uh, we say we fixed it. Uh, and it's a great way. Uh, I really think incident data is the key to a lot of maturity in um, or outage data, incident data is the key to maturity in a lot of organizations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So uh, when is, uh, maybe we have to move to the next, but the, when is your book translate into translated into in, uh, Japanese. Yongo? Uh, Yongo. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. O'Reilly might do that. I don't know. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, um, you have to ask them. <laughs> yeah, think, I'll talk to O'Reilly in Japan. Don't they, don't they translate on the website? I think they translate some. O'Reilly. Uh, I think so. I don't know. Yeah, hope to get it, your book in Japanese. Yeah. And please buy everybody. <laughs> okay. thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please come back for next year. Yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Then uh, let's move to Mr. Kyle Fox. But before starting uh, Mr. Mr. Fox's presentation, I want to double check with Dr. Wells that uh, if he can stay longer than uh, his original schedule. Dr. Wells, can you stay longer? We're switching the presentation mm -hmm. now, and uh, you will have to stay 30 minutes more, 30 or 40 minutes more than the original. No, no problem. problem. Okay. No problem. Okay. Okay. So let's introduce Kyle, Mr. Kyle Fox. And uh, let me speak in Japanese. <laughs> Kyle Fox san wo ga, eh, to, let me introduce uh, Mr. Kyle Fox because Hassan was dropped and for a considerable amount of time. And then we were able to uh, introduce him already. So he was with the Air Force US and the Chief Software Engineer and the Weapon Systems, except uh, OPS, WebSEP uh, OPS was he, what he said. And uh, especially Sentinel Project, ICBM, uh, Continental, Intercontinental Missile, uh, WebSEP OX, uh, that's what he worked on. Okay now. You you mute yourself. Can you unmute? Yeah. Yes. Hi everyone. Okay. So thanks everybody hanging on for the uh, having patience through the technical glitch. Uh, but yeah, uh, to get going here. Okay. So I'm Kyle Fox. I'm now the chief technology officer for SOCI, um, and it's a company that does a variety of things like software modernization, cloud modernization for uh, the intelligence communities in the United States. Uh, we work with our justice systems for immigration processing. We work with different military components to get them on the cloud. And I'm really excited to talk about, um, and you'll see my resource stuff at the very end of the brief. We're working hard on extending cloud for our allies, including Japan, so that it, during conflict, it's much easier for us to share data. You kind of at the speed of relevancy. So this theme will kind of, this brief will tie back to that. Previously though, I was the first chief software officer inside of, oh, I'm sorry, the first chief software engineer for the United States Air Force. And as part of that, I was working on this nuclear modernization program where we took the existing ICBM and we greenfielded, we came up with a brand new design. And so throughout this talk, I'll kind of give a highlight of how we had to think about where the world is going and then making sure that this deterrent is effective for its entire service life. So. To help us think through that, we really have to consider that we live in in exponential times, right? And what does that mean? So you think about the adoption rate for landlines in the United States to have a, a physical landline have a 50% market penetration. So this is over half the houses in the United States actually having a landline that was over 50 years, five decades. Um, we've seen cell phones and these great computing devices. It reached half the market in the United States in roughly 15 years. So you can see just how fast we're starting to see. <laughs> Another aspect is on data. So we saw that in the 1950s, this device here was, oh, sorry, I'm getting some feedback. There we go. Apologize. So in 1950, this device that you see here was five megabytes of data. And we know now that the absolutely exponential explosion of data that's being generated, where it's projected by 2025, almost 300 zettabytes of data will exist. And in fact, over 90% of the data that humanity has ever created was created in the past 24 months. So the flip side of that is also the vulnerability aspect of it. So if you look at the critical vulnerabilities, it's another similar trend where we're just seeing this incredible ramp and for the Sentinel program, we were going to we're going to be operational in 2029, which if the trend continues means that there would be over 1 million unique CVEs annually, right? So now 
how do we really think through this in the, in the broader scope of the program? So first I'm gonna lay out like, why do we do nuclear deterrence and why, why is it so important? So we, we saw that after the nuclear era, right? Humanity realized really it's most peaceful time that it's ever encountered. We saw global conflict between major players drop down to a level that we've never seen before and stay stable through that entire period. Okay. So with the Sentinel program and our sister modernization programs like the new bomber, the strike program and the new sub, the Columbia program. Uh, it, it's about maintaining this global stability. And remember, these are peacekeeping weapons. They're a deterrent weapon. And for us to really have that credible deterrence, it has to accommodate all of that changing um, dynamicism that the world is going to, uh, that how quickly technologies are happening, how fast data is moving, how important that decision speed is. Okay. So that brings us to DevSecOps. And I want folks to really think about through the rest of this brief, I know we all come from IT or software backgrounds, but please just set that aside for just a second. And let's break down a little bit of what is the purpose of DevSecOps and how is it really enabling us to make decisions at speed? So we realized again, early in the program that the way that we used to procure things was not suitable for the future fight. We had to change the way that not only are we designing our software, but we have to change the way that we're even operating these systems. It's no longer going to be a single system that sits static for years, if not decades, as is the current ICBM. Instead, it must be a system that is continually evolving. So we drop that cost of change to something that is just ubiquitous. We change all the time. So we evolve to what the customer needs. We evolve to how the world is changing. And again, we overmatch threats because we're in an infinite game, right? It's a game where um, there is no end. The, the game is really just a matter of uh, keeping pace with your adversary by, again, that decision speed. So how do you really get there? How, what, what is that recipe for agility? And we found that the number one thing on top of everything else is delivery, period. Not just delivery to a lab, but a delivery to something that's actually functional by someone that's operating the mission. So we were seeing legacy systems that were operating with 18 months, 24 months, even longer periods between when we do a delivery of a capability uh, in, in DOD. And this is just an impossible position to try to manage. You can imagine only having every two years the opportunity to learn and change. It's so incredibly difficult to take advantage of not just modern technology, but even keep pace with the learning that happens in the system. What happens is it turns out that it's something that's too hard to change. And so we just don't. Uh, we live with it. Right. And that's something that is unacceptable. Again, when we look at that ramp that I showed earlier. So to get us there, three key things, again, all based on delivery. The first is architecting our systems for speed. The next is organizing ourselves and our entire delivery chain around delivering for speed. And then that our favorite, you know, integrate, automate, optimize. So what does architecting for speed look like? So what we saw was legacy systems, right? We saw this uh, definitely in like the IT community from uh, just a couple of years ago, where we went from these monolithic systems where you had to change everything to change anything to now to see this modularity where we're starting to see the hardware and the software separate a bit. Uh, then we started to see software become more modular with the invention of uh, microservices and related technologies. And then now we're seeing this environment where change again is something that's ubiquitous. So what is so fascinating about this is remember, we're talking about a, a nuclear weapon system here and related systems. These high assurance systems, ultra high assurance systems where human lives are at risk, we're seeing the same pattern now. We're seeing common COTS style hardware be the basis of all functionality being subsumed in software because software we can change cheaply, quickly, and safely. We're also seeing this trend for a, a real embrace of digital engineering and modularity techniques. So this is important that programs are really savvy. They understand what pieces of that product will change. 
right? Modularity is important, but you must guide it. So you have to literally understand where is your technology changing? Where is your market or your adversary or whatever inputs that you have? How is that changing? And then design your system around it. So those places that have that frequent change, you're doing it safely. You, you're thinking about how you can bring in uh, good market forces with IP encapsulation and intellectual property. You're thinking about it from a technology perspective, using solutions that are modular. And then again, you're surrounding this with a delivery ecosystem that can support operating at speed. So on that, how do we build our organizations to do this? And again, I, I come from a software background, an embedded engineering background, so I love to talk about the developers. And I do think they're at the heart of this. And my goal is really to turn most folks into maybe a little bit more of a developer. And I'm also enjoying where I become a little bit smarter on all of these other stakeholders that are involved with delivering a capability. But some ones that often get left off, especially for teams that have not encountered a high assurance system or a nuclear system is there's things like cybersecurity we talk about clearly there are system safety standards uh, some of these are international standards that want to make sure that that device right will actually operate in a way that we can guarantee it won't harm human lives it always does what it needs to and it never does what it shouldn't do. So those folks, uh, they could be called assurance, uh, they could be called certification. It's important that you take those stakeholders in and you involve them as early as possible in the program. It's also important that you show them this change again from big batch delivery, infrequent big batch delivery to rapid small delivery of value. And at first they're gonna be extremely resistant, hesitant, scared of this. Because the feeling is, is that, you know, there's no control. How do we understand what's happening if everything is changing all the time? But bringing them back to the value of doing DevSecOps is the ability to learn along the way. So if you show these teams, these stakeholders, how as you do a delivery, you're learning on that piece of capability. You're incrementally building up the capacity of that system, the capabilities of that system, and the differences between that big batch delivery and those smaller frequent deliveries is that they get a say along the way as that system is evolving. Okay, next thing, very important. So as we talk about these high assurance systems, one of the things that's often left off is again, these communities are treated as an island. We've talked about cyber, we're starting to talk about that more and more. But it's important, again, that we pull in the processes that are involved with system safety, with nuclear surety, which is the United States way to verify nuclear weapons operations. Uh, there's other things that have a say or have equity in making sure that that system has some sort of desired behavior. It's always doing what it should and never what it shouldn't. Uh, so in Sentinel, for example, the system safety column, that, that bottom bit there, in the United States, there are almost 60,000 requirements for a high assurance system, something that has a high likelihood of if it goes wrong, that people could die. And so the way that our system really was made to accommodate that was a zero compromise approach to accommodating their concerns. We took their standards and similar to the way the cyber secu cybersecurity community approached it, we broke down their controls to something that we could verify that we're producing in our software pipelines, our test pipelines, our verification and delivery pipelines. We're demonstrating that that behavior that they're seeking is always met. We also were able to go one step further and show in our operational systems that, again, we're bringing in lots of telemetry. We're using data all the time. We have policy enforcement in place. So those things that they are really concerned about, that we all should be concerned about because they're safety related, we're able to not just do, okay, let's spend all this work and get it right once. Instead, let's get it right continuously. And once we're able to get that continuous assurance going, then that, again, opens the floodgates on doing frequent changes, rapid changes throughout the life of your program. Um, the DO-178C call out on here. So this is an international aviation standard, and it is kind of funny because it's an air aviation standard, but you'll see this is being used in many systems. So we used it on our ground aspects of the system. There are space uh, systems that are using this. It's turning into a standard that is tailorable uh, to really be just kind of a good framework to think about how to take high assurance software and break it into pieces. Uh, my favorite bit with DO 178C is this section called the PSAC, the Planned Software Aspects 
of certification. And what we used that for is we took the circle on the left here, those interlapping circles, and we looked at, okay, for a particular component, um, what is everybody's trust level, risk level, concern level? What level of investment do they want us to make in some sort of test or control? And then we basically just took a high watermark so that across all those communities, we were able to say, well, you know, cybersecurity for this thing, you know, they don't really care as much about it. But system safety is very concerned. They want to have X technique. They want to have MCDC testing or something like that. They set the high bar. That's what our development teams will build towards. That's critical so that you don't go partway or even worse, all the way to a program right up to a finish line. And then you're not matched in that expectation. The assumptions were different between certification teams driving these crazy rework loops or even worse, um, these battles between who can sign off on what, who can say yes. So getting everybody on the same page with this evidence-based continuous approach to certification. And again, reminding them you're moving from big bash to frequent deliveries of value along the way, it's critical. Okay. The other part of this is, I've mentioned this a little bit, is bringing in these communities to not only shift left, but shift right. And so that means that we want to drive to this thing where we're not just doing continuous delivery to a lab or a staging environment for these cyber physical systems. That's kind of where the most programs are today that have really embraced it. But instead, we need to take these systems and do delivery all the way out to that end production, that end system, where it's actually delivering value to who's using it. We have to add telemetry to those systems. We have to have behavioral enforcement to those systems from policy agents. And then we need to show how this is an end-to-end -end approach of maintaining that agreement with these different certification stakeholders that the system is performing as it needs to. That means, again, that opens up the, the floodgates or puts the gas pedal down on our ability to safely make changes incredibly, um, in an incredible agile and fast manner. Right. Okay. And then the last thing that we really must do uh, to do this at speed and scale is this idea of ubiquitous connectivity. And it sounds kind of obvious saying it, but there is this tendency, especially with these cyber physical, you know, hardware, software embedded systems and high assurance systems like subways, airplanes, weapon systems uh, to have different environments, to have a, a developer environment where they're allowed to touch and interact with because it's sort of this low risk environment. If a developer breaks something, it's fine. It's a development environment. Uh, there's a tendency to build test environments like labs where you hook up things, you have physical devices. And then there's this uh, kind of production system where it's sort of shielded from everything. That's the wrong model. Instead, we have to have this similar to the previous chart. We have to have everything connected across the board. Otherwise, what happens is we break those telemetry streams. We break that ability to learn from the uh, device actually being used in operation. And we now become anti-DevOps. And instead, it's sort of this waterfall approach doing DevOps kind of you know, jerky um, DevOps for maybe a portion of the life cycle and then stopping for a period and waterfall after that and then DevOps again. Um, that is an incredibly frustrating, expensive, and slow way of building systems, and we have to move beyond that. So I wanted to just end with uh, this concept of the software-defined weapon. And but you can extend this to any safety critical system. You know, it's been said very famously that software is eating the world. And now I'd like to say it's even coming for the embedded systems and the high insurance systems and the systems that as humans, we rely on every day and has safety impacts for us every day. And the reason why is because, again, you remember those technology curves that are happening. There is a unquenchable thirst for data. There is an unquenchable thirst for the expansive technology. That's who we are as humans. The only technology that can support that level of cadence today is a software-based technology. So we're seeing even for the most critical systems, this drive to having common hardware, typically COTS, not specialized, all functionality being assumed in software. And so I hope that excites, delights, and terrifies everybody on this call because the responsibility of delivering these things in a way that you know protects all of these humans that are around us, our friends, family, and um, uh, you know cohorts. We we really must think about how we use DevOps as an enabler to still realize that rapid delivery, but we do it in a no sacrifice manner for the safety, security, and effectiveness 
of those futures uh, of those features because literally human lives are at risk. Okay, uh, by just get off the stage shirt and open up any questions. So again, I, I'm with Soci. Uh, you can get my contact info from that QR code there. Uh, we're uh, mostly a defense company, but we also are supporting again DOJ work, our Department of Justice in the United States. Uh, we do work with intelligence communities. We're working to connect uh, high assurance secret cloud environments with mission partners like Japan. Uh, we're a company that is really wanting to partner with both technology companies uh, and folks that want to do what I'm talking about here to take DevSecOps or high assurance systems and, and make sure that we're doing it in a safe, secure, and effective manner. And we're accelerating that delivery to uh, end users and customers. So I'll pause there for questions. Okay, thank you very much. Let's uh, wait for, uh, there's some time difference uh, between the here on Zoom and the YouTube. So uh, let's wait for some questions to come up. But before that, uh, let me ask from myself, how um, <clears throat> how do you collaborate in a software team and also the hardware team in the in such a, uh, a defense system? And uh, I'm curious about that because when um, when I talked with the ex uh, chief engineer at, at uh, Toyota who developed the, who is the the director of Camry and the other you know big hit um, <clears throat> cars and then. What he said was, uh, you know, to develop a, you know, a, a whole car, you know, the hardware is the most part of the, you know, cost is there or, you know, cost and the margin balance, profit balance is uh, almost in the uh, hardware, uh, design of a hardware. So he, he said he didn't care much about the software. And then when I talked with him and he said, he, I explained that I, I'm, I, I explained myself that I'm in a software world and such thing. And he said that, the, or he said that he, oh, I didn't take care much about software world, but the, there should be uh, vast big things that were happening. But the, as chief engineer, he wasn't care much about software and he kind of regret that. So uh, at, at least his era, you know. So uh, recently, you know, Tesla is different in doing the different business, but the, in the in the you know defense system, how the you know the whole you know products or you know weapon designer or weapon director and the software team and the hardware team, how do they collaborate each other? Yeah, no, that that is and a great. Do question. they understand DevSecOps concept? <laughs> yeah, yeah, great follow up too. So I'll say that this is definitely a, a hearts and minds campaign. Right. It's this is not a technology or even a process limb fact. Uh, this is the cultural one. And so I found that mileage will vary. Right. The first step for any team is to um, there we go. Yeah. The first step for any team is to understand like the baseline of where is that level of understanding and culture in your organization. Uh, I'll tell you some of my best agilists. The, the folks that are doing DevSecOps principles are actually some hardware teams that had that were building custom aviation units. And the reason why they did it is, again, the light bulb moment is the ability to kind of learn along the way in fast increments versus this big batch delivery where you only can just interact here or here. Um, some things to look at for this. So Tesla is a common example, and SpaceX are common examples of ways that you can think about even you know hardware. Um, obviously, there's lots of sensors and things like that on these uh, automated vehicles. Uh, they're taking a couple of approaches, right? They're simplifying the hardware. They're driving a commonality. They're using the same devices over generation and generation to model the model. Um, they're being very particular on their interfaces. So when you take a hardware item, they're very aware and they architect for when they're going to change that hardware and that, that peripheral sensor many years out of their roadmap. And again, they're also being very intentional in driving software as the thing providing features because it's more graceful um, to change. You could drive more telemetry with a software stack than you can with a hardware stack. Uh, now, your last question on uh, knowledge set for DevOps, it, it wildly varies. Um, my experience is the software IT teams are most knowledgeable because they've kind of been exposed to it the longest. Hardware teams are starting to catch up fast. Um, particularly in some of the embedded teams, uh, like the ones that you're seeing, the combination of FPGA and um, and core logic, uh, that's been pretty good. And then the certifiers are really the ones that are just now getting introduced to it, the system safety folks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. I got a question from the audience, and so let me summary, summarize it. And uh, uh, that's a, his question is about, you know, the, uh, 
uh, war arena is changing, you know, and Russia attacks in Ukraine and such thing is happening in the, in the, you know, it's changing the geopolitical uh, environment out there. And then, and how uh, such change in the uh, geopolitical, you know, tensions uh, affect the uh, developing the uh, weapon system? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's that's it's a a maybe a classified thing, but uh... <laughs> no, no, it's a, so I'll, I'll break out a uh, kind of like high level ways of thinking yeah. about it, right? Uh, one, I'll go back to the, the core of my brief. Um, the world is changing faster than it ever has before. So the more agility that we can provide to our uh, national leaders, to the folks that are running uh, defense, the folks that are pulling together these coalition between nations, uh, the, the better opportunity that they're going to have to build the right thing to have the right thing. Um, that's also really true again on data sharing. So we we need to drive to a thing where we're able to work much more closely with our allies, share data in a way that's, that's uh, you know, consumable and e easy for them to interact in that development cycle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, last question is about how different from the, you know, enterprise system and, the, you know, developing the enterprise system and also, again, the between the you know developing the weapons and how different are they are they i don't think they're that different um i think that there's this, that initially like there's this mindset of we have to keep them very separate and that was driven mostly because as soon as you start calling something a weapon system or certified there was this massive amount of pain that came with that all these other rules that you had to follow and this culture that wasn't ready for moving at speed uh, but when you get into actually like what does it take to design a system to put system security engineering behind it uh, to think about how does the system actually function and to, to build a system that can accommodate change, there's basically no difference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So you have uh, now you're at the private sector and um, I think your your experience will be uh, of very helpful of help to Japanese government and the MOD and the JSDF also. Okay, so let me uh, let's uh, 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 let's see you again uh, after maybe the next conference or a different different opportunity. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hi, That was a very stimulating discussion. And uh, let me just in, uh, invite Linton Wells, Dr. Wells. How are you this evening? Thank you very much for your <laughs> America George Mason University, no Linton Wells, Tomoshimasu, So I would like to share my screen and see. Can you see the Dev DevSecOps and resilience? Devahara-san, can you see the screen? Yes, we can okay. see. We can see. Thank you. Okay. So, so what I'd like to talk about today is what is resilience and why it's important. And a little bit about cyber physical systems, which have already been mentioned. Uh, you know, Kyle Fox talks a lot about this, but the operational technology and the information technology together. The challenges uh, for cyber physical systems of building uh, resilience in a DevOps environment. And then uh, the role of leadership, they're pretty really critical. Again, uh, this has been mentioned, but uh, this is a largely a personal leadership issue, it's more, more than technology. Some of the recent US initiatives in cyber physical resilience, and then next steps. So, resilience is actually uh, coping capacity and adaptability. And so coping capacity is a combination to anticipate, uh, withstand, and recover. And then adapt is what happens afterwards. Now, adaptability is absolutely crucial. The two critical concepts here are that is a capacity, and then you have to have the ability to adapt and to grow. And the idea is we don't want to wound up after the crisis where we were before, we want to bounce forward better, as shown here. 
And this is where you are at the beginning of the uh, situation of the degradation. There's some degree of degradation and with the stand, this is anticipate. You then recover in various paths. And ideally you want to be after the disruption stronger than you were uh, when you went in. So again, that's be prepared to bounce forward better, not just bounce back. It's important to distinguish between security and resilience. Security basically is locking up and hunkering down, trying to keep bad things from happening. Resilience, on the other hand, is how can you under achieve the goals of the organization under any level of shock or stress, fight back and emerge stronger? It's what the military would call mission assurance. And so since computer networks have a hard risk of being penetrated, it's important to look at cyber resilience rather than just cyber security. And some of the key points is that a cyber resilient organization, you cannot be independent of an organization that's not resilient overall. So cyber resiliency is part of overall resiliency. And cybersecurity is a part of cyber resilience, but Really, cyber resilience is much broader. And then we need to address much more than just technical issues. There are also culture and information parts. Again, the people, the leaderships are critical. And as this uh, uh, conference mentioned last year, the role of human resources and human resource departments is really important in this. The approach has to be comprehensive. Ethics, principles, governance, compliance. It's not just checklists. You have to factor all these together. You need to understand the situation specific to your conditions, measure against best practices. And then, as, uh, again, as um, Kyle Fox said, it's continuous improvement. You can't do this with episodic now and then after action reports or periodic engagements. But also understand you can never say that you've learned a lesson until behavior changes. And that's really important. Uh, too many people observe a lesson and say, we learned it. Well, now, unless you've changed behavior, you really can't say that you've observed, the, uh, you, you've learned the lesson. Lots of exercise and testing. And there's a danger of brittleness where things look really good, but uh, if one or two things go wrong, all of a sudden they shatter. And so it's important to have the resilience built into this to be able to be damaged, continue to operate, achieve your goals. So the cyber physical systems and the IoT, uh, of course, this is growing in importance. And this merges the OT operational technology, think generators, pumps, actuators, with the infotech. Think supervisory control, data acquisition, industrial control systems. Uh, the Internet of Things is one form of cyber physical systems. And of course, the Internet of Things is exploding, which means that cyber physical systems are exploding. And we can't just have a set of, you can't just think of IoT as being, or of cyber physical as being some small subset of the Internet. It's really becoming a core part of power grids, smart cities, autonomous vehicles, ability to do remote surgery with advanced wireless, and so on and so forth. In addition, the likelihood of physical harm is increasing. There was a very interesting uh, test back in 2007, I think. It was called the Aurora test out in uh, Idaho, where uh, some people actually hacked a generator. And then by putting the magnets out of phase with the rotating part of the generator, just we can watch it in a couple of minutes, just tear itself to pieces. And so what Garden is predicting here is um, by in about three more years, OT attacks, cyber attacks will be weaponized the stage where you can routinely kill or harm people, not just deny service or harm the equipment. This is a very hard management and a security challenge. First of all, the attack surface is huge and the interdependencies are not understood. And the number of attacks is increasing. Uh, August report this year talked about 39 every attack in the United States every 39 seconds. Um, I know whether it's 20 seconds or a minute, but it's obviously happening very quickly. Between the OT and the IT side of an organization, the pace of technology change is really different. 
IT, of course, is changing really fast, but OT is not. You know, you're not dramatically changing generators, things like that. Although the Internet of Things is often changing quite quickly. And there's also little OT counterpart to the agile development spirals on the IT side. OTs, by and large, have grown up looking primarily at safety and security uh, as their metric, and not, again, the agile DevOps, SecOps spirals. So the leaders have got to understand these cultural differences and uh, factor that into their planning. So again, you have to, the people are critical, continuous and comprehensive learning, and again, make use of the human resources assets in the organization. On top of this, there are enormous changes in the cyber physical environment coming. Um, 5G, we all know about, the explosion of IoT, the dramatic increase in fiber, now we're getting low Earth orbit internet, but there's also a surprising amount of planning going on for 6G. And the rollout of 6G is expected around 2028, which of course is only six years from now. And this is going to be dealing with frequencies in the terahertz, W band, so new spectrum, uh, cell less networks, lots and lots of disaggregation. A critical role of energy efficiency and artificial intelligence. So um, this was from a report last year from our Department of Homeland Security. But despite these tech changes, the technology alone is never enough. It has to be people and processes and organizations and technology together, and leaders have to balance all of these things. So Japan is working towards Society 5.0. And uh, all of these things apply to that, whether it's medical, energy, agriculture, uh, value chain manufacturing. Uh, there is a fusion of these cyberspace and physical space. And in each sector, the software is going to have to link bottom-up inputs to the cloud. But each of the sectors, these contexts and cultures are quite different. In addition, if you, Tom Friedman, the columnist, talks about an age of accelerations. and you know, think of one factor, computing power per unit cost. If that doubles about every 18 months, in five years, the increase is 900%. In 10 years, it's 10,000%. In 15 years, it's 100,000%. Now, I mean, that number may uh, taper off, uh, can even decline. There could be discontinuities like quantum computing. But the point is, that linear projections cannot work. You can just take where you are today and say, okay, here's where we're going to be in five years, five times where we are now or whatever. In addition, biotech is changing even faster than information technology. Robotics are becoming ambiguous. Nanotechnology is poised for breakout. Energy impacts, of course, are global. So I like to think in terms of brine, bio, robo, info, nano, energy plus additive manufacturing and AI machine learning. And these interactions complicate things. There's a very influential and important uh, idea from the World Economic Forum in Davos that talks about the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and the point basically is that the lines are blurring between the physical, the digital, and the biological worlds. And a lot of times people in the IT, OT world Talk about, okay, physical and digital, uh, but there's also this biological change. Just think about how many you know, 3D printed organs are being implanted, how much remote surgery is going to be done by by 5 and 6G uh, systems. Uh, it's uh, You have to factor in the biological and the planning. So how does DevSecOps fit into this? Well, obviously, you plan, build, test, deploy, operate, monitor, continuous cycle. Uh, it's an integrated development environment, and there has to be continuous evaluation of not just the technology, but what's your risk tolerance, what's the cost-benefit analysis, how you can automate your tools. Again, it's never just technology. And recognize that even on the as the OT side of the organization and the IT people come from different cultures, so too within IT do the developers and security and operators come. And again, I, I can't would stop enough what, uh, what Kyle Fox said. You can't get this with just occasional interactions of big bang rollouts. It has to be continuous engagements. Uh, I used to teach a course in something called Wicked Problems. 
And a wicked problem is where basically there's no, you know, there's no agreement and definition of the problem, much less the solution. And there are no clear stopping points. Um, also, each wicked problem is sort of is a combination of many different other problems. So as soon as you start to sit, change it, solve, solve one part, you're changing the problem, which means that you're never going to be able to go from an initial solution to an end game in a straight line. And these iterative approaches with built in reviews of what's happening uh, is uh, is necessary, which also helps in these rapidly accelerating environments. It's got to be a life cycle approach. You can't just say, OK, I'm going to build this and then deploy it and it's somebody else's problem. It's got to continue after the development. Uh, and then the automated tools from DevSecOps can be very effective in extending this effectiveness evaluation over a long period of time. So DevSecOps, uh, so building on the Carnegie Mellon model of the uh, sort of perform, documented, managed, reviews, optimized processes, and then the practices basing from sort of uh, ad hoc all the way up to uh, uh, continuous and repeatable, uh, I think is a really good model. Uh, again, we've found that episodic <clears throat> after action lessons learned just never work in this case because again, it has to be continuous. So the, there's something called now the cybersecurity maturity model compliance. And there are three sort of levels here. One is at the foundation, one is for advanced, and one is expert. And up until now, up until recently, DOD has been requiring companies in the defense industrial base to do an annual self-assessment. Beginning next year, 2023, in addition to self-assessment, if you want to get to level two, there's going to have to be an assessment by someone outside third party. So the stakes are, are getting increased. But how does that apply here? There was a very important publication, I think, put out last April uh, by the National Institutes for Standard and Technology. And they published all sorts of special publications. And one of these was a revision to uh, NIST Pub 800-82 uh, and it's designed to OT security. That's the name of it. Uh, and the point is, I'll talk more about it later. It ties together the not just the OT principles, but those that have been applied elsewhere across OT and IT for risk management and things like that. So coming back again, uh, you've got to establish the governance. You've got to build a cross-functional team to implement this, define the strategy, define the policies and procedures, get that done ahead of time before you start coding before you start building and again set up the team and the processes to allow people to uh, engage with each other uh, the cybersecurity awareness program for it needs to be built in from the beginning risk management maintenance tracking instant response recovery and restoration and then for the generators you obviously have to maintain the safety and the efficiency that they're used to having, used to working with, but it's got to be balanced with the cybersecurity needs, moving away again from episodic lessons learned. <clears throat> this again is where leadership comes in. You cannot, this will not happen by accident. You've got to have continuous communications, leadership, teamwork, recognizing that the tech is really changing and that you've got to structure the organizational learning and the culture to adapt to these sorts of changes. How do you keep track of the big picture without getting bogged down completely in details? And lifelong learning is going to be just essential. Again, you can't you, you can't just do all this before you deploy it. You've got to maintain it uh, across the life of the system. And you've also got your people to develop the sense that lifelong learning is key. Look at the interfaces. Learn the language of the boardroom. Too many security people, too many technical people talk in terms of, oh, I'm compliant with this 800-82 by the M3, and that gets you nowhere in the decision makers. You have to talk a language that you know, decision makers will respond to. But at the same time, these are really important issues. The pace of change of the technology or determining the winners and losers in economies 
They're determining relations between nations. They're determining the way our children think. And so these are issues not just for the CIO or the CTO or the technician, but these are for policymakers and ambassadors and military commanders. And that's the level that people need to be thinking at. Education becomes critical in this. Um, a lot of the cyber present cyber education does not include DevSecOps. So how do you get it? For example, I was I was talking to a um, professor at George Mason the other day, and he was saying that uh, a lot of this just isn't taught in the data in different parts. It's taught in some parts of the school, but it's not part of the universal education that people get. So how do you then take the DevSecOps processes, which are pretty well known, and put in the cultures? Uh, how can you go to certificate-based short-term training vice four-year or eight-year degrees? People talk about just in case learning, but in point of fact, what companies are looking for today is just in time learning. And we see more and more of the human resource departments with the higher people are not looking to see if they have a PhD or whatever the degree is. They'll give them some kind of a capture the flag test. And if they can solve the test, then that's what's needed to get hired, whether they have a PhD or whether they haven't graduated from uh, high school yet. Experiential learning, uh, applying more and more use of AR, VR, and this sort of thing is even more important. And as, as I think uh, Kyle said, too often the innovation stops when you get to authority to operate. You can't do it. The reliability would degrade over time unless you continue to do you know, continuous evaluation. How will you make sure that your system continues to incorporate all the latest uh, patches? Uh, and how do you evaluate the admit it? So again, continuous uh, number thing. One of the suggestions from the uh, NIST publication is that the management team has to include OT engineers and operators and people from the IT organization and what they call a trusted OT advisor, who somebody can speak both languages and operate between the two worlds. The U.S. government has issued a lot of guidance just in the past year. These are just things that have happened in the past year. Uh, in November, uh, there's uh, this uh, guidance on the new cybersecurity maturity, cyber maturity model certification uh, just came out. The Department of Homeland Security uh, issued a, a directive that now requires the federal agencies to keep track of all the assets on their networks list their vulnerabilities, the actions taken to mitigate the threats. And CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, is going to maintain a continuous diagnostics and mitigation dashboard. Uh, one would think that this would be something everyone would be doing. Obviously, it's not. You can't have security unless you know what's on your networks. Back in September, NSA and CISA talked about uh, how to secure both IT and industrial control systems and the U.S. critical infrastructure. Uh, defense in June, July updated its risk management framework for all DoD systems. There's also a control system cyber defense reference architecture. And then this is the one that's really, really important among many. But this is, if anybody has a chance to look at one thing in this, I would take a look at least the executive summary of what's changed in this revision three to the guide to operational security. And what's really important is that it incorporates the lessons over the past several years to align to other guidance that's out there, the risk management framework, the security and privacy controls, the control baselines, security security framework. So now the OT security is aligned with these other guidance documents that are out there. Um, in February, uh, uh, CISA, this is just before the, of course, the war broke out in Ukraine, uh, compiled a free set of cybersecurity services and tools for network defenders. Just, uh, and of course, we were expecting at that point some significant attacks as a result of the war. Uh, then also on the 13th, uh, there was another advisory issue that talked about the advanced persistent threat. And what they're saying is multiple Industrial control systems, supervising control and data acquisition devices can be accessed now by 
some of the advanced persistent threat, which is typically you know, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran. And what they're recommending is multi-factor authentication for all of your remote access, all remote access, change your passwords on a consistent schedule, not just when somebody issues a warning about it and have monitoring solution that you can log and alert on what's going on in your organization. So this is not rocket science, but the point is how many people are really doing this routinely? And then the last thing, or the first thing that was done this year was to publish a zero trust architecture, um, zero, uh, zero trust strategy for federal agencies. So where do we go next? I mean, one of the key things to recognize, to keep coming back to people, is the talent to do this is in very short supply. Uh, there's something like 650,000 cybersecurity jobs in the United States that are not filled. That's the United States alone. And there is no way, actually, that the present educational or training system is going to keep up with it. There just aren't enough skilled teachers. So one of the interesting things that's starting in the United States is a project called CyberStart. And this is a pretty complicated 200 level capture the flag exercise game, sorry, cyber game. But it's it's geared for, I think, eighth through 12th graders. And basically, if the people, those people who get to the top level of this game are guaranteed the opportunity to take one of Carnegie Mellon Sands Institute's uh, top uh, certificates, for uh, cybersecurity learning. So it, again, it's, and the beauty of this is that no teachers are involved. It's entirely self-taught with peer mentoring. So it's those types of things to try to get more people into the workforce. Uh, the other part that's interesting about this workforce is, you know, this is your normal uh, distribution, but it's actually, it's much more of a scale fee distribution describes the distribution of, talent for hackers or uh, defenders or whatever i mean just think how many how many fighter pilots become aces it's a fairly small number that tails off out here uh, similarly in the cybersecurity world so it's this people this group of people it's not just a hacker as a hacker as a hacker or defenders defender defender how do you take advantage how do you recognize this so the ai and machine learning to bridge the training um, shortfall but there's an awful lot of hype around it. And a lot of what I've seen is people are writing AI and machine learning algorithms and not paying attention to the cybersecurity of those algorithms. Training and training and training, but don't make sure the scenarios are tough. It doesn't do any good to train on scenarios that you're not going to be facing out in the real world. Big data analytics, uh, the, the, you know, the data is absolutely king. That has to be factored into this and again how do you find new personality personnel policies to get access to non-traditional talent um, every year my wife and i go out to a defcon to the hacker convention in las vegas and one of the things i like about that is that the people who think very differently typically than i do but when i was still in government we would offer anytime i talked to them i'd say as long as you haven't crossed the line to felony misbehavior uh, there's a lot of talent and enthusiasm in this room and think about applying you know, to the government to work there. And every year we get some number of 25, 30 uh, applications. So don't just focus on uh, uh, traditional talent sources. Look at gaining access to uh, non-traditional ones. So I'd be more than happy to take questions. Um, uh, Nita Harrison, I hope I've gotten you a little bit more uh, back on uh, on schedule. And please uh, uh, be glad to hear questions. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Wells. Uh, let's wait for questions to come up on the YouTube. <clears throat> and uh, before wait, uh, while waiting it, uh, waiting that, uh, my question is that uh, <clears throat> I know some uh, projects and uh, uh, things going on with CISA and uh, Homeland Security, as you mentioned, but the, mm -hmm. uh, in 
in the context, uh, when it happens to Japanese organizations, that happens, it's, it's quite similar to the US also, I, I guess. But, uh, you know, for example, crit critical infrastructure such as uh, electricity, nuclear plant, such thing is uh, operated by private sector. And uh, <clears throat> when it's not a government uh, governed, uh, controlled uh, plant and then such things, you know, uh, traffic also, uh, yeah, trains and all private and uh, a airplane also private. So, uh, <clears throat> and also finance also. So they what they can do only is the, just to give the advice, for example, when Docomo or KDDI uh, got uh, uh, some disorder of the system and then it uh, failed down for, for some, some days, like K KDDI that, in the case of KDDA, that happens this year. And but what the uh, authority could do was not uh, only uh, uh, scold them after after things happened, and then give them the prevention preventive actions. Uh, uh, give them, you know, ask them to submit the preventive actions or plans to uh, not to happen anymore. So how uh, you know the this happening, you know, what thing is, you know, the problem and the issue is uh, governance, you know, operation and the governance, you know, that I, I think. So how do you, uh, at least in the U.S., how does uh, DHS and the CISA is struggling or uh, what, what uh, are doing for, for overcoming uh, these things? So... Some years ago, I was up at um, Bedminster, New Jersey, which is where AT&T has its long line center, its global long line center. And they had this very, very impressive set of large screen displays of uh, made the National Military Command Center pale by comparison. And one of the... Um, one of the executives said, well, you know, if, if we were really badly hacked and we were having a lot of problems, do you government people actually think you could come in here and run this for us? And the answer is no, of course not. Uh, and so, it, as you say, it's in the private sector. It has to, the lead has to remain with the private sector. And the question is, what can the government do to share information? What can the government do to coordinate uh, responses in different industries or within one industry. And so in, 19, in the late 1990s, when the first um, critical infrastructure uh, study was done, they came up with a concept called ISACs, Information Sharing and Analysis Centers. And the ISACs uh, candidly have worked better in some industries and others, some sectors and others. I think the financial ISAC works pretty well. Um, but during the Obama administration, they broadened the concept to be to something called an ISAO, Information Sharing um, Analysis Organization. And the point is, the ISAC was just within one sector, uh, and the ISAO allows people to cooperate. So the space sector could cooperate with the power grid sector, cooperate with the you know the launch facility, and so on and so forth. And I think giving more latitude to the stakeholders to work on their own solutions with government advice and perhaps intelligence sharing and things like that is, is the best way to go about this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, let me take a question. Thank you. Let, let me take a question from uh, audience. What sure. is the best way to nurture the uh, you know, bright cybersecurity talent? You mentioned about CTF and other things, but what is the best way to nurture? That's the question from audience. Yeah, so I think the be the best way is to um, the, the best way is to encourage them to pursue their own interests. The best way certainly is not to sit in a classroom for. Uh, eight hours a week or something like that and be told this, 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 this. It has to be experiential learning, meaning you need to, again, that's why I capture the flag, that's why hands-on equipment. And that's why I think it's the advent of more 
artificial, I mean, augmented reality, virtual reality uh, is, is likely to be very important in this. But uh, if you look at the, coming back to this graph here, the graph I showed before about the, the level of talent uh, and the, the, the small amounts of it, uh, really, really great talent, that has to be encouraged to give them opportunities to explore on their own. Uh, there's a story about, I mean, the standard in education is we need to move away from the sage on the stage of the teacher standing up in front and talking to people to what they call a guide on the side where someone is uh, there to help people uh, discover the information that's of, of interest to them. Um, I was out in Silicon Valley a few months ago uh, and they actually have a high school there devoted to innovation. And basically what they do is they find out what the students are interested in and then let them pursue that. And then they inject the normal studies of reading and writing and literature and arithmetic around the passion the students have developed. Okay. Now you can't do that for everyone, but for the top talent, some something like that, I think is the way to go. Mm. So it's about not about the teaching, but the, it's about, about the encouraging and the coaching. It's making opportunities available. Mm. Uh, making opportunity whether they're and, and different people are going to learn different ways. Some will learn in teams. Some will learn by themselves. Some will use capture the flag. Some will use uh, you know, uh, software and hardware engineering. Uh, there are many different paths to this. And so I think the trick is to have a very diverse set of opportunities. Find out where the talent wants to go, and then encourage that. Mm -hmm. I understand. How different, uh, by the way, from, you know, not just in the, you know, for example, like a, a top gun level of pil pilots and also, you know, not just in the top gun level of uh, hackers. How, how uh, not just in them is how, how different? Uh, uh, well, I think uh, I think the, the distribution of skill sets is similar. They're going to be only a very few people who are going to make Top Gun and within Top Gun, they're only, you know, the, but, but in Top Gun, you're typically dealing with much more uh, defined hardware. Uh, I mean, people have, have, have to learn how to operate and fly these incredibly expensive and, uh, and uh, uh, complicated machines. Then they have to innovate and use them well. And that's true. But I think in the software uh, and of course it's hardware and software and, and, uh, and chips and all that together, you probably don't have as much of a barrier to entry, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, people can be more people can be provided more opportunities to you know, excel than someone who had to go through a million dollars worth of flight training and then demonstrate the ability in a very expensive aircraft, and then they can get to Top Gun. So mm -hmm. it seems to me that the concept is similar, but the people have to. Uh, people actually have more opportunity in cyber but but one of the just the diversity of the people in cyber is really important you can't have everyone thinking the same way you're going to need men and women and uh older people and younger people and uh different nationalities and uh and every cyber conference i go to just about the speakers are lamenting they're sad about the fact that the room largely looks made up of white men. Mm. So how do you find ways, at least in the U.S., piece, to get more and more diversity and hence more diversity of thought into mm. the process? I see. I see. Thank you very much, Dr. Wells. So we'll take some break. And uh, now we are taking break. Uh, we are running behind the schedule, so we are going to resume the session at 10.55. So let's take a break. And after that, uh, Dr. Wells talked about DEF CON. And uh, in the afternoon, there will be a person who, who, who was the finalist of the DEF CON. So you can enjoy the session in the afternoon. So thank you. So uh, please be back before 10.55. Thank you.
デブセックオプスデイズ東京はデブセックオプスを推進するためのコミュニティ活動に賛同してくださる多くの企業団体から支援を受けていますプラチナスポンサー NTT データブレインパッドコグニティブリサーチラボゴールドスポンサー NRY セキュアテクノロジーズ GMO サイバーセキュリティバイイエラエシルバースポンサー HRD プロファイルズスタートアップスポンサーロバストインテリジェンスリジェルカセキュリティ公園アメリカ大使館経済産業省総務省文部科学省デジタル庁サイバーセキュリティ戦略本部カーネギーメロン大学ソフトウェアエンジニアリングインスティテュートカーネギーメロン大学サイラボコグニティブ CTF「世界から届いた食材が彩るディナーテーブル」。約束の場所に時間通り安全に到着する交通機関どこでも安心して受けられる医療や薬遠く離れて暮らす家族に贈る誕生日のプレゼントその日常は人や物をつなぐ仕組みで支えられているお客様と社会とそして世界中に広がる仲間とともに新しい仕組みを作りつないできた世界は常に変化を続け時には想像もしなかった困難を私たちに突きつける必要なのは何ができるかではなく何をすべきか社会があるべき姿とは何か次の世代にも続く本当に豊かな暮らしとは何かそれを見つめ、私たちは行動する。N. T. T. データ。ビッグデータや。A. I. 技術が脚光を浴びる。データの時代がやってきた。巨大企業も。ベンチャー企業も。データを大きな経営資源と捉えビジネスに取り入れようとしています15年以上前からデータ活用の可能性をまっすぐに信じてきた私たち今こそ一緒にデジタルトランスフォーメーションで開けるドアがたくさんあると思うのです持続可能な未来につながる扉成長し続けるできること広がるデータ分析の民主化最適な意思決定挑戦できる未来ささやかな幸せにあふれた日常あの成長ですとときめく顧客体験を磨き続ける世界<笑>豊かな社会意味のある仕事を作る誰もがビジョンにチャレンジできる誰も想像できない大きな成功イントゥリアンの目から鱗の瞬間を提供する製造の矛盾化子供たちの未来データかけるワクワクイコール未来できたらいいなを形に仲間の笑顔が未来の笑顔を作る未来は作るものだというふうに考えているので仕事を通じて新しい価値をですね想像すればですね日本がまだまだですね成長できる面白い機会を作ることができると思っているので、えー、かなり広範囲のビジネスをですね僕らはご支援できるんじゃないかなというふうに思っています。その意志が世界を守る。テクノロジーは常に進化するインターネットが人々の間に広く普及し始めてからさまざまな技術が加速度的に進化し派生し広がった気がつけば
私たちの暮らしは便利さという名のもとで大きく様変わりしてきたテクノロジーをどう使うかそれはその人間自身に委ねられる人はいつの時代も人が作り出した矛盾にとらわれている善か悪か勝つか負けるか傷つけるのか守り抜くのかそのパラドックスに常に挑んでいる今やビジネスだけではなく日常生活においても IT の力が不可欠になり全てがネットワークでつながる時代24時間365日社会全体が常に IT の引き起こすリスクと向き合わなければならない時代の変化を見極め新たな知識を蓄え培ってきた技術と経験によって決して負けられない戦いに挑み続けていく恐れずに進もうあなたの揺るぎない意志がこれからの時代を守っていくその仕事で人類の豊かさを確かなものにしていくんださあプロフェッショナルとしての誇りを胸にこの社会を前進させていこうその意志が世界を守る NRI セキュアテクノロジーズ「コグニティブ CTF」は誰でも楽しくセキュリティを考慮したプログラミングが学べるゲーミフィケーションプラットフォームですすでにソフトウェアエンジニアとして活躍している方もプログラミングに興味のある中学生、高校生、大学生でもどなたでもゲーム感覚でお楽しみいただけますコグニティブ CTF は政府機関の研究開発プロジェクトとしてコグニティブリサーチラボと東京大学、京都大学が共同開発しました軍事大国の現役サイバー兵士が取り組むような難易度の高いものから初めてプログラミングを学ぶ中高生の初心者の方でも楽しめるものまで多様な問題を取り揃えていますコグニティブ CTF に取り組むことで基本的なコーディングスキル暗号解読フォレンジクスリバースエンジニアリングバイナリ解析などに関する問題を解きながらハッカーとしてのスキルを向上することができます悪意を持ったハッカーがどのように攻撃してくるかについての知識がなければソフトウェアの安全と安心を保つことはできません現代はあらゆるソフトウェア開発者にハッカーとしてのスキル習得が必要になっているのですぜひあなたも一度コグニティブ CTF でハッカーとしての腕前を試して楽しくスキルアップしてみませんか QR コードを読み取ってぜひ参加登録をお願いしますどなたでも無料でお楽しみいただけます。インターネットの発展は私たちの生活を便利に豊かに変えました。今では水やガス、電気と同じくらい生活に欠かせない重要なインフラです。会社や学校、病院、銀行や工場。ありとあらゆる場所とシステムがインターネットにつながっていますそんなインターネットがサイバー攻撃の脅威にさらされているなんてあってはならないと私たちは考えます私たちはサイバー攻撃で使われる脆弱性や攻撃手法を日々研究していますその結果なんと直近1年間で約30件のゼロデイの脆弱性を発見しました私たちは悪意あるハッカーが攻撃するよりもずっと前にお客様のシステムのセキュリティホールを見つけてご報告します私たちはこれまで先進的なセキュリティ技術を研究し知識を共有してきました私たちはこれからも企業とシステムを利用する全ての人をサイバー攻撃から守ります目に見えない脅威から暮らしを守る日本を守る全ての人に安心と安全なインターネット HRD グループは科学的なアプローチで人事や組織の改革を強力に支援しています今多くの企業がデジタルトランスフォーメーションに取り組んでいるのではないでしょうかデジタルテクノロジーを活用することにより
営業やマーケティングの見直し業務プロセスの自動化がさまざまな企業で実現されていますでは人材や組織に関してはどうでしょう一人一人の才能や個性に合わせた適材適所の実現や効果的なコミュニケーションの実践はデジタル化とは無縁の勘と経験に頼っているのが現状ではないでしょうかこのような勘と経験に頼ってきた人事や組織の課題もデータにより解決する時代になってきています私たちの提供するディスクとプロファイル XT は科学的検証に裏打ちされた人材測定ツールです一人一人のモチベーションの源泉やそのポテンシャルを見出すことで組織や人材の課題を解決します全世界でこれまでに6000万人10万社日本でもこれまで120万人以上の顧客が効果を実感しているソリューションですこれからのデジタル時代の企業における改革の本質は人と組織のトランスフォーメーションにあると私たちは考えています HRD グループのディスクとプロファイル XT が組織や人材の改革を可能にします効果的なコミュニケーションによる組織力向上に興味のある方はディスクで社内の適材適所の実現や人材のポテンシャルを見出すことに興味のある方はプロファイル XT で検索してぜひ一度ホームページからお問い合わせください。はい、では、えー、Now, えー、休憩後の午前。And the, after the、uh, morning recess, we're going to cover the remaining agenda items in the morning. And the、uh, digital lane is invited for the、uh, software barrel of monkeys. And,、uh, and it's actually the、uh, abbreviation from the、uh, software and the BOM. And we are not sure he was able to attend online live, but now successfully he's arrived here. So, DJ Shane, it's your turn. I'm DJ Shaleen. I'm a distinguished security architect at Yahoo, and I work in the Paranoid Security Organization. I'm also a co founder of the DevOps Kung Fu Mafia, otherwise known as DKFM, an open source group. And what we do there is create software that makes DevSecOps and DevOps a little bit easier. One of the applications that I've developed recently at the DevOps Kung Fu Mafia is Bomber, and it's a software bill of materials scanning tool. So, software bill of materials. That's what this presentation is going to be about. I'm going to dig in a little bit to what they are, what the problems are behind them, some of the different formats, and what we can do today to make the use of software bill of materials successful at any organization that we're part of. Before we get to that, though, let me start off with a bit of a story. Most of us probably remember April 2014. Maybe not the exact month, but we Definitely know about this thing that we call Heartbleed. Well, this OpenSSL issue was a vulnerability in a library, and I was woken up at 3 a.m. to come and join a conference call to try to figure out how we were going to address this issue. And it was the first time the company I was at had ever dealt with trying to find a specific component or library in our ecosystem. We had thousands of servers, we had thousands, if not Tens of thousands of instances running in AWS. We had containers running as well. Where was this vulnerability? Where were we exposed? So you can probably guess what we all did. And it was not looking at any tools we had because there wasn't anything available. What we did was we sent out an Excel spreadsheet to all of the team leads across the enterprise and asked them a few questions Do you use OpenSSL? What application is it in? What version are you using? And please get this information back to us within the next four hours. You can probably guess what the result was. We had every team lead come back and tell us that they weren't using OpenSSL and it wasn't anywhere in their environment. That's where I realized that there was a big issue around software inventory and how we manage the components that we use in our software. So, the problem is, we don't know what components we use. We have no idea where they are in our organization, and we don't know where these components are coming from. Are they coming from GitHub? Are they coming from Stack Exchange? Is it something that's copied and pasted 
into our code from a website somewhere. We have no idea. We also, most importantly, do not know if there's any vulnerabilities in these components, and that leads to what we're up against. Synopsis came out with a re report earlier this year and analyzed about 2,500 projects. Now, out of those projects, 97% of them use open source components. I'm surprised it's that low. <laughs> Normally open source components are used everywhere. It's all around us in everything that we code day to day. Of those projects, 88% of them use components that weren't the latest version. Yes, we can pin our versions, we can do things like that. 81% of those projects contained at least one vulnerability. And then 53% of those code bases had license conflicts. Let's take a quick pause there. Why is licensing so important for open source? Well, if we use something like AGPL or GPL licensing, those copyleft licenses could pose a risk to our organization. We might end up having to pay penalties for using these components in commercial software. We may have to open source some of our products. It's just not what we want to have in a component that we bring in. And there's some additional issues to that when it comes to all the dependencies that a lot of these components have. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And the most staggering statistic is that 78% of all software is composed of open source components. That means that 22% of the software that we write is actually written by us, employees of the company we're working for. So this poses a huge issue. This is where S-bombs come into the picture. And what's an S-bomb? From a 10,000 foot view, it's basically a nutrition label. It's an ingredient list on a can of beans or something that you're buying from a store. It tells us what's in the product we're purchasing. You know, is it gluten-free? Does it have any allergens? All the information we need to make a purchasing decision if we are going to acquire this product and consume it. It's also like the back of a baseball cards, the statistics. If we time travel back to the 1970s, it was the age of Deming, and Toyota, and GMC process improvement. A lot of the concepts that DevOps is built on today. And if we think about how cars are manufactured, cars need tires. Tires come in from a vendor, they arrive at the plant, they get stored, they get brought out, they get transported to the assembly line where they're installed on a vehicle. Manufacturers know what parts are in a vehicle, where they came from, and all parts that have been installed on a vehicle come in that way. What a bill of materials is in that case is like a window sticker on a Jeep. All of the parts, all of the things that go into that vehicle. So if there's a recall on the vehicle, the manufacturer knows the origin of the part that's in your vehicle, they know what needs to be replaced, and they can trace it back and see what other cars are affected by the issue that you're having on your vehicle or the recall on that part. Software Bill of Materials have been getting a lot of attention from the American government lately. In fact, in 2021, the Biden administration came out with an executive order that encapsulates different concepts of how the government's going to deal with cybersecurity. And there's a whole section on open source components in the supply chain. I'm going to dig into that a little bit, but what's the effect of this order? Anyone who wants to sell services or software products to the federal government in the United States has to provide a software bill of materials or documentation about other security practices that they use and they do in their organization. So think about it this way. It's like a third party risk governance scenario where you're providing the government entity with information to actually make decisions on if they're going to purchase your software or services and what they're getting. So we're going to go through a little bit of this executive order, especially when it comes to software bill of materials. Let's take a look at section four of this order. It's just a small snippet of it. I'm going to highlight a couple of points. The first requirement here is that we need to keep up to date data provenance or origin of software code or components. So not where it is, but where did you get these components? How did this piece of software or this component in your application, get into your environment. Where did it come from? 
And the next is to perform audits and enforcement of these controls on a recurring basis. That's a great thing to say and do, but it's a really hard thing to actually do because each one of these software building materials that we generate is a snapshot in time. Anytime you build your software, you change a line of code or character, and sometimes every time you compile the application, you're generating a new SBOM. And some of the SBOM generators will create different identifiers for each element in your software bill of materials. And when it does that, it completely changes everything. So the thing mutates and is only as good for as long as your last vulnerability scan is or the last time you built. The next requirement is providing a purchaser a software bill of materials or SBOM for each product directly or by publishing it on a public website. This is the first time the term software bill of materials comes up in this executive order. And this one is an interesting requirement because you can publish a SBOM on a public website. It's great for open source software. What happens if it's proprietary information and you just don't want to give your secret sauce out to everybody? So publishing it on a public website is not going to be applicable to you. The advantages of doing things that way and having your SBOMs on a public website is every time you do a build, you can publish a new one and it's always fresh. On the other side, we can provide an SBOM directly to our consumers and our customers, but every time we change our software, we should really be giving them a new one. And that's going to be an unwieldy task. The next point is ensuring and attesting to the extent practicable to the integrity or provenance of an open source software component used within any portion of the product. So this is the chain, the supply chain. So we could be looking at digital signatures, but did this software bill of materials change? Did this piece of software change between the time it was produced and the time it actually made it into your product? And at the bottom, we see a call to action that within 60 days of the date of this order, the NTIA needs to publish the minimum elements for a software bill of materials. And this is what the NTIA came up with. These are the minimum fields required to define a software bill of materials. So the first thing we have is the supplier name. So as the creator of DevOps Kung Fu Common, our common package, the supplier name in that case would be DKFM or the DevOps Kung Fu Mafia. The component name would be common. So this common set of utilities that we publish. The version of the component, version 2.1. It's just a unique identifier of the version. Other unique identifiers, this can be anything and it's really format dependent. So the tools that generate your software bill of materials and in the formats that they come out in, this could be everything from a package URL or a Perl that, or it could be license information, but it's not specified explicitly in the minimum requirements. I'm just going to step over dependency relationship. Author of the SBOM data, this is the tool that generates the SBOM. So you could be using a software composition analysis tool. It generates the SBOM, or you could be using something like SIFT uh, from Anchor that will generate the software bill of materials for you. And the timestamp, so that's just a record of you know when this software bill of materials was generated. Back to dependency relationship. Characterizing the relationship that an upstream component X is included in software Y. Well, let's talk about the supply chain because X and Y actually is a little bit more complicated than that. So you might have a component or a piece of software that is Y. Well, X is included in Y. X might also include A and Z. And then Z might include B and A might include C and C also <laughs> includes D, but really C also has A and B. Like I'm confused, right? <laughs> when we get into the supply chain relationships, you know, now we have to figure out how to display these in a file. It's just monkeys. There's monkeys everywhere. <laughs> If we take a look deeper into some of those dependencies, here's an example of a Go mod file, which happens to be DevOps Kung Fu Bomber. There's 12 direct references that I use when I'm coding Bomber. 
you see those at the top of files as import statements. There's 16 indirect references. So these are other packages that those 12 direct references require. Doesn't look too bad, right? You know, I'm using 12 libraries here, 12 components. And uh, yeah, it turns out to be 511 transitive references. And there's a lot of information in here, as you can see. But uh, from 12 to 511, this is where that dependency graph and that complete mess of a barrel of monkeys comes into play. Because there's all these attachments and these dependencies that we have to account for. So describing these dependencies is where software bill of materials formats come into play. So we have Cyclone DX that was created by OWASP in 2017. It is by far the most widely used and known bill of materials format. Software bill of materials have been around since 2009 when SWID came out from NIST. That's basically a tagging format. It was revised in 2015, but you're going to mainly see SWID when it comes in the into the realm of manufacturing. And then we have SPDX by the Linux Foundation, which came out in 2010. And SIFT, which is a proprietary format used by SIFT, which is a product created by Anchor to generate software bill of materials. SPDX is actually an ISO standard as well. V2.2.1 is uh, the specification that is also known as ISO 5962-2021, which is nice that we have a standard, but it's really old. <laughs> There's been so many improvements to the software bill of materials format space, and that just confuses me. So let's take a look at Cyclone DX and dig a bit deeper in here. Cyclone DX formats, we can see on the left-hand side, consists of metadata, components, services, dependencies, extensions, and then we have vulnerabilities. I've never seen a Cyclone DX file yet that has vulnerabilities listed inside of them because that's just going to make this file completely massive. On the right-hand side, you can see the Cyclone DX format. I use this for testing inside of Bomber. And we see that there's some valuable information in here. We have the provider, the tool that created it, which is SIFT. Um, we have a component here that's name is Cyclone DX Go. And the version of that is 0 0.60. And here's the package URL. That's an extremely valuable field because I use these in Bomber to search for vulnerabilities on those packages and return those back. We also see in here that MIT is the license Again, license is extremely important when we start looking at complete risk view of our components that we're bringing in. So here's what we can do with these software bill of materials. Software composition analysis, your source, open source, that's a great way to generate software bill of materials. You probably are using a vendor today that is generating reports for your open source components. If you're not, you should be doing that. SCA will generate a software bill of materials. If you aren't using one or your software composition analysis tool doesn't provide you with that functionality, you can get an open source tool like SIFT from Anchor and generate your software bill of materials that way. So these are things that we can see. And this is where we build the functionality into our release process. Here's version 0.3.3 for Bomber. And you can see that one of the assets included with this release is an SPDX software bill of materials. That travels with this release. Everything here is tied together. So we can tell what components are in each one of these distributions before we even download it. And then there's closed source. This is when we're a consumer of software bill of materials third-party risk governance. We're already asking these vendors what their security practices are, what certifications they have. So why not ask them for that software bill of materials? And then we can scan them for vulnerabilities. So we can use Bomber from DKFM. That's going to scan everything. It'll scan Python, Go, it'll scan Debian, RPM. It's sort of your one-stop shop for finding vulnerabilities in a software bill of materials.
And then you can also use something like Gripe and that'll just scan containers and it's another product by Anchor. Here's some of the bomber output that you can expect when you're doing the security scans of your software bill of materials. On the right hand side we have a HTML output. This is great for including inside your analysis and your results coming from your vendor reviews. And then on the left hand side here we have a few different formats. We can use JSON, just straight JSON output of all the vulnerabilities and the components and licenses that you have inside of that software build materials. And then in the top left hand corner you can see a CLI output. And this is actually pretty handy because what you can do is in a CI-CD process you could generate a software bill of materials with SIFT and then pipe it into Bomber which will provide you some vulnerability information and that's software composition analysis for free. So some parting words here. Generate and include software bill of materials as an artifact with every release. Just get used to it. It's going to happen that you're going to be asked for this and starting to get this in our minds and in the back of our heads that we're going to have to deal with software bill of materials in the future. We may as well start doing it now. We can request our software bill of materials from our vendors, especially when we're doing those security reviews. It's going to give us more evidence and help us make a better business decision on if we're going to purchase a piece of software or not. There are no solutions right now that give us the ability to store and search on these software bill materials. So we just need to store them temporarily until we can figure out as an industry how we do that and solve that problem. When we find vulnerabilities in the software bill materials that were presented by our vendors, we need to be able to work with them. Find out how you can come together and address the vulnerabilities in a way that's acceptable to both parties and realize that we're really early in the software bill of materials world. Everyone's still trying to find their way and navigate around all these requirements, all these formats, and all these issues around dealing with them. Are they great? Yes. Can we prove that right now? Time will tell. Thank you for your time today. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today and present Software Barrel of Monkeys. Uh, thank you very much. So you, you saw the uh, recorded video, but if you have any questions, uh, Hassan uh, san will uh, answer the question on his behalf. So if you have questions, uh, please do not hesitate to ask today, uh, now. So let's look at the questions now. So when you talk about S-bomb, so many of you may know BOM, but uh, it, it tells you what are included in a product. So let's say there are Toyota car, there are tens of thousands of components. What are the, uh, the products? What are the semi-finished uh, products? And in a manufacturing world, uh, I, I, I really forgot, was it MRP, material resource planning? I'm not sure if it is a uh, uh, right word. I forgot if it was a right word. But anyway, I was involved involved in uh, developing a manufacturing system. But my point is, there are uh, tens of thousands of uh, components to assemble a car. Let's say there are 50,000 components and there are intermediary products. And this uh, component A is used for intermediary products B. So it really tells uh, what are the, uh, the inventory and what are the yield? So these are um, very important. So it comes with the, uh, the demand prediction. So it is material resource planning and it is, it is applied and it is required in the world of software. Of course, if it's a, a physical um, thing, and this is another analogy of Toyota car, Let's say there are 50,000 components are used for one car of Toyota. And let's say there's one uh, defect item. So if that happens, the cars are recalled and make it uh, fixed. Similarly, in software world, a lot of components are treated as 
as if they are manufacturing products. Let's say this is Java uh, source, and this is from uh, Python, and this is from JavaScript, and this part uh, is reused from the previous project, just like that. Uh, this is the, uh, the components that was created by other teams, and we collect these items to to make what is needed. So, you know, this is distributed through AWS. So this is one example. So uh, a lot of items or components are combined. So if there are 50,000 uh, components for a car, and that can be and not only the car, but the PC. So we, we have to really track what is inside, what is included in the software. And Lori Kurena uh, from Scilab said that in a world of privacy, similar thing is happening. What she said uh, last year is this, you know, accessing Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. So in order to access these uh, platforms, you need the, uh, you need a consent for the privacy, but not many people really read all of the, uh, the description. And when we say we are collecting data and we are modifying the data, a definition is not clear. Uh, in Apple, it is about uh, collecting the data and storing the data. Uh, but for the Google, they collect the data, but they throw them away after uh, they use it. So when we say collection of the data, definition is not the same. And in a privacy, like a SBOM, it is um, necessary to uh, list up uh, what is included. So that is what she said last year uh, during the keynote speech. So the system uh, mechanism uh, on the back of the uh, software, we need the uh, something like that. We talked about log4j uh, yesterday. And, you know, if we are using the log4j, where are we using it? So you don't want to ask that kind of question. So even though, so you don't know uh, what is inside, but it is working well if it's a legacy system and you don't know what would be a potential impact of uh, making the changes. So it is very important to understand uh, where uh, uh, the impact is uh, made. And so, so zero, so zero, so zero trust policy uh, related comment is here. Um, so in a, a food industry, there was uh, uh, the falling objects in ham, ham, and that made people sick or some people died. And so that issue happened. And then there was a movement or initiative to make sure uh, everyone knows what is inside the food. So when there's a harm, when there's a traffic accident, through this experience, regulation emerges and, and things are gotten right. So food processing industry, what happened in the food industry a uh, hundred years ago is happening today in software. And there is a regulation happening and there should be a regulation. And the software is becoming very important infrastructure in order to use it in a safe manner. So maybe we shouldn't say regulation, but uh, we are in the process of creating a common rule. Maybe I spoke too much, but uh, I will uh, ask Hassan-san to speak uh, 30 minutes. So what's your, what's your uh, back screen? Thank you, Yusika. This is the, actually the goal. Japanese team made it a score and I really like that goal, and I would like to congratulate one more time for the Japanese soccer team for advancing the second round. I'm, I'm looking for the game, and I'm hoping that they will advance again. Well, it was a great game. It was a great game. Congratulations for the Japanese soccer team. It was a perfect goal. I, I like that. It's a perfect mm -hmm. goal. <laughs> I, I, I like actually the miss it. You know, it started at 4 a.m. here, and uh, <laughs> if, if I don't have uh, this uh, conference today, I, I would have watched it, but... Uh, I missed it. Yeah, uh, definitely, you should look at the replay of the game. It was it was a yeah. great game. It was a great game. 
Mm-hmm. Was a great, and I like the soccer as well. Even though I'm in the U.S., but I really like soccer. Mm-hmm. But I grow up, I enjoy looking games and playing sometimes. And my both boys, boys also playing soccer. I enjoy that. But congratulations! Looking forward to another game with the Japanese team. Yeah. All right. Thank let you. me let me share my screen, and we can start sure. the talk. Right. Great. So let's if we get into the. Presentation or all right. So what I'm going to talk about today is a continuous verification validation of critical software via DevSecOps. And I'm Hassan Yasser, technical director and faculty member at the CMU Software and Institute and Carnegie Mellon University. I have been managing groups for years and are focusing on DevSecOps. And I have been contributing many other organizations as well as, well as DOD on DevSecOps pieces in various organizations. And also I'm an adjunct faculty member at the CMU and I have been teaching DevOps courses since 2015. And this is the first course in the US and all around the world actually. So I have been teaching both software engineering courses, security and also DevSecOps courses and DevOps course I do. So why is it really important the continuous verification and validation concept especially of critical software. Let's dive into the, how DevSecOps is really helping for that capabilities. I'm gonna start with the definition first, at this we should be in the same page. And based on IEEE standard 1012, and the verification means we would like to provide some objective evidence and of the system that we are building. Like technically we are comparing the requirements during the development phases. Validation is more about a, a product, that product is gonna let us that we build the right product. So there's a, there's a two complementing uh, terminologies. It is helping each other. One, we would like to verify that we are building the, a product based on the, what we plan to do, like based on what are we planning to do and based on the what really try to get some requirements like specifically for the standards, for the safety, for compliances, which is more about building the product correctly based on what we plan or what the compliance looks like, what the requirements looks, looks like. Especially critical uh, systems, when we talk about electric systems or water or a nuclear or some other systems, it is regarding a lot of this concept has to be validated. Like I'm, I'm creating something, but how I'm gonna make sure that the system I'm building based on the, the specific requirements or the compliances. Then the validation is more about building the correct product. Like we use the right compliances during the development phases, like maybe GDPR, maybe other type of uh, standard requirements. But how are we going to make sure that we are building the right product end of it, which is more about the user perspective or functionality perspective? These two terminology is deriving the product in the safety critical systems. Aircraft is one of them, the car is another one. So we kind of use every day, but we're not aware of it. But we really, we have to verify and validate those concepts. So how DevSecOps is really helping? I'm just gonna describe more. This concept is really getting much, much easier and much, much traceable with the DevSecOps capable of this. Let's a little bit drive into the why do we have to the VNV. We have to understand the reasons. So successful verification and validation will create a result based on any type of early detection of the, the correct product that we are building. Maybe we are failing on some of the requirements. If we kind of wait down the road for checking sort of the verification of the, the thing that we are building or a product is the right product we are building at then. How are we gonna make sure that we are building the right product? If we late so much, if we don't really correlate those VNV process correctly, we are gonna build up the right and we cannot capture any problems early. Then also we have to really get some engagement with the management, like management is more about the compliance people, more about auditors. And how are we gonna make sure that we are able to do some confirmance of the program that we are trying to build, which is more about the scheduling, budgeting, or architecture conformance. These are things that really help to build up a great VMV process and practice. As a result, applying those verification validation, 
we can improve the product quality from acquisition to the operations. And also we can improve development process. There is two things that's important. That's the reason DevOps is becoming a very key element for VMV perspective. One is really improving the product quality, which we are validating the right product. The other one is improving development activities by doing verification activities. So let's take a look a little bit closer to the verification validation uh, process, and then we will dive into the how are we going to do the verification and validation under the DevOps umbrella. So the verification is more about the process, the verification analysis that we would like to look at as the during the development phases, we have to look at the specifications and how are we doing well based on the requirements, based on architecture, based on the design. So basically we're going to look at the requirements. Again, requirements, typically systems uh, requiring specification, maybe, maybe system design documentation. So there are a bunch of requirements that we wrote that we would like to verify how things that we are building based on the requirements. So which is kind of our input to us. What type of activities we will do for verification? We do the activities such as review, inspection, communications, inspections about looking for the code, code review. Walk through these are typical activities. We will do the verification analysis. The methods we are going to use for verification and static methods like checking the documentation or checking the code study analysis type of things will help us for a verification perspective. This is more about, again, during the uh, development phases of the product. The validation is really testing the developed product. Let's say we build up a, a feature or a capability through the pipeline. And we have to look at actual product now. The actual product, we're going to test those actual product based on the functionalities, based on non-functional testing or unit testing. So we can execute the code, we can execute the product, we're going to use the product as validating that the right things or not. The, the methods we typically use is about dynamic testing, which is kind of actual product we will do. So let's take a look together on align the verification validation. There is a kind of a, a typical V model as the result of the, the work from the CME as well. When we are building any type of capabilities, we can really, while we are creating the requirements at the beginning, we can validate our requirements as early as possible in the life cycle. As a parallel, we can create our acceptance testing as part of our requirements. When we do the design of the systems, we can start to build up the test plan for the systems. So we're not going to be finishing up the one side as building methodology for each of the components as building requirements and design and then coding. While we are in every phase, we have to think about how I'm going to verify, how I'm going to validate those features that I'm building so I can compare those. So technically, verification validation is really aligning together. And align together means if I'm writing requirements, let's think about acceptance testing. So let's let's go further down into the what are the typical uh, verification and validation activities. It is required based on IEEE standard 1012 and also recommended uh, activities based on the VNB process. So when you look at those activities, there are a lot of activities that needs to be done on a specific categorization. It's a lot. It's not that easy job. So we typically when we, that's one of the reasons actually it takes a lot of time for a safety critical system because you have to go through a lot of the process and all of the activities. If we do one at a time this activity serially, it takes maybe a month, maybe a year. So we have to really find a way to achieve those activities. As you can see, there are many activities. It's two pages, honestly. How are we going to do the evaluation of the design? How are we going to trace the How can we do criticality? How can we do the hazard analysis? What can we do the secret analysis? There's a lot of activities needs to be done. And as a typical IVNV activities, again, this is the IEEE standards, what the standard says that we have to follow those. That's the reason it takes a lot of time to build up a very critical systems. Our goal is really shorten those type of activities. Still, we will do, but we have to do in a cadence. So let's take a look. The second one is the second page of this activity. There are, again, risk analysis, source code, source code evaluations, and checking each of the components, 
looking for the configuration perspective, look at for all the checkout, look at for the versioning and ML evaluation. There are a lot of activities needs to be done. However, what I have been seeing so far as a community, we look at only static analysis, which is kind of a source code pieces right here. And we are saying it, yes, we did it. We verify, you validate it. It's a wrong assumption. So we cannot just uh, look at the code says we verified it and validated because it is not enough looking for other perspective as well. Why is not enough just looking for only static analysis pieces and say source code or review the code is not getting, it's just getting the code assurances only. But there are other type of activities needs to be done as anomaly or hazard analysis, risk analysis. These are the key activities needs to be done. Let me wrap, open up a little bit more about those key activities that's very important and like a hazard analysis. How are we going to build up some other safety controls? How are we going to build up some techniques and components so we can really eliminate some other hazardous component of the systems? How can we identify the potential system hazards? How can we assess the, any type of hazard component of the things we are building? Again, it may be some mechanical, maybe some other hardware design, but end of the day, there are a lot of software components needs to be controlled or measure those capabilities with respect to the hazard analysis. Another important one is the security analysis. As I said that a couple of minutes ago, we took a look at all the security pieces because much easier seems and to say we verify and validate the systems. On the security analysis, it goes back to the lifecycle perspective. That's one of the DevSecOps capabilities really helping with respect to secret analysis of analyzing the system from security perspective in terms of what type of potential securities we may have, such as applying the confidential integrity availability, which is CI, CIA triad model that we can use to identify those. And also we had assessed those uh, risks and sensitivities that the information we would like to process it. And we have analyzed of those security risks as throughout the life cycle, which is the secret analysis activity is required as the IBM view process. Another one is risk analysis, but security and risk goes hand in hand together, which we have to review and update risk analysis using risk test reports. Like what are the test results we were looking for? What are the risks in our organizations with respect to the product that we are building? What type of potential risk in the product that we have so we can eliminate the potential risks by using the hazard and security use cases? So typically risk and security are hand in hand goes together. If I know what type of risk I may have in application context or the product that I'm building, there is a security elements on it. Again, there are some technical problems we may see, but usually security is causing some outage and it's gonna cause the risk in the systems based on the risk system will not be available for the users. Especially when we talk about the critical safety systems, Need the human life will be horizon. And think about that's kind of a we are building a health related product. And think about that the product is really for a human life. We are trying to help the human for certain health functionalities. If the application fail, if the product failed because of security reasons, how are we going to make sure that the patient or the, the human will get enough indicators, notification based on the failures? So that's basically kind of a, a use case we had to think about it. Use case we had to think about for security perspective or has a perspective. Then we can re provide recommendation to eliminate and reduce those types of risks as well. So let's really combine those activities and dive into the what that really means in the DevSecOps environment. How can we collect those? How can we arrange those activities so we can go faster and then not trading off those activities, but applying those activities how and where in a life cycle. And I would like to a little bit spend a, a few minutes. I never spent a time yesterday as well and talking about DevOps and the agile practices core principles, just a couple minutes only, because if you guys get a more detail, you can look at the uh, yesterday's talk on the workshop, workshop that we did for DevOps and then DevSecOps and the core principles. And DevOps is really a set of principles and practice between all stakeholders. 
Remember the Vienna Verification Evaluation activities, it is requiring a constant communication and, and a collaboration with other stakeholders because we cannot have one activities ignoring others. And there are fundamental principles of DevOps is communication and a collaboration using the right infrastructure as a code, automation and monitoring elements. These are the key principles of DevOps practices. We can communicate and collaborate. We have to build up right platform as versioning, as automating, so we can monitor how are we doing well. And then other things I have to say is the DevSecOps factory concept, it is really getting a three-dimensional of thinking and having a processes for each of the phases we go from end to end. And also we can build up all the engines behind the processes, which is kind of feature requirement design and develop and test. And we can do the CI CD process like continuous integration, continuous integration, continuous deployment, including the other stakeholders so that can be visible and traceable for every work needs to be done. This is really a key point as the last bullet is here. We would like to have a, a really traceability of the product of the features that we are building. If we guys are in a regulated environment that you need to follow up some compliances, and especially safety critical system that we have to do. So we really verify and validate what, what are the reasons that I'm changing the code? What is the purpose that I'm changing code as a developers? What type of testing do I have to do? What is my acceptance criteria? The platform out of box, if you follow the good CI CD practice, if you follow the good DevOps practice, it is really helping us build that those traceabilities across the life cycle. At the same time, that will be transparent to the other stakeholders, which is a knowledge pieces that we have informed other stakeholders, management or auditors or risk group team member or a security team member or a tester or a caller, whoever has the right to say that can be visible for those people. A couple other notes also I have to mention in here, there are the main four environments in a software development life cycle where we have a development environment integration staging and production environment why i'm telling this type of environment because we have to really spread it ivnb activities verification validation activities based on certain environments to eliminate some of the problems that is kind of like a not able to do verify properly not able to validate the working software we have to keep some environments parity between those test harnesses. Typically what I have been saying is if you, as a developer, you may be verifying your components that you're writing against the requirements, you might be saying, yes, I am done because I build the right things based on what the specification says. But however, when it goes to the a testing environment or a staging environment or a production environment, it may be behaving differently because environment configurations is diverging from original settings. We have to solve this environment parity by using infrastructure as a code. We have to solve this problem by using the same environment configuration so we can speed up the verification validation practices by applying the environment parity concept, which is the one of the key principles of DevOps using infrastructure as a code concept. Another things I would like to mention as related to the uh, the environment parity, we can use the infrastructure as a code that is going to be creating all the components of the provision elements from end to end so we can really use those as a code as automated those practices. Then lastly, for the continuous integration practices, so we can really build up a model as a service so we can automatically build each of the components, verify against those uh, requirements based on the testing so we can build up the product and we can do the validation which is a kind of continuous integration is overall getting the the components from various developers merging and scaling up to the kind of bubbling up to the next level of the continuous integration so it's not just the one module we may have multiple pipeline multiple ci servers are building a product eventually we can combine those products or the components having a continuous integration on the system level build up. So what are we really trying to do? We are trying to automate overall systems from end to end, let the humans spending less time. 
So let's talk a look, come back again, combine both DevOps and DevSecOps with the right VMV activities, verification validations, right? So as we said at the beginning, modern software development phases, it is same as how are we building the software development lifecycle. Only difference is we are adding a feature now. Instead of building up a monolithical or instead of building up a waterfall thinking, we have to build up a feature. We have to build up a capability. Every time we have to validate and verify each of these capabilities. Like, so we can write the features based on the feature, which is our sprint, and we can verify this. How are we going to go into the depths? What's the, what's the steps? What type of activities do we have to do where? Like we're going to start from the requirements, which is the first phase about the feature that we are requesting. So what the features looks like, we are trying to request the feature and based on the requirements, so we can do some certain IVNV activities here, verification relevant activity, like a traceability, criticality. We can look at the requirements, try to make sure that we are creating the right requirements at the feature request stage. Do we have the right? So we can really look at some sort of a requirements verification at the beginning. How are we going to verify this? We will do those analysis during the uh, feature request phases, which we did the first verification right there. And when we go to the next one, next phase in life cycle, we can build up a more other IVA, VNV activities with, with respect to requirements. That we will look at the criticality. We're going to build up the software quality plan. We're going to build up the software acceptance plan. I'm going to open up a little bit parentheses here. When we are following agile practices, which we are using the Scrum as an example, if we are writing a story in our cases, we we have to write some acceptance criteria in our case. That's how are we going to convert our requirements, writing a case in a DevSecOps environment, and define what type of quality attributes, what type of acceptance criteria that we will accept those case as a result of finishing that case as an engineers. So technically, we are not right just writing the functionalities system shall do this, or I'm going to build up the page, but I have to also write what are the acceptance criteria that I'm going to use during the requirement phases. So really, we have to build up those test plan for verification and validation. So we have to build up the acceptance test plan for verification and validation. So we're going to think about what type of security requirements that we are going to do and during the requirement phases. Why it, it is important here, because at the end of the day, we have to have a traceability from security requirements all the way to the secure implementations. So we can very validate that our security implementations, it is the right things. If we don't know what type of requirements that we are building, we might be spending a lot of time by using just the static analysis only and not able to address the criticality of the components in the system. It might be wasting our time. Maybe we are ignoring some of the, the security vulnerabilities or we are not in enough time to address those. It's going to delay the a program to lay the components for further because we have to fix those. We cannot test those type of vulnerabilities for a safety critical system. Either we'll delay or we'll deliver something is not properly secure. When we get into the architecture and design, now it is going to start the validation process as we are building the components. Now, as soon as when we design any components, we can validate against the requirements that we did it. So you may say we don't have really built up the code yet, but still we, we may use some other model verification tools in that stage. We can design the system as a model, like using kind of a cameo model, other type of model. We can start to validate our models and the design phase against the requirements. Okay, that's kind of one way we can start to build up early validation process as while we are building the capabilities in the design phases. As you can see, there's kind of a relationship from the previous one adding extra uh, activities on top of the previous one. If we do everything in one time, it will take longer. So we get better building as incrementally as iterative, adding more activities as verification activities as we are going through the life cycle. 
When we get into the development phases, now when we look at the source code, and then we look at the static analysis, we can look at other type of security related checks in this level, as well as looking for the code quality, as well as we can look at other type of safety concerns in the code level. So now, how are we gonna compare those? This is another two steps here. We can do the verification and the validation. We will look at the code to verify against the requirements. During that process, we can start to do the code checking. We can start the code functionalities, right? Execute those as a specific testing, like unit testing we can do, or we can do some other certain testing. The code level during the development phases, we can start to build up the validation process as well. When we get into the testing, now typically verification validation does in that stage only. So now we have to really looking forward to from beginning to the end, we can look at the testing on actual product to look at the validations. And I listed here so verification as well. Again, verification will derive our validation of the components. How are we doing well for the running applications? which we are going to use our acceptance test criteria that we had in the requirements. Like if I am running a continuous integration server, then I build up the product and I build up the product is up and running. Can we use those acceptance criteria as part of our continuous integration test cases as a orchestrator, we can start execute those. So we can look at the certain security risks that we define at the beginning. We can look at the typical hazard scenarios on the product and try to test those capabilities as we are building a feature base. So if you realize that kind of we kind of created a more about iterative incremental perspective by using the DevSecOps techniques, try to build up verification validation as we go through. And as I said at the beginning, continuous integration is like a building every changes. How are we going to build up every changes? We have to build up incremental those process. One example for all of you, like a Tesla does a great example for verification and validation of their car, which basically kind of created incremental. Every time when there's a new changes, they push into the car, that changes can be some mechanical changes, that changes sometimes maybe the software, more, more about the software, it's basically a Tesla is a software company, right? So if there is any changes on how the control unit will work in the software, how to get the sensors data, how to manage the any talks and the power in the software, then it's actually creating incremental version of the changes. It goes back to the package, to the auditor. It says, here's what we have approved at the past. Here's my test result for a differential version of the previous one. Look at the differences, what I have done as an organization. I built up the one product but I added another one as the new changes on my test cases, here is the result. Again, we have to really show the result. How are we gonna get those results as a result of the continuous integration server, as a result of test analysis in that stage? So we haven't done yet. We haven't done, we have to look at the delivery phase, which is kind of an end product. With deliver, we are looking for some acceptance criteria during the delivery phase. There is a two concept of the uh, deliver and deployment, Delivery usually goes into the more uh, staging environment that like we are trying to test. We may be integrating many other components. We might be looking for other capabilities. We might be checking for installations. Do we have a right installation checklist here? Do we have really configuration for each components? How are we gonna make sure that people will took our code or a system and make sure ready? If this is an opportunity, we can look at how the system is gonna be ready to deploy how the system is going to be ready to use. Still, we have a time to improve. Again, this is just moving on. When we get into the deployment phases, which is the last phase right now, now we can look at the final acceptance testing. We can look at the new constraints on the system. We might be getting it. Now, it's a way that we can collect the data, each of the phases, like during the deployment phases, during delivery phases, we can do those type of activities and try to build up the data sets. So how are we gonna do this type of things? That like we can really start to build up a data throughout the life cycle. Like, again, this is a continuous process, as I said. We will collect those type of data during the each of the phases. Like when we get into the testing, we can collect the test data sets and feeding back to the requirements or feeding back to the design. 
or when we get into the an operation environment, we can collect data as a result of anomalies. We may look at the specific integration results. So these are the things that will help us to move fast, get into the a production. Again, data is not just a, a production. Data is going to get throughout the life cycle as well, from requirements, design, architect, development, test, and feeding back to all the stakeholders, feeding back to the process. So overall summary, what we said so far, really we would like to build up a continuous verification validation in every phases of life cycle. So from all the way to the verification from beginning, so we can build up the validation. If you look at the just the validation pieces, it is too late. If you look at the just the verification pieces as well, we are building a code, while we are building the capabilities, it is not enough either. So really we have to build up a verification validation throughout the life cycle. Another wheel of the VNV workflow, which basically help us meet the expectation of the customers as the users, which is validation. How can we get the feedback from all the way to the expectation in each phases of the life cycle? That's really how the verification validation will work as iterative and incrementally. We can verify as we are building the product and we can look at output and validate it, getting back to the result and sharing which is a continuous a process throughout the life cycle. It's a continuous verification validation process based on the continuous feedback we collected from the user based on data sets that we will move forward. With that said, if you would like to get the more information, you can look at those URL for the more about the DevOps, more about the webinar and podcast, you can get more information. If you would like to reach out to me, here is my email address and happy to continue to communicate with all of you for a further questions on how are we going to collect those? What type of data that we might be looking for? Maybe you have a specific use case you would like to share with me. So I'm going to open up the floor for any question, Yusika. Okay, thank you very much. We are actually running out of time, but uh, uh, let me ask a question from myself, <clears throat> which is, mm -hmm. you know, verification and validation is, uh, um, have been, uh, you know, stressed the importance for like uh, three decades or more. <laughs> probably even mm -hmm. in the waterfall era so uh <clears throat> what are the difference or what what are the common things and different things in the water you know importance of vnv in waterfall uh style and also the uh, you know recent uh DevSecOps style what are yeah. the common things yeah. and different things the, the big big differences and uh, when we look at the verification in old days without that ups we always look at the uh, more time spending on the verification of the model, creating a model, try to make sure that model is basically creating a digital representation or a creating the uh, kind of a cameo style model, looking for the requirements, try to verify those requirements. It's a lengthy process. When we kind of build it without thinking about the validation, so we kind of focus more verification at the beginning, but when you really get into the validation at the end, it might be too late because we may not have the right products. The key questions here, do we have the right product? We've had the right process. We may have a right process. We typically, waterfall era, we look at the right process. We are gonna make sure that we are building the a product correctly, which is a waterfall, ignoring the validation pieces. So when we have a product, it might be too late. Maybe product is wrong. Now DevSecOps says, Let's do the a continuously verify and validate, verify and validate. So we are verifying the product against the requirements. At the same time, we are making sure that we build the right products with getting a user input. That's what the DevSecOps is really bringing here to get early feedback, to get early result from the product that we build the right product. The user will say, yes, I used it. It's working for me. That's mm -hmm. how the time is getting shortened because we did parallel. How did we parallel? We did based on the features, based on iterative incremental perspective. How DevSecOps is helping? It is building up the right infrastructure, building up the right mindset, building up the right cadence. That's the kind of a connection with the DevSecOps and verification validation process. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So lastly, Hassan, you would like you said you would like to help more in the Japanese industry and also the government. What's your passion for it? 
The, the, my passion is again, uh, when I look at the creator of the Toyota color for the lean manufacturing, it's the creator of the all the lean manufacturing concept for agility, for the performance, for the quality. We should really look at the software perspective as well in that regards and try to build up because I see a great technology companies as are growing up, they're doing a great product. Why don't we improve the quality with respect to security? and short to the time frame, get to meet the demands on it. And other reason is actually, I have a lot of Japanese students in my class and I have a good connections and I would like them to really get more educated, more learn, more sharing so we can build up right community, which is another passion that I have. As you know, that I have many students from Japanese as well from my class and I would like to continue to be part of the community. Okay, thank you very much. So let's thank you. Thanks uh, for having me, yeah. Yusuka. Thank you. Yeah, let's uh, start to plan for next year uh, as soon as we finish the uh, today's Absolutely, one. Absolutely, yes. Okay, thank you Absolutely. very much. Bye bye. You're welcome. Have a nice bye. night. Okay, then we are running over time by 10 minutes because I've been asking too many questions, but I'd like to move on to the uh, next section. I am going to invite uh, Mr. Oshiba from Robust Intelligence. Uh, good morning, Oshiba-san. I met you a couple of months ago and you have presented me the amazing product. And you know, although I have been working in the AI, uh, but I have never noticed what you have invented. And that was an amazing product. And that's the reason why I invited you to share that amazing product with us. And and a, and a, you uh, graduated from Kaisei and then you, know, you went to the uh, Harvard University in order to start up uh, a, a company with your uh, professor, supervisor. And so what, what, what was your career motivation? And what, you know, I am always uh, very much, I'm not good at becoming the competitor, but, so I'm trying to be very conscious about the way uh, I can win. And so that's my strategy in my life. Okay, thank you very much. That's your life strategy. So you have 30 minutes uh, to go from now. So could you please just begin now? So you are from San Francisco today, are you? Yes, from the headquarters. So I think you were in Tokyo, you know, I, I was there in, in Tokyo and now in, in San Francisco and then I'll be back in, in two weeks time. So if you think that the, it is worthwhile uh, to use it and, and, I, and I am going to go back to Japan within a matter of two weeks, so just uh, uh, contact me. I think there are 1600 viewers here today on YouTube. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, also, I'm a co-founder of Robust Intelligence, as introduced by Hirohara san I'm doing business in San Francisco, and I know that yeah, we have an incremental number of users, so thank you very much indeed for inviting me to this conference. And let me just briefly go about my company. and. And the, uh, we, I am going to focus upon the discussion on the AI DevSecOps. And, but before that, my company is here as introduced by the I, I founded a company and I used to be searching the AI vulnerability. And I, I established this company with my supervisor professor. And, uh, and we have called all the AI uh, experts uh, and hire them into a company in the software and the 50 million the uh, procurement has been done from the top companies. And you can see our company has become a, a little by little known and that they have been covered by the Nikkei newspaper and also the Apex and also and from the uh, uh, we have had the uh, digital governance lecture in at the Tokyo University Political Science uh, Graduate School and Andre Science at the age of 50, and also the ML Apps uh, was and then a company of the year picked us up and also Raku 10 and then again granted us the uh, Technology Excellence Award. 
before I go into my discussion topic, since we are running over time, so I just would like to uh, ask you to get those main takeaways. You can see the software is the main theme, and that the various kind of DevSecOps technologies are offered to the software, and you can see those names, which I know. And whereas on the right hand side, you can see what's happening in AI is that, in principle, and it might be the uh, extreme analogy, but the the they usually AI does the uh, uh, model, uh, runs a model, and then it, it uh, comes up with their ninety nine percent accuracy. But in the practice, there it is disrupted because it's not perfect, and so therefore, our DevSecOps from the DevSecOps point of view, we have a gap of the uh, achievement and uh, pro uh, performance provided by AI. So so that is uh, where we are giving the solution. AI needs to employ DevSecOps. So that's the message we're going to take you to. And how we are coping with that, the uh, provision of the uh, DevSecOps into AI, that's what I'm going to ex ex explain. And the uh, AI risk and then ML, ML integrity, uh, those uh, two uh, will be explained using the demo. And first, uh, about the AI risk. That's our problem. You can see we have got the uh, accelerated introduction of AI in many industrial fields. And it's, whereas you can see AI, AI fails often, for example, the, uh, as uh, very much mentioned in the uh, media, because of the age or because of the gender, it discriminates. And also, uh, depending upon the data model, uh, the performance is going to be changed. If you develop the uh, model before the corona, since the corona has changed the data, so you are not able to use the model any longer. And the, I'm going to go into the data, details about the security, but the, if you have got the antagonistic data uh, to be imported in the AI, or if the data pipeline is broken, you could consider various kind of challenges versus AI, and then, the the issue is that in the various kind of countries or the, the companies are introducing the AI, but they are also importing the uh, risks associated with the AI. That's uh, what the uh, challenge we identify, and you can see those challenges are, are actually causing a lot of uh, problem in many various kind of companies that are zero. Uh, is uh, the uh, housing search site and uh, more than and it caused uh, the more than 330 million worth of a lot and also the uh, in case of Goldman man sex and the uh actual credit card limit for husband 20 times higher than wives uh, that sort of case uh, was uh, uh, caused in, so in case of our company uh, customer let's say paper or Xperia or um, uh, USD or defense uh, uh, just in the office and also the uh, Tokyo Kaijo or Japanese banking institutions, uh, they have been, they are very much keen on the AI quality control and the governance and, uh, and that's the reason why uh, those, uh, they have employed our system program and uh, because those issues are emerging and the uh, security is not in the exception. And as far as we capture all the newspaper articles, you can see AI is exploited, some attacks the AI, and you really can stop finding those issues upon, and then it's going to increase on the rise. So you, this is just a tip of I, iceberg, and we call it the silent error. Uh, because in case of the software, you can see the uh, server is crashed, or you can see the uh, speed slow down. That's visual. But in case of AI, we call it the garbage in garbage up but there. And AI is keep on eating the garbage data and and, the, and then just producing the uh, more and the wrong on the uh, performance. And then that is a major risk about associated with the AI. And there are three kinds of AI risks that we believe. One is about the performance performance of data quality, those are the operational uh, risk. And then another one, the responsible risk, is in terms of fairness or ethics and compliance. And the last one, the security and the privacy risk. And uh, the, uh, it includes the attack against the AI. And so those risks are actually tied with AI. And you can see the, uh, the all the security OSF experts here. So let me just highlight the security. 
issue. And uh, so what kind of security incidents are observed? And you can see, uh, as an assumption, uh, that we have uh, the uh, various kind of uh, vulnerabilities uh, because a uh, system uh, is uh, actually uh, comprised of the software stack and then the data and the learning algorithm. That is the flow. And the software vulnerabilities and the model of um, vulnerabilities, and the, uh, we, it has the various kind of vulnerabilities uh, incorporated in it. And this is a very easy example for you to understand. This is a software. Uh, unique uh, vulnerabilities about the AI supply chain vulnerabilities, so we call. And let's say uh, usually AI is developed by Python and uh, it is serialized with pickles. And 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 then if you if you have the insight into security, the uh, the we can actually make it run wrongly utilizing some uh, the codings and but that is not well understood as you can see and we have the uh, producing a production model or the synthesis model but then a high-end model is actually open in open source and it is stored in the pickle file and if you run it then you uh, the descent is uh, assigned, is uh, assigning the different or wrong uh, codes and that would happen and in our company, uh, so-called Hugging Hay Face, uh, very famous uh, model repository is there, and we have provided the uh, demo over there. And you can see, and we have just uploaded the uh, pre-trained model upon the Hugging Face. And just we execute it as a try. And what happens is here, and then you can see the browser is opened, and and the all the commands are coming up. And so let's say if you cite the transformer from the hugging face, as soon as you try transfer it, then that sort of malware is to be triggered. So that sort of risk is associated with AI. And another thing is that AI could be deceived. Let's say in this case, uh, Microsoft uh, has got the uh, chatbot like uh, called the Tay Tweet. And if you cast the uh, odd question, then it uh, responds uh, with the uh, very indecent uh, response. And, and, and upon the tweet, uh, it is trying to send the code to uh, 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 deceive the filter of Twitter. You see this face recognition with the bed or wig, and it, it can deceive uh, people. And so this is a very known uh, example. If you put uh, stickers on the stop and the, uh, and the auto or uh, a uh, drive vehicle would understand it as uh, it, that and that is the speed limit of 30 kilometers. So just uh, taking this opportunity, I just would like to show you the security attack model. And uh, this is the face recognition system. And you can see this is him, you know, that guy. And if you look at the forecast, it is, it, it is estimating Bernie Sanders will be the winner. But uh, we are have actually and uh, execute, we have executed the uh, black box attack uh, to this face recognition. And if you just decode, and uh, there are several noises, and then that actually is causing and 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 the uh, the deceived. And you can see this is a software to process the uh, uh, check. And you can see it says four hundred one point, but it says four hundred one dollars. But it can be recognized as seven and one, and this is a very special attack executed from AI to AI. You can, if you just zoom in, you can see as a matter, the wrong pixels are actually layered on top. And there are very few pixels are layered, but it is a very difficult. Attack, but they, if you have got the uh, colors like gray or others, uh, there are a couple of ways to attack. If you add the uh, uh, monotonous colors uh, with a a pixels or not, but maybe 50, 60 pixels would lead you to the deception. And uh, this is a, a patent uh, application technology. And so you can deceive the AI. That is the vulnerability of AI. And yes, yes. Eh, 
Oh. So there's an original image, and it is. Uh, we look we look at that with the inspector. So this is just a. Uh, uh, the standard. What this is what we sh we are supposed to see. And uh, we do something to this image. And what happens is that Facebook is gone. So we did not access the model. This is the system out there in the market. So we don't know what is inside the model. And there's a query uh, limits. And after the multiple queries with the black box, and this is what we can do. Uh, we are uh, not the malicious actors, but the malicious actors may do something very bad. So in uh, summary of what we have done, and talked about for the security risk we collect the data and verify the model and there are multiple risks so that is really um the, the issue or the problematic aspects of ai so i focus on security but uh, there's a risk of deterioration of operation and ethics and uh, uh, equity of the ai and the security risk so this is the uh, comprehensive risk and how the, uh, we can eliminate the risk. And elimination of the, the risk is uh, the mission of our company. So, so far, I have talked about the challenges. And now uh, let me switch the gear to talk about the solutions, how we are resolving the, the, uh, the challenges. And we call it end-to-end -end platform for ML integrity. So what it is about is uh, through the uh, uh, ML uh, life cycle, how we can achieve the integrity. So that's what platform achieves. And let me talk about how. And we take a test-driven approach. So when uh, AI is built, there should be the, uh, the, the test. So it is test-driven approach. And that just makes sense for the software people. You know, there has to be the test. But uh, surprisingly, it is not the case necessarily. And when we look at the uh, one perf performance metric and it is deployed uh, with a Jupyter uh, auto book, there's a manual on Python work, someone has it and what other people do not have it. If that particular person leaves the company, uh, you don't know what you, sh you should be doing. So there are a lot of challenges, CI, CD, uh, shift to left, observability so uh, they are not really it's they are not there so we want to really take a test driven approach uh, so that uh, we can uh, really look at the uh, the entire process so there are two phases the development and deployment so for model development cycle we have AI stress testing. So security, fairness, robustness, sensitivity. So it is checked with the uh, multiple perspectives like that. And for a deployment, we have AI firewall. So, you know, in a, so there are sometimes the noise, outliers. What this does is that uh, AI is protected real time. That is AI firewall. And we have AI continuous testing. Data is changing, right? And with that, uh, model performance only deteriorates. Uh, they do not get better. So it tells you model is deteriorating and uh, it does the uh, uh, cause analysis. Uh, it continuously tests them. So these are the uh, three features with these three features to manage the risk for end-to-end -end platform for ML integrity. Now I would like to show you some uh, demo. So this is the UI of our product. And this is governance dashboard. A multiple models are available. Let's take something uh, similar, uh, simple. So this is the UI of AI stress testing. So metrics like accuracy, 
and there are 46 tests. So it applies a multiple perspectives. So let's take something simple, a subset performance testing. So when there are segmentation of the data, uh, it looks at if there are difference in performance. So let's look at it. So Chicago, San Francisco performance is good, but uh, Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo performance is not good. So even though overall performance is good, some users uh, may be negatively impacted. So that is the, the challenge here. And there are other risks. And there's another example. When there's, when there's abnormal inputs, so when there's a new or different Chrome version, and the model performance will be deteriorated by this much. So this is what analysis tells you. So I talked about the operational risks. And we can also uh, check the, uh, the fairness. And we have more than 10 tests to measure the, uh, the fairness. Let's take uh, a race, you know, the black, white, um, Asian. Uh, it, it tells you uh, whether certain race is discriminated against. And it is based on uh, multiple standards. So I showed you table data particularly uh, fairness and operational risks. But uh, of course, security risk can be checked. And we use not only data, uh, uh, we can use natural language and image. So let's take uh, natural languages. So let's do some standard operational checking. This is how it looks like. So, you know, when there are common misspelling or typos, uh, you can it can make a prediction. And for fairness perspective, uh, I, I cannot find it here. But anyways, so from fairness perspective, let's say the the name uh, that are common for the male the name common for female and if we include homoglyph intentionally they are more almost the same sentence but the, when there's a homoglyph so it looks the same but the, actually they are not the same and that gives the different predictions it means that it can be a target of the attack but other than that uh, we can simulate and uh, do the testing. So just deleting one letter, uh, prediction is different. And we can do something similar with images. This is another simple example with the image of the animal. It was German Shepherd originally, but uh, it is categorized as gorilla. And there's another example with the uh, image uh, recognition when it is snowing, some of some of the objects are not identified. So we take a multiple uh, scenarios to do the testing. So data te data scientists have done something manually or something they haven't tested, but now it can be automated and it can be standardized across the organization. And it can start from a Python uh, SQL and it can be um, piped into CI and CD. And when there are new interns, maybe you can ask interns to um, execute testing. So that, that's how you can implement DevSecOps across your organization. Uh, in the topic of DevSecOps, we talk about audits, right? So those audits who are not engineers. So we have audit uh, kind of uh, feature. This is called model card. So the result of the stress test uh, can be output as a report on a PDF format, and they can be submitted to risk, risk team and compliance team. Uh, maybe I talked too much about uh, stress testing. Let me show you some continuous tests. 
you know, there is the standard tracking metrics like AUC and accuracy, you can do that. But when the performance is deteriorating, uh, you can look at why. So maybe there's a rapid increase of rare categories and that uh, contributes to deterioration of the performance and it can send alert. So the monitoring, uh, the, the, the data movement. So those solutions are something we are offering. And also the real time, and there are a number of events. So for rare category, for instance, so the, when there's an individual event, it tells you what are the issues with certain data points and how much it is impacting on the performance. And they are uh, tracked real time and it is shown on a dashboard here. So this is what we do. So when the model is built end to end, we can implement CI uh, CD process. So this is kind of the, uh, so there's a firewall type of feature and continuous monitoring uh, of the uh, observer type of the features. So we have these. So, so we cannot say we cover uh, everything about the DevSecOps, but uh, in terms of ach achieving DevSecOps for uh, a model building, we believe that we are making a contribution to the industry and not only our company. Yes. Uh, we hope uh, the clients will use our service, but more importantly, across the industry, uh, there should be the atmosphere where every people think that uh, we should achieve DevSecOps. So this is the summary. There are multiple risks around AI, performance deterioration, bias, uh, fairness, uh, malicious attacks. And you have to protect AI from these attacks. And we offer solutions for end-to-end uh, uh, -end process and table table data computer vision. There are multiple types of AI. Uh, we offer the solution that is comprehensive. So that is something we are working on uh, to be part of DevSecOps, and that should be the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. So can I say what I felt? So it was really the uh, uh, impressive uh, explanation. So, so it was very impressive. So I wrote the first book. When I, when I wrote the first book, you know, in the AI world, people think that the model is 99% accurate. So when I wrote the uh, first book, I said that it's not about accuracy, but th this has to be something that works as a software. So I laid out the methodologies. So, so the first book was about ML Ops. It was 2018. And and other than the deep learning, we cannot really expect the evolution of machine learning. So what is important is the uh, uh, the security and uh, uh, stop sign. And, you know, you talked about the check and just the one, just the 10 pixels, uh, the, 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 the numbers are identified differently. So it was in a book. So that threat kind of emerged around from, from from around 2018 and and we talked about talk about cyber security but in order to really think about uh, cyber security uh, we have to really uh, think about geopolitical situation uh, but uh, the robustness of ai we knew it was important but uh, we did not anything about it and i thought somebody will work on this but uh, you know it was 2019 right when you founded your company so i did not think it could happen this fast and this is very thoughtful case and when there's a great hacker uh, hackers with that has the uh, um uh, the the great capability of deployment so i want to ask why were you able to 
develop such a solutions in a very quick manner. Yes, you are successful in financing, but、uh, what made you、uh, very speedy and quick to、uh, offer the solutions like that? Yes, there are two. So the, I talked about the test driven, up, driven approach. I will say we invented it, but、uh, they are the main、uh, focus. So everything is around test. So with the same framework, engineers can add tests、uh, surrounding、uh, our vulnerabilities. So, you know, startups, companies sometimes do a lot of things which is out of control, but this is not. So,、uh, this model. That you created can be applied to、uh, other a r e a So, in one platform, you can do the customization. And, second one,、uh, we founded Security Focus. That, is, that was a company.、Uh, Expedia was the first company. The data size, when we looked at the data size, and、uh, their, so their concerns w a s about. The, the mistakes or failures that data scientists may make. It was two years ago, and that was a great insight. So we made a shift. I talked about the three operational risks. So these are the first focus, and it started from there. And we have more AI regulation focusing on fairness. And very recently, because of a couple of incidents, security interest、uh, is growing. So, it is about what to focus. Yes, thank you. I think history repeats. So, when I first saw the data robot, I felt something, and I saw your service, and I felt something similar. You know, data robots can、uh, try a number of algorithms, and it chooses the best one、uh, using the variables. So, when I looked at it,、uh, my colleagues looked at it, it was good for training for the da data scientists. So, you know, so, this kind of algorithm is applied to this application. So, it was a great tool for the training. And when I looked at the tool of robust intelligence, it was a great insight. So, it is very important to how we think about it. So, what you introduced about、uh, our remarks. By Expedia.、Uh, I relate to that. Yes, thank you. When I talk to Japanese clients, many of, many of them say it's too early. They are, they are de developing data scientists. And we say that's, that's why you should be using that today. We can accelerate the development of the people. Okay, we have a question.、Uh, can we think about the,、uh, uh, the risk? For the sound noise? Yes. So, the,、uh, the new type of the,、uh, uh, the, the, the scam, when there's、uh, celebrities, you can download an、uh, audio file from、uh, YouTube and podcast. And with the real time voice, you can、uh, really deceive people doing a scam.、Uh, actually, uh, the, uh, a billion of yen uh, was uh, swindled using that kind of approach. That's right. The images, videos, audios, anything can be used today. So that means there are a lot of opportunities, opportunities for you. But、uh, as a society overall, we don't want to see such uh, uh, issues. And creating a system to prevent it from happening is very important. My last question. When you were a junior high school student and high school student, did you join the CTF for a competition program? No,、uh, I, was, I, was, I was not in a STEM field in、uh, junior high school and high school.、Uh, it was much later, I was into statistics and、uh, the, those areas. So, The, so, we st I started to work on CS and stats after I entered the university. It's been three years since you graduated from the university. Okay, so you have come here after only seven to eight years, right? Okay, so that is, so that is a message for everyone. Let's work on reskilling.、Uh, but thank you. Thank you, Oshiba san.
and, and in the afternoon there will be a lot of interesting sessions so please stay okay now we are going to take a break uh, let me just check the schedule so this is going to be a lunch break and we are more than 10 minutes uh, behind the schedule so let's take uh, a 30 minute break so please be back at uh, five after one japan time so the uh mr samia from ntt data is going to give us a presentation and there are some messages from the sponsors so please look at it during the lunch time uh, but uh this is the end of the uh, morning session thank you for your participation デブセックオプスデイズ東京はデブセックオプスを推進するためのコミュニティ活動に賛同してくださる多くの企業団体から支援を受けていますプラチナスポンサー NRI Secure Technologies GMO Cyber Security by Ierae Silver Sponsor HRD Profiles Startup Sponsor Robust Intelligence Richelka Security Coen America Taishikan Keizai Sangyoshou 総務省文部科学省デジタル庁サイバーセキュリティ戦略本部カーネギーメロン大学ソフトウェアエンジニアリングインスティテュートカーネギーメロン大学サイラボコグニティブCTF世界から届いた食材が彩るディナーテーブル約束の場所に時間通り安全に到着する交通機関どこでも安心して受けられる医療や薬遠く離れて暮らす家族に送る誕生日のプレゼントその日常は人や物をつなぐ仕組みで支えられている。お客様と社会と、そして世界中に広がる仲間とともに新しい仕組みを作り繋いできた。世界は常に変化を続け、時には想像もしなかった困難を私たちに突きつける。必要なのは何ができるか
ささやかな幸せにあふれた日常あの成長ですおときめく顧客体験を磨き続ける世界<笑>豊かな社会意味のある仕事を作る誰もがビジョンにチャレンジできる誰も想像できない大きな成功イントゥリアンの目からウルコの瞬間を提供する製造の無人化子供たちの未来ベータかけるワクワクイコール未来できたらいいなを形に仲間の笑顔が未来の笑顔を作る未来は作るものだというふうに考えているので仕事を通じて新しい価値をですね想像すればですね日本がまだまだですね成長できる面白い機会を作ることができると思っているので、えー、かなり広範囲のビジネスをですね僕らはご支援できるんじゃないかなというふうに思っています。その意志が世界を守る。テクノロジーは常に進化するインターネットが人々の間に広く普及し始めてからさまざまな技術が加速度的に進化し派生し広がった気がつけば私たちの暮らしは便利さという名のもとで大きく様変わりしてきたテクノロジーをどう使うかそれはその人間自身に委ねられる人はいつの時代も人が作り出した矛盾にとらわれている善か悪か勝つか負けるか傷つけるのか守り抜くのかそのパラドックスに常に挑んでいる今やビジネスだけではなく日常生活においても IT の力が不可欠になり全てがネットワークでつながる時代24時間365日社会全体が常に IT の引き起こすリスクと向き合わなければならない時代の変化を見極め新たな知識を蓄え培ってきた技術と経験によって決して負けられない戦いに挑み続けていく恐れずに進もうあなたの揺るぎない意志がこれからの時代を守っていくその仕事で人類の豊かさを確かなものにしていくんださあプロフェッショナルとしての誇りを胸にこの社会を前進させていこうその意志が世界を守る NRI セキュアテクノロジーズ「コグニティブ CTF」は誰でも楽しく。セキュリティを考慮したプログラミングが学べるゲーミフィケーションプラットフォームですすでにソフトウェアエンジニアとして活躍している方もプログラミングに興味のある中学生、高校生、大学生でもどなたでもゲーム感覚でお楽しみいただけますコグニティブ CTF は政府機関の研究開発プロジェクトとしてコグニティブリサーチラボと東京大学京都大学が共同開発しました軍事大国の現役サイバー兵士が取り組むような難易度の高いものから初めてプログラミングを学ぶ中高生の初心者の方でも楽しめるものまで多様な問題を取り揃えていますコグニティブ CTF に取り組むことで基本的なコーディングスキル暗号解読フォレンジクスリバースエンジニアリングバイナリ解析などに関する問題を解きながらハッカーとしてのスキルを向上することができます悪意を持ったハッカーがどのように攻撃してくるかについての知識がなければソフトウェアの安全と安心を保つことはできません現代はあらゆるソフトウェア開発者にハッカーとしてのスキル習得が必要になっているのですぜひあなたも一度コグニティブ CTF でハッカーとしての腕前を試して楽しくスキルアップしてみませんか QR コードを読み取ってぜひ参加登録をお願いしますどなたでも無料でお楽しみいただけます「インターネットの発展は私たちの生活を便利に豊かに変えました」。今では水やガス、電気と同じくらい生活に欠かせない重要なインフラです。会社や学校
病院銀行や工場ありとあらゆる場所とシステムがインターネットにつながっていますそんなインターネットがサイバー攻撃の脅威にさらされているなんてあってはならないと私たちは考えます私たちはサイバー攻撃で使われる脆弱性や攻撃手法を日々研究していますその結果なんと直近1年間で約30件のゼロデイの脆弱性を発見しました私たちは悪意あるハッカーが攻撃するよりもずっと前にお客様のシステムのセキュリティホールを見つけてご報告します私たちはこれまで先進的なセキュリティ技術を研究し知識を共有してきました私たちはこれからも企業とシステムを利用する全ての人をサイバー攻撃から守ります目に見えない脅威から暮らしを守る日本を守る全ての人に安心と安全なインターネット HRD グループは科学的なアプローチで人事や組織の改革を強力に支援しています今多くの企業がデジタルトランスフォーメーションに取り組んでいるのではないでしょうかデジタルテクノロジーを活用することにより営業やマーケティングの見直し業務プロセスの自動化がさまざまな企業で実現されていますでは人材や組織に関してはどうでしょう一人一人の才能や個性に合わせた適材適所の実現や効果的なコミュニケーションの実践はデジタル化とは無縁の勘と経験に頼っているのが現状ではないでしょうかこのような勘と経験に頼ってきた人事や組織の課題もデータにより解決する時代になってきています私たちの提供するディスクとプロファイル XT は科学的検証に裏打ちされた人材測定ツールです一人一人のモチベーションの源泉やそのポテンシャルを見出すことで組織や人材の課題を解決します全世界でこれまでに6000万人10万社日本でもこれまで120万人以上の顧客が効果を実感しているソリューションですこれからのデジタル時代の企業における改革の本質は人と組織のトランスフォーメーションにあると私たちは考えています HRD グループのディスクとプロファイル XT が組織や人材の改革を可能にします効果的なコミュニケーションによる組織力向上に興味のある方はディスクで社内の適材適所の実現や人材のポテンシャルを見出すことに興味のある方はプロファイル XT で検索してぜひ一度ホームページからお問い合わせください DevSecOps Days 東京は DevSecOps を推進するためのコミュニティ活動に賛同してくださる多くの企業・団体から支援を受けていますプラチナスポンサー NTT データブレインパッドコグニティブリサーチラボゴールドスポンサー NRI セキュアテクノロジーズ GMO サイバーセキュリティバイイエラエシルバースポンサー HRD プロファイルズスタートアップスポンサーロバストインテリジェンスリジェルカセキュリティ公園アメリカ大使館経済産業省総務省文部科学省デジタル庁サイバーセキュリティ戦略本部カーネギーメロン大学ソフトウェアエンジニアリングインスティテュートカーネギーメロン大学サイラボコグニティブ CTF「世界から届いた食材が彩るディナーテーブル」「約束の場所に時間通り安全に到着する交通機関」「どこでも安心して受けられる」医療や薬遠く離れて暮らす家族に贈る誕生日のプレゼントその日常は人や物をつなぐ仕組みで支えられているお客様と
社会とそして世界中に広がる仲間とともに新しい仕組みを作りつないできた世界は常に変化を続け時には想像もしなかった困難を私たちに突きつける必要なのは何ができるかではなく何をすべきか社会があるべき姿とは何か次の世代にも続く本当に豊かな暮らしとは何かそれを見つめ私たちは行動する「NTT データ」ビッグデータや AI 技術が脚光を浴びるデータの時代がやってきた巨大企業もベンチャー企業もデータを大きな経営資源と捉えビジネスに取り入れようとしています15年以上前からデータ活用の可能性をまっすぐに信じてきた私たち今こそ一緒にデジタルトランスフォーメーションで開けるドアがあると思うのです。持続可能な未来につながる扉、成長し続ける。できること、広がる。データ分析の民主化。最適な意思決定。挑戦できる未来。ささやかな幸せにあふれた日常。あの成長です。ときめく。顧客体験を磨き続ける世界。<笑>豊かな社会。意味のある仕事を作る。誰もがビジョンにチャレンジできる。誰も想像できない。大きな成功。イントゥリアンの。目から鱗の瞬間を提供する。製造の矛盾化。子供たちの未来。データかけるワクワクイコール未来できたらいいなを形に仲間の笑顔が未来の笑顔を作る未来は作るものだというふうに考えているので仕事を通じて新しい価値をですね想像すればですね日本がまだまだですね成長できる面白い機会を作ることができると思っているので、えー、かなり広範囲のビジネスをですね僕らはご支援できるんじゃないかなというふうに思っています意志が世界を守る。テクノロジーは常に進化する。インターネットが人々の間に広く普及し始めてから、さまざまな技術が加速度的に進化し、派生し、広がった。気がつけば、私たちの暮らしは便利さという名のもとで大きく様変わりしてきた。テクノロジーをどう使うか。それはその人間自身に委ねられる人はいつの時代も人が作り出した矛盾にとらわれている善か悪か勝つか負けるか傷つけるのか守り抜くのかそのパラドックスに常に挑んでいる今やビジネスだけではなく日常生活においても IT の力が不可欠になり全てがネットワークでつながる時代24時間365日社会全体が常に IT の引き起こすリスクと向き合わなければならない時代の変化を見極め新たな知識を蓄え培ってきた技術と経験によって決して負けられない戦いに挑み続けていく恐れずに進もうあなたの揺るぎない意志がこれからの時代を守っていくその仕事で人類の豊かさを確かなものにしていくんださあプロフェッショナルとしての誇りを胸にこの社会を前進させていこうその意志が世界を守る NRI セキュアテクノロジーズ「コグニティブ CTF」は誰でも楽しく。セキュリティを考慮したプログラミングが学べるゲーミフィケーションプラットフォームですすでにソフトウェアエンジニアとして活躍している方もプログラミングに興味のある中学生、高校生、大学生でもどなたでもゲーム感覚でお楽しみいただけますコグニティブ CTF は政府機関の研究開発プロジェクトとしてコグニティブリサーチラボと東京大学
京都大学が共同開発しました軍事大国の現役サイバー兵士が取り組むような難易度の高いものから初めてプログラミングを学ぶ中高生の初心者の方でも楽しめるものまで多様な問題を取り揃えていますコグニティブ CTF に取り組むことで基本的なコーディングスキル暗号解読フォレンジクスリバースエンジニアリングバイナリ解析などに関する問題を解きながらハッカーとしてのスキルを向上することができます悪意を持ったハッカーがどのように攻撃してくるかについての知識がなければソフトウェアの安全と安心を保つことはできません現代はあらゆるソフトウェア開発者にハッカーとしてのスキル習得が必要になっているのですぜひあなたも一度コグニティブ CTF でハッカーとしての腕前を試して楽しくスキルアップしてみませんか QR コードを読み取ってぜひ参加登録をお願いしますどなたでも無料でお楽しみいただけます。インターネットの発展は私たちの生活を便利に豊かに変えました。今では水やガス、電気と同じくらい生活に欠かせない重要なインフラです。会社や学校、病院、銀行や工場。ありとあらゆる場所とシステムがインターネットにつながっていますそんなインターネットがサイバー攻撃の脅威にさらされているなんてあってはならないと私たちは考えます私たちはサイバー攻撃で使われる脆弱性や攻撃手法を日々研究していますその結果なんと直近1年間で約30件のゼロデイの脆弱性を発見しました私たちは悪意あるハッカーが攻撃するよりもずっと前にお客様のシステムのセキュリティホールを見つけてご報告します私たちはこれまで先進的なセキュリティ技術を研究し知識を共有してきました私たちはこれからも企業とシステムを利用する全ての人をサイバー攻撃から守ります目に見えない脅威から暮らしを守る日本を守る全ての人に安心と安全なインターネット HRD グループは科学的なアプローチで人事や組織の改革を強力に支援しています今多くの企業がデジタルトランスフォーメーションに取り組んでいるのではないでしょうかデジタルテクノロジーを活用することにより営業やマーケティングの見直し業務プロセスの自動化がさまざまな企業で実現されていますでは人材や組織に関してはどうでしょう一人一人の才能や個性に合わせた適材適所の実現や効果的なコミュニケーションの実践はデジタル化とは無縁の勘と経験に頼っているのが現状ではないでしょうかこのような勘と経験に頼ってきた人事や組織の課題もデータにより解決する時代になってきています私たちの提供するディスクとプロファイル XT は科学的検証に裏打ちされた人材測定ツールです一人一人のモチベーションの源泉やそのポテンシャルを見出すことで組織や人材の課題を解決します全世界でこれまでに6000万人、10万社日本でもこれまで120万人以上の顧客が効果を実感しているソリューションですこれからのデジタル時代の企業における改革の本質は人と組織のトランスフォーメーションにあると私たちは考えています HRD グループのディスクとプロファイル XD が組織や人材の改革を可能にします効果的なコミュニケーションによる組織力向上に興味のある方はディスクで社内の適材適所の実現や人材のポテンシャルを見出すことに興味のある方はプロファイル XD で検索してぜひ一度ホームページからお問い合わせくださいデブセックオプスデイズ東京はデブセックオプスを推進するためのコミュニティ活動に賛同してくださる多くの企業・団体から支援を受けていますプラチナスポンサー NTT データブレインパッドコグニティブリサーチラボ
ゴールドスポンサー NRI セキュアテクノロジーズ GMO サイバーセキュリティバイイエラエシルバースポンサー HRD プロファイルズスタートアップスポンサーロバストインテリジェンスリチェルカセキュリティ公演アメリカ大使館経済産業省総務省文部科学省デジタル庁サイバーセキュリティ戦略本部カーネギーメロン大学ソフトウェアエンジニアリングインスティテュートカーネギーメロン大学サイラボコグニティブ CTF「世界から届いた食材が彩るディナーテーブル」「約束の場所に時間通り安全に到着する交通機関」「どこでも安心して受けられる」医療や薬遠く離れて暮らす家族に贈る誕生日のプレゼントその日常は人や物をつなぐ仕組みで支えられているお客様と社会とそして世界中に広がる仲間と共に新しい仕組みを作りつないできた。世界は常に変化を続け時には想像もしなかった困難を私たちに突きつける必要なのは何ができるかではなく何をすべきか社会があるべき姿とは何か次の世代にも続く本当に豊かな暮らしとは何かそれを見つめ私たちは行動する。NTT データ。ビッグデータや AI 技術が脚光を浴びるデータの時代がやってきた。巨大企業もベンチャー企業もデータを大きな経営資源と捉えビジネスに取り入れようとしています。15年以上前からデータ活用の可能性をまっすぐに信じてきた私たち今こそ一緒にデジタルトランスフォーメーションで開けるドアがたくさんあると思うのです持続可能な未来につながる扉成長し続けるできること広がるデータ分析の民主化最適な意思決定挑戦できる未来ささやかな幸せにあふれた日常あの成長ですときめく顧客体験を磨き続ける世界<笑>豊かな社会意味のある仕事を作る誰もがビジョンにチャレンジできる誰も想像できない大きな成功イントゥリアンの目からウルコの瞬間を提供する製造の矛盾化子供たちの未来データかけるワクワクイコール未来できたらいいなを形に仲間の笑顔が未来の笑顔を作る未来は作るものだというふうに考えているので、仕事を通じて新しい価値をですね想像すればですね、日本がまだまだですね成長できる面白い機会を作ることができると思っているので、えー、かなり広範囲のビジネスをですね僕らはご支援できるんじゃないかなというふうに思っています医師が世界を守る
はい。では、えー、午後のセッション。Hello, good We would like to begin the afternoon session. The first speaker is from NTT Data. Mr. Semiya san is here with us today.、Uh, in the morning, we heard about the S bomb、uh, concept and、uh, so forth. But specifically, what is he doing at NTT Data?、Uh, Semiya san is going to talk about that. Good afternoon, Semiya san. Hello,、uh, Miyahara san. Thank you very much for being with us today. So, please start your presentation. Well, there was some,、uh, we, we are behind the time, but now we just caught up. Now, let me screen share. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Now, I'd like to begin my presentation on what is、uh, S BOM、uh, integrated management from a sales perspective. And、uh, from uh, sales uh, entity data sales、uh, engineering, my name is Semia. Here's the summary. These days, Apache、uh, Log4 Shell、uh, and other zero day vulnerabilities are increasing, and the supply chain risk is increasing these days. And if you look at Japan and overseas, supply chain security risk reduction efforts are being made and it's accelerating since 2021. So today's theme is uh, uh, S BOM,、uh, one of them. And uh, uh, NTT Data is promoting these activities today. So in my presentation, I'd like to talk about the present and the future challenges of NTT Data with S BOM. Here's the outline、uh, summary of the presentation. This is the flow of my presentation today. First、uh, is the、uh, background.、Uh, I'd like to introduce NTT Data as a company. It is located in Toyosu, Tokyo, and overseas we have various operating entities, including system integration business, network system business, and other businesses. And at the bottom, you see the illustration of our customers' segments, starting with、uh, government offices, local governments, finance, banking, public sector, finance sector, and uh, uh, enterprises.、Uh, we have various different customers. The theme of today is S BOM. Well, Shreen san's、uh, speech was, and also Hassan san yesterday talked about this. So let me briefly touch upon this. Is, what is the S bomb? It is uh, uh, defined as a list of、uh, components and their relationship and associated information. It is software bill of materials. So that's the、uh, definition of、uh, NTR. So here's the image diagram. Of S bomb. When we think about an app,、uh, so constituting buffers, browsers, and various different parts,、uh, their interdependencies are being visualized on the S bomb. That's the idea. In terms of the、uh, machine, well, in terms of the machine readability, We have these diagrams, but、uh, as you saw in s h r i n s a n s presentation, there are different uh, uh, formats, Cycling DX and SPDX. And the formats、uh, are very diverse Excel,、uh, Excel, JSON, and other formats available here. It's like the ingredients of a confectionery. You see the supplier name, component names. And、uh, various important information is clearly seen on S bomb. So, why is S bomb、uh, uh, gaining so much attention these days? Just briefly, I'd like to use three slides to explain that. First,、uh, in terms of the number of、uh, vulnerability reports,、uh, based on the National Vulnerability Database report,、uh, I've made this chart、uh, since 2020. 2002 to 2021, the number of reports I have counted, and like this,、uh, this is a trend. Every year it is increasing. And as of 2021, the number of、uh, reports were 21,957. This is per year. So、uh, divided by 365 days is、uh, about 60 reports of vulnerabilities per day. So those vulnerabilities. Uh, is it uh, abused?、Uh, some of the attackers of supply chains. This is the Smart Epson 2021 report、uh, excerpt. 
in 2021, if you look at the column, uh, compared with the previous year, there was an increase of 650%. So this is an increase in the number of supply chain attacks. And globally, supply chain attacks are increasing. And the IPA report says uh, this year's uh, ten uh, big 10 threats say that the supply chain uh, exploitation attacks are uh, ranked number three this year. So supply chain, the number is increasing, then uh, what can we do is the question. As I touched upon, uh, we can focus on SBOM here in this sense. Uh, like the file that I showed to you, there is a portability once you make something, and then to the next person, you can pass it on like a baton. So for the whole supply chain, the components of software and the system components, uh, these can be shared between different parties of the supply chain and you can pass it on to the next part pl player in the supply chain. And the purchasers for this system, where is it coming from uh, for the purchaser? There's a hamburger illustration here so that you can understand. So these are uh, the uh, parts. Traceability, is that uh, uh, available? So SBOM provides traceability all the way back to the raw components as well. So these are the related trends uh, in Japan and overseas. Uh, first, to look at the overseas, uh, it was touched upon earlier. First, on the US and the EU trends, because of the increase in the number of supply chain attacks, in uh, May 2021, there was a uh, presidential order issued in the United States. This is for the guidelines for enhancing supply chain security. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, guideline touched upon SBOM. And from May 2021 to December 2022, NISTO and uh, CISA and various other organizations are issuing those guidelines one after another. So if you look at the EU, uh, they have just come up with a Cyber Resilience Act. And this was a bill in September presented. So the movement toward uh, SBOM is uh, accelerating these days. How about uh, uh, the trend in Japan? The related trends include the, uh, the law for promotion of economic security on May the 18th uh, this year, this uh, has been enacted, and it consists of various pillars. One of them is the uh, previous uh, pre-review of uh, uh, core infrastructure in order to uh, counter cyber attacks. Uh, the government is uh, pre-screening uh, key components and the infrastructure, including power and gas sector and uh, water sector. For those that uh, lifeline public uh, infrastructure will be first screened by the government. And after this pre-screening, the system components and the software components, uh, what are they uh, to be looked at? Like SBOM, um, uh, the government needs those uh, lists. So the government may or may not use the SBOM for these purposes. That's what people are paying attention to. And also this year in June, 2022, uh, NISC is also cyber security, uh, issuing Cybersecurity 2022. And uh, if you look at the next uh, uh, generation cybersecurity, SBOM uh, insight is uh, focused and uh, government is trying to put together the insights so in Japan as well, the usage of SBOM is likely to be widespread going forward. So looking at this in entity data, what are we trying to do with SBOM? In our company as well, we are trying to promote use of SBOM. First, uh, internally, we are going to use the SBOM in order to increase the efficiency in responding to vulnerabilities. And outside of the company, towards the customers, in order to secure the transparency of system components, we are going to use SBOM when we provide services and deliver the systems to the customers. We are trying to deliver SBOM together with these products. So, so far, I've talked about the uh, background. Next, I'd like to talk about the issues and uh, uh, in terms of the uh, challenges towards the goals. In terms of the increased efficiency of uh, responding to uh, vulnerabilities, just the other day, uh, Hassan San's hands on session talked about the software composition analysis, uh, SCA. 
and uh, using these two uh, the software components including applications can be visualized just easily having said that for each individual projects sca tool to be used and to make uh, the parts components lists if you think about that uh, the technology like this uh, is very diverse even internally java and other languages and uh, technologies are used by different groups of the company so uh, to incorporate the sca tools for, right for each technology and then uh, the problem is that uh, if you do the scanning and then the results are referring to different component uh, different databases so depending on the sca tool the reference data is different so in one component or a project they may decide that uh, for the this type of vulnerability it's not so important we don't have to respond but uh, in the end uh, as a company this may be an important uh, vulnerability for the entire company therefore uh, so in terms of the database to refer to that is different from tool to tool if you look at the different scas Therefore, we have to uh, compare uh, the uh, database with the uh, analysis results so that we can make sure that we are consistent. And uh, in order to deliver SBOM to customers, uh, as we use more and more SBOMs, customers may require uh, the SBOMs together with the delivery of the system from us. That is uh, very possible in the future, but depending on the customers, uh, the how they use uh, and uh, manage s bombs may be different they may use different tools for the s bombs therefore uh, because of the uh, difference in the tools the sca tool for each uh, development project if we are to adopt uh, uh, a different sca tool for each project uh, there is a question question of consistency again as well as the depth of uh, granularity so it's easy to using sca it's easy to optimize for each individual project but uh, it's difficult to uh, do so uh, harmonize through the company then so what will be the solutions to uh, these problems at that moment, at NTT Data, there is uh, SBOM uh, integrated management is what we are looking at. As you can see on this diagram, uh, the company-wide common repository function SBOM uh, integration uh, management system is what we are trying to establish. From number one to number four, uh, these are use, possible uses for each project. Well, they have different S-bombs, uh, their own S-bombs or the equipment vendors uh, S-bombs and uh, uh, so in-house or external S-bombs, they deal with different types of S-bombs. So once they upload those and then uh, they revise uh, from time to time when the configuration change. And then if there is a revise and then the notice has to be given. And so when the customer want us to issue this, we have to be able to handle the risk request and issue an SBOM in the right format the customer wants. But in this way, uh, as shown uh, as in this diagram, we like to manage all these things. So from this integrated management, uh, what is the benefit? First of all, to respond to vulnerability, uh, we can increase the efficiency. That is the first benefit. Uh, before or at the present, SBOM management system does not exist. So the situation like this, if there is a new vulnerability emerging to which we have to respond, and then the all the relevant projects have to be notified at the same time. So in your project, uh, do you have any relevance with this and so forth so one by one you have to check with each project team and then in each project team uh, they have to investigate and, uh, and they have different ledgers and uh, uh, bo uh, books managing uh, their projects so they have to check one by one so it takes time and uh, uh, efforts but with the integrated uh, management system for SBOM, so even though there are differences between different individual systems, we can visualize those differences as well in terms of the configuration and so forth. And then if there is uh, any emergency, uh, the um, critical uh, vulnerability, we can check all at once. So with a small team of people, we can 
uh, check which projects will be affected by those vulnerabilities and so forth. Starting from uh, this year, in NTT data with the R&D uh, efforts, some project that which has already implemented SCS tool for SBOM, per project, um, it is about uh, 1.5 hours to be reduced. And if it were 100 project, then we will be able to reduce by 150 hours when it comes to the uh, detecting a new vulnerabilities emergence. It's not just the improvement of efficiency in a vulnerability response. However, it could uh, be reducing the human reduced errors, or it could be a reduced as to the uh, number of um, hours to leave uh, vulnerabilities or neglect that. The second point, uh, what is the um, effect uh, brought to the SBOM in, by the SBOM integrated the management for the system configuration? For each SCA tool, where it is an output um, to each um, output uh, S bomb, and in some cases we utilize such uh, S bomb. S bomb that is output uh, from SCA. There are different uh, technological documentation at the level of the description. There are some differences uh, as to the extent uh, uh, in depth. Therefore, in this uh, SBOM uh, integrated system, it could be checked whether or not there is any lacking items in place or what is the license uh, status um, of a company uh, could be uh, so described from our own organizational perspective. We'll be able to manage for each customer uh, that is uh, well, actually that is tailored to each customer in order to secure the qu quality um, through uh, this SBOM uh, integrated the management approach. So far, I discussed over the um, effects and positive impact that NTG data thinks. Now, as to the system for SBOM integrated uh, system, in order to realize this system, we are now running POC. So uh, create, uh, collect, and use. Uh, these are the three perceptions that we use while we in manage from integrated uh, perspective. What is uh, asked for? So it is the uh, as is and to be where we are now extracting some gaps. When it comes to the usage part, uh, in uh, accommodating CSAT activities, uh, we'd like to uh, check over the current status and uh, based on the customer's requirement, we'll be able to provide SBOM as you find under the checkbox there are different uh, challenges that we need to solve for example when it comes to the creation of SBOM, the hierarchy and layers of SBOM, um, to what extent we should uh, create is a question as to the ap application such as a library uh, we will be able to uh, extract with the SCA however from the uh, system perspective uh, from overall system perspective what information needs to be extracted that is still in question. When it comes to import, that is the collection. How to import the SBOM to manage in an integrated manner is something we are verifying at the moment. In order to realize this integrated management, in addition to that, we are promoting the usage of SBOM at each project. While we are developing when and how SBOM should be generated and used, uh, it's something that we are working on at the moment. When you look into this um, illustration, um, starting from the planning, so we uh, create um, what policy uh, should be in place uh, to utilize for SBOM project. And the other one is the best practice for the internal usage which uh, we are working on at the moment, not just limited to um, here internally, but uh, outside in order to uh, mitigate the uh, supply chain security risk as a whole, we are working on the other day uh, at the NTT holding company, they made some press release. That is the uh, security transparency, sec secure security uh, technology. And we have already established this. 
this is comprised with those uh, things uh, as to this uh, securing uh, technology. One is uh, to uh, make it into a uh, visualize as to the uh, software configuration, such as the equipment and system, and working over the system analysis at the moment with these uh, technologies from supply chain overall perspective, uh, we would like to expand in first half of 2023, we are going to establish open consortium, different uh, vendors uh, of uh, equi equipment, equipment, system integrators and um, users uh, of the equipment systems uh, will uh, be able to cooperate. And we are one of the uh, members to work over or to, to participate in security transparency consortium in order to raise in order to respond to the security incidents and issues. Now moving forward, we need to expand further as to the usage of SBOM from domestic R&D perspective. We are trying to create the integrated system for SBOM. To that end, we are working together with different uh, vendors, not just um, here in Japan. We do have a different locations uh, on the globe, therefore, we are wondering, uh, we are working over how, what is the best way to re reduce as bomb. And uh, it was mentioned that uh, there is a promotion act uh, of economic security, starting from the uh, origination of the delivery, uh, where we think uh, the services will be provided there. So we hope that the uh, delivery is available with the SBOM information. Once uh, we accumulate the uh, different uh, in knowledge, in not just uh, providing SBOM information, but uh, we will provide proper management uh, services uh, in terms of how SBOM could be reused. So these are uh, the steps that we would like to follow. Now conclusion and uh, wrap up. I'm, uh, it is repetitive, but um, at home and abroad, in order to work over the reduction of supply chain risk we're working on. One is the um, vulnerability in efficiency improvement, and the other one to deliver s bond to customers in more efficient manner. It, it is uh, not enough if just uh, one uh, company is working on, therefore we have to uh, cover all uh, supply chain network and while we are uh, giving input and output, uh, hopefully that uh, we'll be able to realize uh, our vision. And this is what um, it shows on this slide. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. I would like to, res um, res well, we've already had some questions from audience too. In reality, per project, uh, maybe 1.5 hours that uh, you said there is a uh, affecting reduction when it comes to entity data, SBOM or SCA tools um, implementation status, because you said it is a step one. So what is the current status of that? Thank you for your question. At our company, in a good, uh, with the SCA tool, we have a uh, initiative called ELA live up so it is the uh, pilot of the security testing under that framework SCA tool, tool has already been implemented uh, company-wide so illustration tool uh, we uh, developed the live applications um, that tool is mandatory for usage under this SCA tool uh, is used uh, together. Understood. Thank, thank you very much. Well, the screen has changed. Well, I wanted to share this uh, slide. This is how you see. Now we have a case study. I'm working over the illustration. So I just wanted to share this information and hopefully that uh, you'll be able to visit uh, this site. Do you have any link? Uh, if you were to share with us the link, I'm going to share all the uh, audiences uh, in YouTube. The second question, the question was raised uh, this morning too, as to the uh, open source based um, 
uh, SBOM uh, system is available, but uh, including such a system for integrated management, what is your uh, sense of how you could do that? So let me uh, share with you some uh, question raised in the in the morning. So SBOM is getting monetary and embedding industry. Open source based SES solutions are available. However, C or C++ language wise, we can only utilize the commercially available product. From that point of view, the open source based and commercial based product, how um, should we use in a separate manner? And including that, how are you going to work over the integrated management? From that point of view, thank you for your question. To start with, let me answer to the first question. As to the integrated management of SBOM, what is extracted as SBOM, and there is no OSS to import. An OASP dependency practice where we would like to work over the verification. Do, do you see the screen? Uh, yes, yes. We import and to look into what sort of the vulnerabilities are uh, detected. This shows the integrations on the left-hand side. We do have uh, this kind of OSS tool. However, the format uh, that is uh, only uh, that is accommodative is only Cyclone DX or NVG. Uh, and we are looking into different um, uh, things. If we were to check from the company-wide basis, uh, we will be able to implement uh, um, at each development um, stage or level. But from the company-wide uh, governance perspective, I do believe that this is not enough. So separate from this, we are working together with different vendors to uh, create a mechanism for SBOM integrated management. When it comes to the second question, that is the embedded industry. Well, uh, we also got some uh, questions uh, in YouTube. SES solutions uh, have not um, supporting the embedded uh, type of the product yet. Now, with respect to the embedded area, we do have a, a less number or limited number of SES solutions. Uh, there are different types uh, available, however. What could be used for SBOM, uh, should be used for SBOM is under intensive discussion. And also something could be emerging from the open source as to the expansion of the technology, technological capability, or um, if, we, uh, if we, we think of the easiness of enhancement, then we are focusing on the uh, commercial product uh, that is available in order to create a mechanism. That is the current situation. Understood. Thank you very much. Now we have some other comments. So let me um, ask this question. Apologies for that. What other questions? When it comes to entity data, you use GitLab. But uh, as for the SBON system that you introduced, it is different from the GitLab that you uh, mentioned before. As for the GitLab, what well, included that we're working on for a consideration moving forward. It is uh, that includes the repository part. In the world, uh, people are starting to say that SBOM is uh, very important, and also the uh, configuration has started. So uh, at the end of the day, I do believe that there will be emerging needs that it should be managed uh, from the integrated uh, manner. So I do believe that this is the uh, demand emerging. So once SBOM is spread, what is the, uh, tar the first target that we should achieve? As to the SBOM integration tool, I do believe that the security per se is getting more important. I do believe that that is going to start shortly. What do you think? I'm sure that that sort of the challenge is going to emerge in the future. So at the various occasions, including this community, we would like to share as information as well as the knowledge, and we'd like to deliver that message in order to further deepen our discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, one more thing, one more point, point. I think we have some time available still. 
NTIA s b o m a definition, according to this, it's not just the OSS, but the commercial component uh, should be included into s b o m integrated management. That's how I interpret However, given the SCA solution, it is uh, mostly uh, open source. Uh, that is the main, uh, not uh, the commercial one. That's, I think, at NTT. According to the um, SBOM uh, management uh, at the moment, uh, do you think that uh, the commercial component should be included into SBOM? And if tool is not available to address that, uh, what are you going to do? Uh, that is a very uh, sharp question. So including that, we are working on a study. Well, definition-wise, that is true. However, at the various companies, how it should be built is still under discussion. Therefore, we will have a, a communication uh, with different uh, companies in order, in order to find the most optimal uh, product uh, correct uh, at the um, DevSecOps, uh, this is something that we are working on and uh, looking at the reaction of the market uh, to change. I do believe that that is a trend that we expect. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Semia. Oh, maybe any advertisement, <laughs> like uh, download the link, uh, the link that to download if you were to share with us, that would be appreciated. And any any last word? Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me this uh, valuable opportunity for presentation. Uh, at uh, various occasions, hopefully that uh, we'll, be, we'll be able to share our initiatives. Thank you very much. But NTT Data, uh, you have been sponsoring us, and also with the simultaneous interpretation, uh, it's uh, NTT Data's um, uh, owing to NTT Data, where well, you can do that. And would you please, uh, same, we would like to uh, give the uh, applaud. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next presenter, uh, the, the speaker from the Richeluka Security, uh, we have the uh, speaker from the company for three consecutive yes. years. Do we have Koike-san? Yes. Do you see myself? Yes, yes, we see you. So let me introduce Mr. Koike. So he went to uh, another junior high school and back then he was already uh, participated at ctf and he and he was a finalist of defcon and the former cio of the uh, dod uh, dr linton wells uh, he talked about how important it is to develop the, the people uh, for the the defend defense and uh and he also said that he goes to uh, DEFCON in Las Vegas every year. He highlighted how important it is to nurture the talent. Okay, uh, he said that. So I think the topics are relevant with what you are going to talk about. So today he's going to talk about ultimate shift left and then hackers mindset that we can learn from DEFCON CTF finalist. Can I share my screen? Yes. Yes, now we see your screen. Thank you. Let me start my presentation. So thank you for your introduction. But uh, before I start my presentation, I would like to talk about a little bit of myself so that my presentation will be more convincing. I joined uh, Richeruka Security in 2020. Uh, my position is the uh, chief researcher. Uh, my name is Koike. So even though my position is the researcher, I would like to talk about what we do in a company. Actually, I do a number of things, uh, regardless of the uh, commercial researches, uh, academic research. research uh, we, I do that. And also, I develop the uh, security tool and in some cases, I do the vulnerability assessment of other companies. So this is part of my job as well. As it was included in the introduction, and there's a uh, the competition called CTF. I have been participating in CTF for uh, 10 years. Maybe those who do not about CTF, 
you are not familiar with this, but uh, there's a competition called DEFCON CTF. And uh, we can say this is kind of the uh, one of the uh, the biggest the CTF competition. And uh, I was the uh, the youngest uh, person to make it to the final. So I was there uh, when uh, I believe uh, Dr. Linton Wells was there. Uh, today, uh, the event is focused on DevSecOps. So I would like to talk about the development uh, vulnerabilities, and also I would like to talk about my experience around CTF. So when we hear shift left, so I want to ask you, are you familiar with this word? Uh, maybe uh, this word has been already heard a uh, couple of times today. So this is the, uh, the shift to left in the context of security. So uh, put simply, we have to act uh, earlier than later. So if we act later and the cost will be larger, so the measures against security, it starts with the uh, uh, planning and development of the service. So we want to uh, work and act earlier so that the cost uh, will be smaller. So I did some research to, to, to talk about this. So there was a survey conducted by uh, Google, and this is the uh, the result of the survey. And this is this graph is the result of the uh, survey. So it shows that how different the cost will be, but uh, it does not really talk about the absolute amount and exactly how much cost um, will be required. It is kind of regrettable that we don't see that. But the one example was in a blog. So GDPR of uh, EU. So GDPR uh, was uh, enforced uh, uh, years ago. So personal information is very important for GDPR. So if the personal information is leaked, and there will be a penalty. So that is uh, stipulated in a regulation. When there's a significant information leakage, uh, 2 billion to 3 billion uh, fines uh, will be imposed. So if you don't do anything about the security, and if there are vulnerability that could uh, leak the, uh, the personal information, and there will be a consequences, uh, which is the penalty or fines that I talked about. So about security, you want to take measures uh, earlier than later. So if you do it, uh, you want to um, shift left as earlier as pos as early as possible. And you may be asking how we can do that. And when you make an ultimate shift left, what will be the ultimate state of shift left? And this is uh, my personal uh, opinion. But uh, first thing you want to think about is this. So in a high level, there are five phases of development. And these five phases are shown here. So we want to think about how far we can make a shift left. So what is important is the four phases on the left are the responsibility of developers. So developers have to think about uh, these four phases. And you may have a different opinions. Well, definition uh, requirement or the designing, maybe it may not have to be the developer. Those who are programmers may have responsibilities. You may say that, uh, but uh, uh, I want to still uh, call them developer in a broader term. So, so we can say uh, these four uh, processes are the responsibilities of developers. So when we think about ultimate shift left, what would it look like? So the ultimate shift left is that you want to make action as early as possible. So if there's no vulnerabilities, it means that you're successful uh, making action at the earliest timing. In order to avoid vulnerabilities in the first place, so, so the left processes are the responsibilities of the developers. So if the developers uh, can address the security, um, 
don't make any vulnerabilities and even if there are some vulnerabilities it can be addressed so, so it means that uh, you are, are making uh, the shift to left in this in this page so you may think that so what, what i'm saying is that the developers should learn security and then question is how how can developers learn security and this is my recommendation i you may be thinking that this is the the position uh, the talk so this is ctf in short but that stands for capture the flag so i think a uh, ctf has been mentioned several times today but this is kind of the uh, hacking event uh it tests the, the deep knowledge about computers and uh, techniques of hacking. To be more specific, so there are multiple problems and questions, and you want to solve them. And when you make a correct, make it correct, you get a point, and you want to earn as many points as possible. So the uh, typical questions. So organizers intentionally develop the service with vulnerabilities and participants can access the service and then the the, con the, the participants uh, find vulnerabilities and attack them and if you are successful with the the attack and you get the points and there are other types of the the the, the questions so it's not only limited to attacks for instance, there's an image file, and you are asked to identify the location. Where was this pic the picture taken? And if you are successful, uh, you will get the points. So that is one, just one example. So there are uh, many types of the questions, but uh, uh, in a nutshell, you can really learn about the uh, knowledge about hacking. So what is good about doing CTF? So as you may be aware, uh, you will, you will uh, learn how the computers are working and you will have a lot of knowledge about security. The next point is very important. So the, basically, uh, you, you join uh, CTF through browser so anyone can join online and uh, uh, basically it is, it is free, free of charge to, to participate. And I think uh, other participants uh, uh, will say the same thing. But uh, when you are really into uh, hacking, it's similar with the puzzle. A CTF is the uh, kind of event competition. You compete against other teams. And you look at other teams. And if other teams are working on certain question, and you want to work on that. So it is kind of um, entertainment perspective so uh you want to you can do it to to enjoy that so it is important that you enjoy studying and this is kind of the uh the the secondary benefit but uh, if you do good uh, you will get it depends on events you may earn like a couple of millions of yen and there's a qualification round and then in the final round, in a final match, you will go to the conference room or uh, the ballroom of the hotel. So if you are the finalist, all the, uh, the travel cost is paid by the organizers. So uh, you can uh, go to uh, other countries and the, and the cost is covered by the organizers. So I hope that uh, you think they are interesting so i have been uh, participating in ctf and i heard i hear some criticism about ctf and some people say you are just playing with it it's just a uh, uh, entertainment and how beneficial uh, would it be so there are some people who say something like this but uh, based on my ex experience so so if you want to study uh, ctf will just do the job so if you do the ctf and uh, you'll be fine 
So I work in a, a retail car security. I do assessment of the vulnerabilities. In a more specific terms, I work on penetration test. So I I do some work, but uh, my work I. Uh, I just require knowledge I learned through CTF. I did not encounter any troubles. So from my experience, a CTF is just enough. So it's fun and also uh, you can learn things. So I think that's great about CTF. So you may think uh, I'm saying these nice things uh, because I'm in this position but uh, I want to sound more convincing. So in order to do that, I would like to uh, really uh, talk about the vulnerabilities uh, that I found, and I would like to uh, explain this. So these vulnerabilities, so there's a reason why I focus on these two things. So when you have certain experience in CTF, anyone can find this kind of vulnerabilities. And also, so these vulnerabilities uh, will be uh, the, the good uh, CTF question. So uh, it will really make sense. So these vulnerabilities uh, will be uh, one of the questions for the CTF. So. So I hope uh, you will understand that uh, these kind of the response, the vulnerabilities uh, will be the one uh, you can really learn about. But uh, there are some uh, caveat. So some of them will have a specific names of the service, service with the vulnerabilities, and the 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 developers who have the vulnerabilities, and we don't want you to criticize those services or developers who develop the services. So whoever the engineers engineers are, any engineers can make the uh, the, the failures or vulnerabilities. Google, Microsoft, those uh, big companies, they have uh, great engineers, but still, even though they have uh, a lot of uh, good engineers, they still find and generate certain vulnerabilities. That, that is the reason why I think it is a normal state. And if you would like to try to identify the vulnerabilities in Google or wherever, everywhere, you will be able to identify those uh, newly found uh, bugs. And uh, another thing is that once you identify the vulnerability, and now uh, and, uh, you uh, you are trying to find uh, the uh, responsibility party uh, to those individuals, but their vulnerability is not always induced uh, by the uh, skill set of individuals. That's what I think. The reason why is that uh, if it is the robust development, then yes, we have one engineer, or, uh, but usually we are developing together as a team and uh, someone's action is being tested or some is being reviewed by somebody. So the uh, multiple parties are involved in the uh, development process. So as of then, if you ever come up with the vulnerability, I think and uh, uh, probably the uh, the uh, developer uh, him, him, himself uh, or he has never identified it, and but the all the surrounding people have never noticed it. So I think that it is not the blaming against somebody else, and then this is somebody's mistake or something. That is not the case. I think the uh, we need to look at the overall organizational structure which oversighted the uh, issue. So I think we need to have a uh, such a, uh, a microscopic point of view. And the lastly, I think although it might be the uh, again the norm, but it is very important and uh, not limited to the vulnerability, but in case of the uh, vehicle accidents or any other ac accidents or mistakes, we need to assume that, that there will be the mistakes and we need to come up with the kind of measure. That is, the, uh, it, that is important. And, and then just blaming somebody is not the right attitude, I guess. And another thing we need to consider is, again, this is a norm, I guess, but uh, getting the information uh, from here 
Okay, then uh, I can make it try, and then that sort of, yeah, you will be caught and arrested, so you shouldn't utilize it in, in the uh, vicious intent. Uh, uh, if you ever come up with the vulnerability, which I am going to introduce from now, and if you ever, uh, by coincidence, can't identify uh, those vulnerability, you might as well call uh, the IPA or the original developer, and then you are supposed to report back to them. Okay, then that is my prelude, and let me go into the details from now. And the first is, you can see there's a name, and uh, that is the align client vulnerability. And uh, the why I'm able to disclose it is that and I used to work as an intern inside line, and then I found it, and I picked up in my blog, and that was disclosed by line as well. So basically, I am allowed to talk about this vulnerability. And uh, the uh, what it was is as follows: a line client uh, has got the functionality to send the images to 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 show the. Uh, images so always uh, there's a, a processing code uh, to uh, handle the images uh, which uh, actually had the uh, vulnerability and uh, what could be done by this uh, more coding i think maybe the uh, falsified image could be uh, sent by the attacker to somebody else and uh, and in that case maybe the art uh, somebody's arbitration it could be executed the code could be executed it means that anything could be done via that code so so whatever the programs are then it seems as if that particular person who uh, who is sending the image will be able to overtake the and the root cause behind this the vulnerability was just one line you can see this red highlighted area is the code and what's done in this entire square in the green is that the height of the image and as a width of the image uh, they are captured as information and the uh, width by height or height by width and that uh, space is calculated and what kind of uh, memory is needed for in order to process that space and that uh, is uh, being coded here and the uh, issue is this multiple uh, multiplication and the problem about this is that you can see the overflow is go uh, is occurring here you, because uh, you have never done the programming before in your life but in most of the uh, cases in the programming you see the you may have some var uh, variables in the memory and that you have got the size of the memory that can keep the memory. And usually there's the uh, limit in under the 32-bit C++ programming language. In that case, and you can see 641 multiplied by 6700417 will end up with one, right? And uh, it is completely wrong. Uh, because the, you are multiplying the number, but the end result is uh, smaller than the uh, original e integral, right? And so in that case, if you need the one byte as a memory, and then in to just to secure the uh, one byte to send the image, then the, in, if that is the case, then the, the other memories for other uses uh, um, must be uh, secured, but the, unfortunately, the memory is going to be busted. And uh, how we could avoid this vulnerability not to be built into the original code. And uh, for the code uh, like C++, I think integral overflow is normal and it is very common. And uh, it then tends to code uh, with this integral vulnerability and an overflow. So uh, you have to keep it in mind and, and be cautious of it. If you know this, 
uh, maybe the uh, you really don't uh, they usually don't write the code uh, of the multiplication usually uh, they would just uh, co code the end result only so there will be no raw uh, multiplication formula so in this case maybe the coder might not be um, intelligent enough uh, not to know that, but probably the uh, similar processing uh, might have been done inside a line product. And uh, I guess probably the uh, somebody else uh, uh, wrote the code and probably it was uh, copied and pasted from the past and then that was not checked. And there is a reason why I think probably this uh, vulnerability occurred. The uh, copied code, um, my, you never believe that the uh, copied code would include the vulnerability, so it must be very difficult to have the uh, countermeasure. But if I am a level developer and if I am copying something and pasting, and then, then I would see the red flag in my mind. So if you are familiar with this, and then you might be able to be cautious. And the second one, the second example, I'm not able to quote the name uh, of the product, but the, I just want to explain uh, what it is. It is very hard to explain to the people who has never coded. And the, uh, but th this is a kind of universal vulnerability and uh, falsified uh, JSON object uh, could be sent as a request. And you can see the, uh, what's uh, going to happen if you can send the incorrect or falsified JSON and then how to be used. It's hard to say, but let's say I have coped with the city problem utilizing this vulnerability in that particular product, and the uh, we ended up with this uh, specific code vulnerability. And the uh, what it was as it it was the uh, service uh, wrote uh, with Java, and the very famous library Jackson uh, was converted into the uh, positive. The the JSON and in the class class instance, uh, there was the text member, and uh, there are normal sequence of the uh, language. And then if that is the case, the attack would be successful. That is a some assumption, but the developer notify now notices it, and uh, and in the constructor the uh, context invalid, and this kind of coefficient. Uh, uh, was used in order to identify the abnormal sequence of the language. And if it is included, it is eliminated. So the validation and checking has been done. So there should be no problem, but that might be your assumption, but there is a problem. And uh, and the, as a result, and you can see those uh, written JSON object uh, is, is requested. And if it is requested, uh, you are able to uh, pass the validation. What's happening is that the, uh, when the constructor instance, when the constructor is invited on the left hand side, you can see text A is the only one to be used. So if that is the case, and uh, just by convenience, the A uh, as a sequence is not abnormal, it is normal. So the uh, constructor uh, check is going to be just oversighted and, and, and the instruction is going to be sent. Then the next, the text column invalid. And how is this value to be processed? As a matter of fact, there's another no, annotation in this program. There are two annotations in this program. On the right hand side, you can say on the construct that side, JSON is to be processed. That's the one annotation. And the other annotation is you can see the setter coefficient A is to be uh, defined in a, in, as a tacit value. And by doing so, the member uh, will will be member constant is going to be set. So in, in the invalid uh, value uh, is to be set up from the set coefficient. Uh, so the uh, constructor is not going to be uh, invited. So as a result, the constructor is the only one which is validated in the processing. And therefore, if there is an invalid sequence of the values, then it's going to be counted as the invalid variables. And if I can just put it in a general 
uh, statement that there is the uh, input formation and uh, that's been not been uh, validated and uh, and it's very hard to validate so uh, if we what kind of measure we could avoid this kind of uh, malicious and uh, the uh, vulnerability and if let's say if you uh, receive um, many json objects what would it, you do and then you really can't cope with them intuitively but when i actually identified one of those and then and that was out of my intuition so just by coincidence i found that example but after the second incident as i said if you ever see this code you, you have the knowledge already so you are able to cope with it as a part of your knowledge, right? And that is more important. And also you need to come to familiar with the various kind of patterns as much as possible. As many patterns you're familiar with, uh, the, uh, you'll be having more vulnerabilities you'll be able to cope with. And you must be able to have the uh, gen generalized idea. And uh, then you'll be then you'll be able to have the uh, good intuition to cope with the situation. Another issue is that uh, the uh, way you use the library, it's not understood and then it was uh, not uh, appropriately used. Uh, that, that was one of the root causes. If there was no annotation, the uh, unnecessary setup coefficient was not set up. And also, if you read the documentation, the abnormal JSON object uh, could be rejected, and that was a part of the library. And also, security in a CTF, when you are engaged in a security or a CTF, you've been seeing the things you have never known. So that you and you are able to develop your capability to to read uh, all these documents at a glance so and then now i think and i'm very happy if you get if you get interested in the ctf and uh, those are the sites that you'll be able to join right away those are three sites where you are able to join especially as to the cognitive ctf so i am engaged in it and and now for today's devs of uh, sec I think probably it's a part of it, and I am confident to recommend this. As to the environmental uh, structure and architecture, and uh, we have got the beginner's text, uh, they are available, many of them in the marketplace, so you can refer to them as well. And uh, lastly, and uh, they, uh, you may sound me like uh, uh, position talking. But if the developer can do the CTF, and then probably the, you don't need the security experts, and the CTF uh, is the only one you need to learn. But that is not a statement I cannot endorse. Um, through the uh, long years of experiences, usually security experts have got a comprehensive knowledge. Uh, so we do need the security experts. Uh, but uh, just think about it, that those developers, and then, <clears throat> They are not okay not to think about the securities, but the uh, developers uh, to think about the security versus the securities expert to think about the security. Uh, these are not uh, the uh, one out of two uh, options. So I think both of them are needed. So that is all for my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Indeed, we've got a lot of charts. Now, I just would like to have one question to you. I think, uh, Koike-san, you identified that yeah. memory buffer overflow and the error check oversighting. And in this example, the static, the analysis tool, was it also passed by this? Yes. Yes. I am using statistics analysis tool, but I haven't uh, uh, run it so much. So that's my intuition. The first half, uh, if you run it, you, you could have identified it in this particular case. But the code base was vast. So either I had the time to run the program, I was not sure. And the latter, 
but a lot of, it might be very difficult because of the, the, it's about the Jackson use. So statistics analysis tool may not understand the Jackson tool use. And generally speaking, there is no. So if you look at the presentation here today, and and if you really would like to write down the code for that sort of tool, you could do it. But if you see the similar vulnerability, I don't think you'll be able to take the similar approach to resolve the issue. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, are we okay? Do you have any other question? I think it's human and the static analysis tool uh -huh, is producing a false positive, right? Uh, so, and they are coming with, up with the false errors. And we are not sure if they are really the errors or false errors. So in that sense, the uh, human uh, developer uh, should intervene somewhere. So the uh, vulnerability we identify, uh, just like the fast intelligence, uh, would have to create the uh, kind of statistic analysis tool. So I think the, uh, it's very important to have the uh, uh, genius hacker like you, and as many of them uh, would work and also uh, you see that the uh, uh, Dr. David Brownie uh, in the CTF mentioned that the uh, CTS would be able to develop uh, the ecosystem. If if you get the uh, high performance in this CTF, and, and if you are able to be uh, the researcher in the field, you'll be able to learn from the problem solving process and you'll be able to uh, develop the next generation talents. And then, so the, uh, Dr. Brownie mentioned that it is very easy to to uh, the de develop the uh, next generation hacker but, but the uh, he was struggling to fundraise uh, let's say and every year he needs 500,000 US dollars it's about 7 25 million yen so i think that that's the uh, issue faced by the cognitive, cognitive uh, security in the so thank you very much indeed that was very impressive so we'd like to move on to the next section thank you very much indeed for your presentation thank you now let's move on to the next session um, um Professor Fujisue, uh, he was a speaker last year as well and uh, he used to be a senior vice minister uh, for the IT um, initiatives. And uh, um, after that, uh, he went back to the University of Tokyo again as a professor. He's also a specially appointed professor of uh, India Institute of Technology, Hyderabad. Today, he just took the position. So I'm, I don't know how many uh, positions he can take, but uh, including his introduction, uh, I'd like to pass the baton to Mr. Uh, Professor Fujitsue. Uh, so the floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Fujitsue Kendo. I heard that uh, this is uh, 30 minutes, but is it okay to go over and uh, talk for uh, 20, uh, 40 minutes? Yes, that's acceptable. Okay, I would like to try. I prepared this material for the cyber resiliency. At the university, what is happening on this theme? That is something that I like to talk about. I'm sorry about that. As you can see, so cyber resiliency or security at Japanese universities, that's what I like to talk about today. Here's my uh, background. Back in 1964, so two tri Tokyo Olympics ago, I was born in uh, Kumamoto, and I graduated from Tokyo Institute of Technology in 1986. And then I uh, started working for the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry. And then uh, I dealt with supercomputer issue and other issues, including environment, and also semiconductor union, and so forth. But uh, mainly, I was in charge of computer uh, industry. Now, after that, I studied in the United States. And in 1999, I took PhD. After taking PhD, I went back to the University of Tokyo, talking about engineering management. And in 2004, 
and I became a, a parliamentary and at the House of Councillors. And up to uh, July this year, I was the uh, parliamentarian. And then I took the position of Senior Vice Minister for International Affairs and Communications. And uh, starting on October the 1st uh, this year, I became a visiting professor of the University of Tokyo for Web3 and cybersecurity. So the, uh, studying uh, those areas is my responsibility there. And uh, Indian Institute uh, in Hyderabad, I'm also a visiting professor because India is a very IT-centric country. So we like to promote a exchange with them. And so I'm also trying to become a fellow at Oxford University. In February, I'm going to go to the United States so that uh, I can take a position in the US faculty. So the one person, Quad, Japan, uh, US, UK, India, I try to complete all of these four countries just by myself. So that's the uh, side ambition that I have. For a PhD, I have a PhD in industry man management from Tokyo Institute of Technology and also international relations degree uh, I have from Waseda as well, that is PhD as well. So in that sense, uh, I'm like a politician, bureaucrat, academic, uh, mixed career. So now I'm working for the University of Tokyo. What is my mission there? Well, cybersecurity or well, cyber security uh, resilience is the um, uh, total uh, whole umbrella in which I would uh, do some work. And in Japan, cybersecurity is the term that we use, but in the US, they are using cyber resilience more. Because uh, security, when you say cybersecurity, it is about prevention or defense. But when we say cyber resilience, that system may go down, but uh, it's about the recovery. Even if there's an attack, the important thing is that we get back to normal or get back stronger. So that is uh, the concept of resiliency. We use uh, this word resiliency in Japanese uh, these days, but uh, in the cyber world, we can use this term. Another point, which is not so famous in Japan, is cyber power. As you are aware, this time, uh, the Ukraine war uh, is uh, now happening. It's not in the mass media in Japan so much, but uh, in 2014, the Crimea uh, invasion already happened. And at that time, Ukraine lost electricity, financial system, broadcasting system, all of them because of the cyber attack. So at that time, in the darkness, without the infrastructure, the Crimea uh, was uh, invaded by Russia. But this time, uh, there was no stoppage of infrastructure. So from that, you can see how uh, fast uh, Ukraine came back in terms of the infrastructure, cybersecurity. And also, SNS, you see lots of uh, fake information, fake news. So including this uh, um, management of information, cyber power is the concept about the nation, how resilient they can be in terms of uh, resisting those fake news and the other attacks on the cyber uh, world. So that's the concept. So we have to bring up the level of our discussions here in Japan as well. So these are the materials uh, mainly from uh, overseas. I use this word, uh, uh, Maginot line. But the marginal line is not so no, well known in Japan. But at the time of World War II, uh, French uh, created this uh, uh, complete defense against Germany, and uh, they thought ne never thought that it would be broken. But it was easily broken by German because uh, they were only focusing on defending themselves. So uh, that's why we have to be more resilient and shift to resilience concept. And, uh, also, I use this a picture of Miyamoto Musashi, uh, the famous uh, uh, word, Josai Senjo, always on the front line. So rather than security, cyber, cyber resilience.
いうようなまあマインドセットに変えていかなきゃいけないと。で、まあ、それは武士道に通じるんではないかということを言っております。ただまあ、先ほど申し上げましたように繰り返しですけど、サイバーパワーっていう言葉をこれからおそらく日本でも使わなきゃいけないんではないかと思ってまして、後でご説明しますけれど、そのサイバーパワー的なものの中心っていうのはどこかというと、おそらくエンジニアリングやそのインフォーメーションサイエンスのみならず、やはり法体系であり、あとはポリシー、行政をどうするかとかいうポリシーの問題であり、まあ、あとはアドバタイズメントみたいな心理学的な話、いろんなものが複合化されて、サイバーパーになるという意味では、やはり大学が中心となって、この日本の国家のために、まあ、新しいそういう研究分野を作らなきゃいけないんじゃないかというふうに思っております。まあ、それをちょっとやりたい、やろうとしています。で、これはの日本のサイバーセキュリティのポリシーの歴史っていうことなんですけれど、あんまり知られてませんけど、日本,これあの日本でサイバーセキュリティ関係のポリシー。サイバーセキュリティアクト。There is only one. Uh, that is the basic law.、Uh, so, based on the cybersecurity basic law, there is a NESC, NISC, NISC. It is a very long name, but、uh, we have NISC、uh, organization in Japan based on the cybersecurity basic law. And in 2010,、uh, NISC. Uh, this is the organization created by the Prime Minister's direction. And in 2014, in the cybersecurity basic law, NISC was positioned as part of that. So there is a cybersecurity headquarters. So、uh, that, that's why we have NISC today in Japan. So, how is it different? First of all, in 2010, well, this was created by the direction of the prime minister. So there is、uh, no legal binding power. But、uh, after that, in 2010, cybersecurity basic law was enacted. And then NISC was、uh, formally established、uh, by law. For example, the Ministry of Finance and the METI, those government ministries、uh, were created by the establishment law for each ministry. So there is a single law for each ministry. And then that stipulates、uh, the roles, roles and responsibilities of、uh, those ministries. But in the NISC,、uh, there is no、uh, NISC law. But、uh, in the cybersecurity basic law,、uh, there w a s provisions about the NISC establishment. So, for example, the、um, formal authority for each ministry. Uh, that is given by each law, but the NISC doesn't have it. And the NISC also doesn't have its own budget either. So there is a budget issue as well as the staffing issue for the NISC. So these、uh, issues exist.、Uh, it is the central control tower of、uh, cybersecurity policy in Japan. However, there is no NISC establishment law in Japan, like for other ministries. That's why there are some w e a k n e s s In 2022, for the past few years, cybersecurity from the defense perspective, a, a mindset、um, has been a, enlightened, a, a heightened. So、uh, there, is a, uh, there are things that h a s not changed much, therefore, I would like to be part of it to change. As I mentioned earlier,、uh, GOJ means the government of Japan, and then USG is US government. In relation to the、uh, cybersecurity related budget,、uh, this shows the comparison. So,、uh, to uh, simply put, the、uh, US budget、um, has more, 30, well, 30, 13 times more than Japan's budget. And for Japanese yen,、um, um, for the US budget, 1.21 trillion yen. However, it is more or less 100 billion yen in Japan. Well, unless you see the、uh, US uh, status,、uh, maybe you do not know the detail. However, would you please understand that、uh, there is a huge、uh, gap、uh, as to the budget? When I was a、uh, policymaker,、uh, I went to the MIT's Lincoln Lab. 100%、uh, they are involved in the military related、uh, research and study at the MIT building. Uh, the, uh, there is a corridor which is connected um, um, in, up in the air. I've never、uh, been there as to the security clearance. The different activities of one's individual 
uh, past um, uh, experiences are um, put together. And um, as to the US uh, system, I have not qualified as the security uh, clearance system yet. Uh, so there are six um, stages of that uh, clearance. So one of the thing is that uh, this is for the uh, military purpose. In 1995, I graduated from MIT. So what happened? At the t um, on the day of the graduation, the uh, military personnel uh, wore, wore the uniforms, and it was my surprise. One third of them uh, wore the uniforms. So I remember that, oh, I didn't know that uh, you are a military person. So science, technology, and uh, defense have a very close relationship in the US, and likewise China. What is the positioning of Japan from that perspective? The power of the science uh, technology should uh, be utilized for our Japan's uh, deep defense. And the other one is uh, Carnegie Mellon Science Lab. I, uh, the professor is available, but um, like this now, I am the um, adjunct, adjunct uh, fellow, and this is the uh, national institution for a study on cybersecurity related standardization, including uh, the different uh, regulations uh, where they are creating the standardization. So not here in Japan, but um, NIST uh, formulates uh, the US-based um, standardization uh, with respect to lab or the there's a close um, relationship um, between universities uh, in Japan and the US. That is my experience. Uh, this is something that I am proposing now. So let me uh, share with you what is uh, what I propose. Cybersecurity and cyber resilience, uh, there are three things needed. One is the um, technological capability from science and technology perspective, and it is, has been increasing. Uh, sorry, it, it is um, um, lagging behind as to Japan. The next one is the policy making, what sort of the uh, policy that we should uh, uh, promote. Um, again, we are behind. So again, policy making is behind too, uh, comparing with the US. The, uh, the other one is training on education in particular. White hacker type of the uh, persons uh, should uh, increase in number. Maybe uh, we shall um, prepare that uh, opportunity for the uh, lecture at the universities. So, what is the key is the relationship with the US and also have the uh, a close relationship with the uh, private sector. For 18 years, I have been uh, working as the uh, di member at the CSPC, that is a think tank. Uh, the president of uh, that think tank uh, will come to Japan next week. And that is the economic uh, security uh, law or the act that we have in Japan. So battery technolo technologies, uh, motors, and conductive technologies, uh, 20 plus uh, fields where emerging technologies are defined with the same um, growth expectation, and that shall not be shared with the adversaries or rogue nations. So cybersecurity serves as a foundation, that is the concept. In order to protect the geopolitical technology, the cybersecurity is positioned as the foundation of that technology. I mentioned the budget, but in any case, at the University in Japan, the uh, this is my personal viewpoint, but only Keio University is very much involved in cybersecurity related research. Uh, for the national um, university, it was uh, established uh, with the uh, taxpayers' money. And one of my mission is uh, to uh, transform uh, national universities uh, to uh, get involved in this area. And for cyber range, not, it's not um, it is not familiarized in Japan, but um, we've been it's come to the cyber defense and attack. Uh, this is the uh, place to uh, practice, and you find it's like a um, driving range for golf. But in any case, uh, you practice. So let me tell you what this is. For example, far left, uh, uh, is that George Mason? Oh, so in the middle, it is the George Mason. Oh, no, in the middle, it's not George Mason. 
I, I think it is. it should be Carnegie Mellon University on the far right. Uh, this is in China. The cyber range, it's very huge. And supercomputers are available here too. Uh, different types of the uh, attacks and defenses uh, are tried um, to practice. The, and that um, opportunity, or, okay, uh, that is not available in Japan. Uh, maybe I'm uh, going to, um, uh, to uh, ahead of it the day, but uh, hopefully at the, um, at the University of Tokyo, uh, we shall have this type of the um, cyber range. Well, we should create that, and it doesn't matter if it's the uh, University of Tokyo. Uh, be among the, uh, so between the US Japan universities, uh, there is uh, some agreement that to be concluded in respect uh, with the cyber resilience, resilience cooperation, I think that is needed. Uh, so if I may talk about uh, my own, uh, a connection. Uh, there is the uh, Oxford Internet Institute. I am appointed as a visiting policy fellow. Uh, the other one is Indian Institute of Technology, Hyderabad. Uh, the other one is Sci Lab at Carnegie, Me Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, with the uh, doctor called Toma Bechi, I worked on. Um, I hear that uh, some meeting, uh, the conference uh, is still ongoing. And Dr. Toma Bechi, uh, is appointed as a project uh, professor for the George A. Mason University and CSPC. Uh, this uh, means the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress. Uh, with the, um, uh, in order to create a policy um, for the uh, President and Congress, um, the think tank is available. The uh, core representative uh, um, person is Grand, Grand Nine uh, for the CSPC. And he is uh, working over the uh, uh, certification. And the mic. this is the think tank um, on a bipartisan basis. So their interest, uh, one of their interests is a geopolitical or geotechnology area uh, within the ally, ally, um, alliance uh, countries, how uh, we could uh, harmonize. And that uh, is discussed. The other one is the cyber security at MIT. This is the business school. Uh, they are also involved in cyber security. Not just uh, utilizing MIT technologies, uh, how cyber security should be um, perceived and from the policy perspective, how cyber security should move forward uh, is thought. Well, the US uh, uh, university does not separate uh, between um, liberal arts and science. Uh, therefore, uh, they have already established uh, the initiative uh, to think uh, cybersecurity from a business perspective. So US, uh, Japan, uh, we will work together. Therefore, I say it's a forever friendship. Friendship. Thank you very much um, for listening. Thank you very much. Now, we would like to uh, entertain some uh, questions uh, that uh, have uh, some comments over the chat box. If I could start from uh, my question, I also um, work uh, used to work as a um, part-time professor uh, for three years uh, at the University of Tokyo in a club activity uh, like lecture. CTF was taken up, like uh, what Koike-san talked about. It's like a club activity, but uh, they can uh, have a credit from this course. Well, that was a proposal uh, made uh, uh, by myself. And then the University of Tokyo liked the idea, but the professor in charge of this department said that, uh, no, my area is not cybersecurity, he said. So within my department, uh, it's difficult to accommodate such a lecture. So it's the idea is gone. So what kind of sectionarism do they have in, within the university? I wonder why they have such a mentality. Well, in, uh, there is a secret, sacred um, uh, spaces for each uh, professor at universities. Uh, nobody can invent, invade. Well, I shouldn't be too outspoken, but when it comes to universities, they don't like to change it so much. I think that's the reason. Sorry about that. 
in Japanese universities, uh, there are tenure system. So once you get a uh, position, you won't be fired unless you do something very, very wrong. So for the positioning of each person will be established uh, gradually. And then that's why they tend to have this uh, rigid system. So that's why it's very difficult to do something new in universities. We have to change it to, to be extreme. So for the conventional systems, uh, it's difficult to change that. So we have to break it down and uh, create something new. That's something we have to do in Japan. Well, maybe I'm too, saying too much, but uh, for the economic security uh, promotion law was uh, established uh, this year, March this year. And uh, within that law, we are going to create a fund uh, for the economic security. It's about 500 billion yen fund. The biggest uh, item there is cybersecurity, we believe. So we can use that uh, uh, budget fund so that we can build the foundation. I personally believe that we need a cyber range. As you know, in the existing building, it's difficult to make one. We have to have a supercomputer and all the power systems uh, in the inf and infrastructure security without the wiretapping possibility at all. So we need a brand new building. We have to start the, from the scratch. So in the next two, three years, we like to construct such a building. So please help me. Yes, of course. And there are questions I, I want to ask one. Uh, um, public academia. Uh, how about the collaboration with the private sector from the university's perspective? That's the first question. And between industry and academia, in order to change that, what is the role and responsibility of uh, individual engineers? So two questions. Engineers, individuals, I think, they have to continue to improve their skills. But uh, I'm in the uh, bureaucrat and the political world. No, um, almost nobody in the bureaucracy have ever wrote a program, so they don't have any idea uh, or information technology. But uh, um, probably they don't understand. I don't either, but I can write programs myself. So I think that is the biggest difference, to be honest with you. So educating those existing people would be difficult. That's why I talked about NISC earlier. Uh, maybe we can make a, a NISC establishment law in Japan. And uh, in that, we can say that uh, where is the headquarters and to clearly have a position there. And then we can uh, concentrate all of the cybersecurity technologies, business discussions and the policy discussions that should be the center for these efforts. So in terms of the um, uh, constitution, uh, institution, we can do that. And in terms of the academia, existing thing, uh, they don't want to change. So we have to make a new system. And what is important as we do that, or the, despite the differences in opinions, is that the Japanese universities were avoiding defense technologies. It became an issue at the academic conference. But the Ukraine issue posed this question to all of the Japanese people, how important technology is. We know now, so with the tax money, uh, national universities are funded by tax money. So for the entire nation, nation they can't no longer uh, avoid uh, defense technology anymore. So they have to change the mindset and they have to create a new system so that they can accommodate education on defense technology. Uh, this is something interesting uh, probably for all of you. You know, the University of Tokyo, so the very first uh, uh, department was uh, geology because uh, the first we have to think about how to utilize the resources in Japan. And then there was a Russia-Japan war. And at that time, I don't know, Japan-China uh, war broke. And after that, uh, uh, Japan-Russia uh, war. And at that time, we bought all of the uh, battleships from overseas. And then in the University of Tokyo, they created a new department for shipbuilding. And then surprisingly, a battleship Yamato, uh, that was uh, uh, built 
uh, and designed by the dean of the University of Tokyo in those days. Well, so that was the second. The third was advertising, oh, the, sorry, sorry, aviation, and they made a zero uh, battleship. And there was a, a design department too for the battleship. And so in the past at the Tokyo University, there was the second engineering department that was totally dedicated to defense technology, military technology. So there was a time when Japan was like that, although I can't say that so out loud. So technology is uh, tightly linked with uh, uh, wars and the national defense in the past. And uh, this is my hypothesis, but I want to propose. I have a hypothesis that says, in the latter half of 20, 1990s, uh, for the last 20 years, we didn't see emergence of the innovation in Japan so much. Why is that? One is because of the lack of defense technology in this country. You know, uh, the key technology uh, always uh, emerges from uh, military studies and uh, researches. Internet is famous, and there are other examples like AI, basic uh, algorithm, they came from uh, military technology, and also robotics, totally it uh, was derived from the uh, military uh, researches. And on top of that, in Japan, we have companies like Sony, NAC, Fujitsu, Toyota, Nissan. Maybe they don't claim this, but uh, for example, if you look at the history of Sony, the founder, uh, he was in the uh, Marine. He was an engineer, a communication engineer in the Marine. And Toyota founder, a Nissan engine that was uh, coming from the uh, army development plans and the radar as well. So I don't want to say everything is, but uh, almost all technologies came from uh, defense and the military technology. So we have to be serious about that and uh, th think about the roles and responsibility of universities. And defense technology is one of the examples. So the structure of the whole nation has to be changed in an upcoming two or three years. So those of you who are in the audience, uh, please support this idea going forward. Well, I lost my seat in the uh, diet. So why uh, was I, I came, uh, did I come back, come back to Tokyo University? I thought that I wanted to do something uh, for the nation. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak today. I want to change uh, the whole uh, nation going forward, and I want your help. Thank you very much. Now we are going to have a break. Now we would like to start at the 255. NRI, NRI Secure Technologies um, is going to present uh, uh, Mr. Fukuzawa. デブセックオプスデイズ東京はデブセックオプスを推進するためのコミュニティ活動に賛同してくださる多くの企業団体から支援を受けていますプラチナスポンサー NRI Secure Technologies GMO Cyber Security by Yerae Silver Sponsor HRD Profiles Startup Sponsor Robust Intelligence Richelka Security Koen America Taishikan Keizai Sangyo Show 総務省、文部科学省、デジタル庁、サイバーセキュリティ戦略本部
カーネギーメロン大学ソフトウェアエンジニアリングインスティテュートカーネギーメロン大学サイラボコグニティブ CTF「世界から届いた食材が彩るディナーテーブル」「約束の場所に」時間通り安全に到着する交通機関どこでも安心して受けられる医療や薬遠く離れて暮らす家族に贈る誕生日のプレゼントその日常は人や物をつなぐ仕組みで支えられているお客様と社会とそして世界中に広がる仲間とともに新しい仕組みを作りつないできた世界は常に変化を続け時には想像もしなかった困難を私たちに突きつける必要なのは何ができるかではなく何をすべきか社会があるべき姿とは何か次の世代にも続く本当に豊かな暮らしとは何かそれを見つめ、私たちは行動する。N. T. T. データ。ビッグデータや。A. I. 技術が脚光を浴びる。データの時代がやってきた。巨大企業も。ベンチャー企業も。データを大きな経営資源と捉えビジネスに取り入れようとしています15年以上前からデータ活用の可能性をまっすぐに信じてきた私たち今こそ一緒にデジタルトランスフォーメーションで開けるドアがたくさんあると思うのです持続可能な未来につながる扉成長し続けるできること広がるデータ分析の民主化最適な意思決定挑戦できる未来ささやかな幸せにあふれた日常あの成長ですときめく顧客体験を磨き続ける世界<笑>豊かな社会意味のある仕事を作る誰もがビジョンにチャレンジできる誰も想像できない大きな成功イントゥリアンの目からウルコの瞬間を提供する製造の矛盾化子供たちの未来データかけるワクワクイコール未来できたらいいなを形に仲間の笑顔が未来の笑顔を作る未来は作るものだというふうに考えているので仕事を通じて新しい価値をですね想像すればですね日本がまだまだですね成長できる面白い機会を作ることができると思っているので、えー、かなり広範囲のビジネスをですね僕らはご支援できるんじゃないかなというふうに思っています。その意志が世界を守る。テクノロジーは常に進化するインターネットが人々の間に広く普及し始めてからさまざまな技術が加速度的に進化し派生し広がった気がつけば私たちの暮らしは便利さという名のもとで大きく様変わりしてきたテクノロジーをどう使うかそれはその人間自身に委ねられる人はいつの時代も人が作り出した矛盾にとらわれている善か悪か勝つか負けるか傷つけるのか守り抜くのかそのパラドックスに常に挑んでいる今やビジネスだけではなく日常生活においても IT の力が不可欠になり全てがネットワークでつながる時代24時間365日社会全体が常に IT の引き起こすリスクと向き合わなければならない時代の変化を見極め新たな知識を蓄え培ってきた技術と経験によって決して負けられない戦いに挑み続けていく恐れずに進もうあなたの揺るぎない意志がこれからの時代を守っていくその仕事で人類の豊かさを確かなものにしていくんださあ
プロフェッショナルとしての誇りを胸にこの社会を前進させていこうその意思が世界を守る「NRI セキュアテクノロジーズ」コグニティブ CTF は誰でも楽しくセキュリティを考慮したプログラミングが学べるゲーミフィケーションプラットフォームですすでにソフトウェアエンジニアとして活躍している方もプログラミングに興味のある中学生、高校生、大学生でもどなたでもゲーム感覚でお楽しみいただけますコグニティブ CTF は政府機関の研究開発プロジェクトとしてコグニティブリサーチラボと東京大学、京都大学が共同開発しました。軍事大国の現役サイバー兵士が取り組むような難易度の高いものから、初めてプログラミングを学ぶ中高生の初心者の方でも楽しめるものまで、多様な問題を取り揃えています。コグニティブ CTF に取り組むことで、基本的なコーディングスキル、暗号解読、フォレンジクス、リバースエンジニアリング、バイナリ解析などに関する問題を解きながら、ハッカーとしてのスキルを向上することができます。悪意を持ったハッカーがどのように攻撃してくるかについての知識がなければ、ソフトウェアの安全と安心を保つことはできません。現代はあらゆるソフトウェア開発者にハッカーとしてのスキル習得が必要になっているのです。ぜひあなたも一度、コグニティブ CTF でハッカーとしての腕前を試して、楽しくスキルアップしてみませんか ?QR コードを読み取って、ぜひ参加登録をお願いします。どなたでも無料でお楽しみいただけます。インターネットの発展は私たちの生活を便利に豊かに変えました今では水やガス電気と同じくらい生活に欠かせない重要なインフラです会社や学校病院銀行や工場ありとあらゆる場所とシステムがインターネットにつながっていますそんなインターネットがサイバー攻撃の脅威にさらされているなんてあってはならないと私たちは考えます私たちはサイバー攻撃で使われる脆弱性や攻撃手法を日々研究していますその結果なんと直近1年間で約30件のゼロデイの脆弱性を発見しました私たちは悪意あるハッカーが攻撃するよりもずっと前にお客様のシステムのセキュリティホールを見つけてご報告します私たちはこれまで先進的なセキュリティ技術を研究し知識を共有してきました私たちはこれからも企業とシステムを利用するすべての人をサイバー攻撃から守ります目に見えない脅威から暮らしを守る日本を守るすべての人に安心と安全なインターネット HRD グループは科学的なアプローチで人事や組織の改革を強力に支援しています今多くの企業がデジタルトランスフォーメーションに取り組んでいるのではないでしょうかデジタルテクノロジーを活用することにより営業やマーケティングの見直し業務プロセスの自動化がさまざまな企業で実現されていますでは人材や組織に関してはどうでしょう一人一人の才能や個性に合わせた適材適所の実現や効果的なコミュニケーションの実践はデジタル化とは無縁の勘と経験に頼っているのが現状ではないでしょうかこのようなちゃんと経験に頼ってきた人事や組織の課題もデータにより解決する時代になってきています私たちの提供するディスクとプロファイル XT は科学的検証に裏打ちされた人材測定ツールです一人一人のモチベーションの源泉やそのポテンシャルを見出すことで組織や人材の課題を解決します全世界でこれまでに6000万人、10万社、日本でもこれまで120万人以上の顧客が効果を実感しているソリューションですこれからのデジタル時代の企業における改革の本質は人と組織のトランスフォーメーションにあると私たちは考えています HRD グループのディスクとプロファイル XT が
組織や人材の改革を可能にします効果的なコミュニケーションによる組織力向上に興味のある方はディスクで社内の適材適所の実現や人材のポテンシャルを見出すことに興味のある方はプロファイル XT で検索してぜひ一度ホームページからお問い合わせください。はい。では、えー、戻ってまいりました。えー、2時55分になりましたので。Thank you.Now it is 2.55, so we would like to start next session.So,、uh, we have Mr. Tatsuhiro Fukuzawa from NIR, NRI Secure Technologies.Thank、uh, you for spo- sponsoring the event. And I think you have a long history as a DevSecOps team. And I want to、um, hear your、uh, the recipe for the、uh, success. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Do you see my screen? Yes, we do. Thank you. Thank you for your kind introduction. I am Fukuzawa from NRI Secure Technologies.、Uh, today, I'm going to introduce recipe for the success of DevSecOps based on actual examples. So, first, let me introduce myself. So, other presenters have a great、uh, track record, and I try to list up the certifications that I have. And I listed、uh, too much、uh, certifications, so I did not have much space to talk about my experience. So, I would like to focus on my experience around the security. So, this is my、uh, history. And I have been working for NRI Secure Technologies. And I have been engaged in、uh, very valuable、uh, parts of the business. So, in uh, uh, MSS, I worked on the、uh, WAF IDS、uh, as a member of SOC.、Uh, what I did was to take measures to do the protection of the system. And then I moved on to assess, assessment, so penetration test. So, this is the kind of job. That g i v e advice from a perspective of、uh, actors. So I would say what I did was defense and offense. And then I am now doing a DevSecOps. So this is very briefly my career. And I would like to talk about my experience around DevSecOps. First,、uh, before I talk about a specific、uh, Uh, cases and experience. I would like to talk about、uh, some underlying、uh, information. So, this is the、uh, DevSecOps that is required for the era of DX. So, for the audience, you may be、uh, already familiar with this. So, DevOps、uh, were widely used in order to respond to requirements by the users that are getting diversified. And There are security risks that cannot be tolerated. In order to respond to that,、uh, we have DevSecOps. So you may think that why don't we 
take measures after the release in order to uh, address the security risk. But actually, that is not how the things should be working. So there are the security risk that cannot be tolerated, and we need DevSecOps. So when I say security risk that cannot be tolerated, uh, maybe the third party and uh, some people are uh, impersonating and do the shopping. So these risks have to be addressed within the process of DevSecOps. So that is exactly what I want to talk about today. Next page talks about what it takes to achieve DevSecOps. There are three items, uh, namely culture, process, and technologies. What I'm trying to say is it's not that uh, either one of them is achieved, it's fine. Uh, no, you want to consider uh, every three aspects. So please remember there are three perspectives and you need every one of the three uh, aspects. And now let me turn to the structure to achieve DevSecOps. So this is relevant with culture perspective and the culture as the one aspect to achieve DevSecOps. And this one, the culture could be uh, the challenging hurdle you want to clear. Uh, you, you may be fixated to the traditional responsibilities and roles and some members may not be interested in security. I have worked with the customers who are only look at their responsibility and some people in, said that it's not my responsibility, security is not my responsibility, there's a team who should be working on security. So I have heard such remarks in the past. So it is important that uh, you don't really fixate it, you are not fixated to traditional roles and responsibilities. And uh, as we do this, you may lose some speed. So sometimes the review is not uh, uh, relevant, like uh, there are too much focus on uh, the wording. Uh, in order to avoid such a challenge, you have to make a change. And there's a, a notable difference between traditional development style and DevSecOps. Let me focus on the important points. So I said that uh, you want to really change the mindset from a traditional roles and responsibilities. Uh, the key word is the, uh, the same purpose shared among members. And by doing so, you can achieve uh, the, the development with the high agility. So everyone should be aware of the security, but there should be the role to lead security. So what is important is that people share the same purpose. But uh, without mindset, mindset, mindset of the security, you can still develop the product. So it is important to have a, a position or a person who can really lead the initiative around the security. So I have talked about culture aspect. Now let me turn to process aspect. So DevSecOps has a relatively a short period of time before the release. When there's a short period, period before the release, it is important to detect the threat at the earlier timing. Uh, but uh, a traditional uh, check-in uh, the process uh, will not be able to meet this uh, needs. So there's a gap between traditional security measures and DevSecOps. And this page shows traditional security measures. So you form uh, development guidelines and based on the guidelines, guidelines you take measures. But in this way, uh, you cannot really keep up with the uh, fast change in technologies. Uh, having the guidelines itself is not a bad thing, but what is important is how you maintain them. So instead of looking at them on paper, uh, you want to have some system uh, so that you can make a, a meaningful uh, assessment and check, and that will be very important. And if you look at the uh, bullet point, uh, it is very important. Uh, so. Uh, so you may not have enough time to do the correction and modification. 
with a traditional uh, time frame. So you want to find the risk as early as possible. So in order to find risks as early as possible, what can you do? And that is shown on the next page. And I think this word has been mentioned uh, today uh, for a couple of times. So this is the uh, shift left. So at the uh, upstream, you want to take into account security pre-development. So during the planning and uh, uh, designing, you want to consider security. Uh, experts should review that. So we are encouraging the companies to have a review process conducted by experts. And also, uh, it is important to do the in-house uh, security assessment process, and you want to automate that uh, so that you can detect the issues during the process of development. And I will talk about this later more in detail. So by making a shift left, uh, you can reduce uh, unnecessary uh, back and forth uh, the operations. But uh, more importantly, uh, we can really uh, incorporate security perspective at the early process. And let me introduce the tool to achieve DevSecOps. So it's not really make a additional or checking or doing a checking at the uh, later stage of the process. What we are saying is that let's do seamless checking within the development process. And there are uh, the, the three uh, the tools, uh, SAS, DAS, EAS. So what is important is to understand the nature of the tool and you incorporate these two uh, within the process of the development process in an effective way. So there are SAST, DAST, EAST, and these three tools are explained here in this one page. So that makes this page very busy, but I hope that gives you some perspective. Uh, so let me start with SAST, S-A-S-T. So, so this is um, the static, static uh, the testing of the uh, source code. So uh, here, what is important is the uh, lace condition issue, uh, coding quality, and uh, uh, the, the authentication information after hard coding. These are the vulnerabilities that should be detected during SAST. And next, DAST, D-A-S-T. So uh, the idea is to detect vulnerabilities uh, by making an in intentional uh, attack. So that is uh, one nature of this tool. And IAST, I-A-S-T. So this is the, uh, uh, the testing of behaviors. And this can be interpreted by in many ways, depending on which vendors we are talking about. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the broad idea is that we look at the behavior of applications. So in some people say this is the uh, hybrid of SAST and DAST. So, so what is the output of the log, for instance, to detect the, the issues? So that is one nature of EAST. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the automation tool that our company is offering. So that one page shows our tools. So just uh, for your reference, these are the tools that we are offering. And I would like to make some comparisons among each tool. So, so the, uh, these are the, the natures, the, the features that the vendors usually talk about. So as you can see in this table, so there's no one perfect tool. So you want to select tool depending on what your purpose is. As I said at the beginning, you want to understand feature, pros and cons of the tool so that you can utilize the tool uh, based on the purpose that you have. And uh, a third line from the top, so that the level of uh, back and forth or the rework of the, uh, the development. 
So please look at SAST. If you have a source code, the testing can be conducted. So you can use SAST at the early timing of the development, but DAST, you have to process HTTP request. So that DAST uh, will be applied at a relatively later stage of the development. So the timing of using the tool is different. So you want to understand what kind of the vulnerabilities you want to detect, and based on a purpose, you choose the tool that you want to use. So there's a, a the mistake many people make. You start uh, which tool you want to use, uh, but uh, uh, rather uh, you want to take the approach that I have introduced. And now uh, let me uh, talk about the actual the cases of DevSecOps. And I would say this is the uh, main part of my presentation. Uh, first, this is the uh, the case one, uh, DevSecOps implementation in a uh, uh, internal uh, project. So this project has a long uh, history. So it was 2016. So it was six years ago. So this was a project six years ago. So it was uh, a first time uh, the agile approach was uh, applied in this company. So as I said during my introduction, uh, introduction. So MSS. So the uh, collecting logs and exporting a report. So that was the the purpose of the project, and it was achieved by using AWS, but uh, I would like to talk about uh, the details using the later pages. This is the uh, case one, DevSecOps uh, realization, materialization image. Is there, you can see the development source code management test reads, and they will be conducted seamlessly. And what's done uh, specifically will be explained from now. And on the left-hand side at the top, you can see there's a developer. And, and this developer is going to work on the local repository. Now, after the development, they are going to uh, commit in the local repository, and it's going to be pushed into the uh, uh, shared repository in the middle. And that's going to be pushed into the uh, shared repository. And then on the right hand side, you can see a CD box. And uh, Jenkins uh, is receiving the notification of change, and based on that result, automatically uh, the uh, functional test or statistical test or dynamic test will be triggered automatically. And then, as a result of those testings, if there's no problem in the staging environment, the uh, system is going to be deployed automatically again. And in the uh, EOT is, is to be conducted and it will be released. So that is how the uh, development is working. And uh, this is the uh, DevSecOps, and uh, this is the very basic uh, standard. And so I've just cited as an example, because I have learned quite a lot from this standard. And another thing is uh, to adopt the agile development, and as uh, uh, described here as it is, and the uh, report uh, supply service uh, to utilize by utilizing our MSS. That's used by different uh, parties. Uh, therefore, we have got the various kind of requirements. So those requirement changes must be coped with. And uh, that is the reason why we needed to have the agile process uh, to be able to flexibly cope with the uh, requirement addition or changes. In order to promote the agile development, uh, there are several hurdles we have to overcome. And uh, let's say including the internal rules and, uh, or maybe uh, we have the uh, internal road uh, to have the document to be released. So those uh, hurdles had to be overcome. And on the next page, you can see all our uh, reflections summarized here for the case one. In, in our SQL, for the first time, uh, we have adopted this agile development. Um, but the uh, internal regulations did not comply with the agile 
uh, process. Therefore, then we needed to develop the process after coordinating through with the uh, relevant division. And uh, this served as the model case for uh, the following project. Uh, and there were uh, good points and, and improvement points at uh, the bottom. As to the uh, good points, agile development was adopted. And also the infra's code uh, was developed as a basis to manage the uh, base architecture. And also the change uh, control uh, was very easy. And I think probably this has been adopted by other projects. The biggest is the uh, internal development that uh, served at the first case. And that was a good thing for us because we had the occasion to be able to try everything because it was anyhow in the internal project. So they, by picking up the uh, internal development as a first case, we were able to try out many things. And uh, improvement points are there on the right hand side. In Sprint Zero, we, our preparation was not enough. And then since the, uh, we didn't have the knowledge about the Agile uh, development, so uh, we just got started. Uh, but the uh, very basic uh, architecture needed to be uh, scrutinized. Otherwise, the uh, final outcome and the, uh, would be uh, not enough. So we needed to get prepared for, with Sprint Zero. And also the SAS, SAS management is another thing. In the CSED, it's going to be implemented automatically. That's what we thought in the initially, but then just to uh, implement the uh, tool is not enough. Let's say in case of dust, if you implement it, it was in the CSED, it's not going to be completed, but it takes time uh, for the system. And it doesn't, uh, it's not going to be accommodated. So we will have to uh, review which thing we will have to uh, now done. Uh, those are the things we needed to do uh, as one of the improvement points. So there's a reflection for the case one. And the next is case two, SEC team as a service. And this is not for me, but yeah, my team member has done it. And in in reality, uh, this has been proposed to, to the customers. And the customers have got the uh, challenges in the uh, conventional uh, development process that has the uh, gap against the uh, DevSecOps uh, development process. And they wanted to close down the gaps. And that was the uh, background behind. And then uh, uh, getting the... Uh, Permission by the customer. This is this was the uh, JTB example, and uh, we actually participated in the development scheme uh, that's indicated on the right hand side. We are a part of the customer's project and in order to develop the uh, standards and so forth. And we have started the uh, learning uh, pro uh, project as well. And the right hand side, you can see this uh, this the uh, scheme organization, you can see that there's the security team here, which is overseeing overseeing the entire activity. This is the point. If you have got the uh, many agile teams, you do not know where uh, to and when we should assign the security person in charge. So probably this will be the best scheme to oversee the entire agile teamwork. That's what I think. And uh, let me just uh, elaborate some other points. I think we, we were able to uh, support uh, very closely to the application team. And also that we were able to provide the uh, development guidelines and uh, we were able to follow them up. And of course, the uh, uh, security themes were picked up in the learning session as well. And then the important thing was that through the learning session, of course, they were able to uh, learn the knowledge, but the uh, uh, person in charge of the development have got the higher uh, recognition of the security from the development point of view. And from uh, the uh, co-worker in the team, I think uh, it was convincing for them to learn, uh, learn about the security. And so we were in the same position as the uh, developer, and that sort of uh, support was provided by us. And I'm going to go over in details in the next page where you can see. In order to have the developer focus upon the development, that was the concept. And uh, and uh, we were able to contribute to the uh, development of the uh, DevSecOps culture in the customer. And uh, the uh, developer's uh, security con uh, consciousness uh, was uh, pretty much elevated. That was good. and and the uh, learning session was implemented for the customers, employees, and as a result, all those uh, recipients of uh, the learning sessions, they have had the uh, higher consciousness about the security. 
and the DevSec Cup uh, scheme was developed, and, and, and that was voluntarily uh, developed by the customers in terms of the culture development. I think this was the uh, most successful example, whereas we have got some improvement points. As you have many projects in the future to support the uh, those projects, the uh, person in charge will have a lot of burden. And, uh, so probably we have to consider the uh, template uh, process in the future. And also that so we have done the solves review, uh, we needed to have the better lead time allocation. Uh, in order to review one source code, it takes about it took about uh, two weeks or three weeks. And uh, so probably we, we should re, uh, prioritize the uh, target checkpoints. That was what we have learned from this. And the last case is DevSecOc uh, infrastructure development support. I was involved in this, and the DevSecOps to develop the DevSecOps, the infrastructure development was uh, provided by us. The how we promoted was as follows. We have tied it out with the some of the specific project, and then we deployed it uh, all across the board. And if you look at the right hand side, in addition to the infrastructure development, the threat analysis or the design review, those have been diverse. And also, we have provided the process assist in this case. And if I just go into the details and elaborate what we have done, the customer has got the challenges and they have got the uh, uh, competition before and the uh, the after the introduction and before the introduction the uh, development vendors uh, they actually managed their own outcomes uh, whereas the uh, if they had the uh, security checks or not they were not well controlled in order to improve the situation after the introduction uh, we on our side, Git Love was adopted on our side, and we have asked them to lay out all the uh, output of the uh, development vendor, and uh, whatever loaded there uh, would be checked for the source code, and also the reviews were done for them as far as they are in this location, and to be able to better uh, control. But the, this is the access via internet, so the uh, we needed to consider the uh, development environment safety as well another thing is that the uh, threat analysis and the security architecture design and uh, uh, we are providing assessment services and uh, that is the perspective we employ here based upon this and they're highly uh, risky and also the uh, the items that can be detected through the uh, design and architecture. That's the viewpoint. And all the members who have done the uh, assessment uh, will do the, this analysis. And so far, in the trial, uh, of, uh, trial project, we have identified some of the issues. And uh, this is a reflection for the uh, phase three. They're cheaper, faster, easier to develop the secure development environment. And not only for the environment the technology, but we were able to step into the process. But there we have provided those goods and pros and cons. We were able to uh, supply the process and environment at the same time. And also the trial was done. So the process was very smooth. But we put too much focus upon the security. So the convenience was compromised. So we needed to have the further hearings with the customers, uh, not just a part of the trial. So that was what we have learned from. And the project lead time is very short, so the of course, and we ne needed to take a little bit more time for the trial. Sorry, we have, I'm running short of time, but the uh, here comes the uh, summary. The culture process technology, all of them are required for the de DevSec of realization. And and the, what is important is how it's a color in order to implement the DevSec up. Uh, there's uh, what should be done. There's no what should be done, what to be done. So you need to identify the uh, optimum solution uh, per individual organization. And as I introduced the tools, uh, SAST, DAST, and EAS, those are the characteristics of those tools, so just refer to them. Sorry for running over time, but that is all I have prepared for this presentation. Thank you very much for your audience. Okay, thank you very much, Fukazawa-san.
Oh, these are the things that we could, could not hear uh, from any others, but you, uh, somebody like you in the field. And I have a question from me. In the beginning, as an NRI, and uh, as an NRI secure, in the beginning, DevSecOps or agile processes have been employed. I understand that, but in case of a case one or case two, they should be and so forth. In the earliest timing, those customers wanted to uh, improve the environment. Where did they come up with those needs? I think probably they wanted to introduce the agile development. That was the, one of the drivers. But in case of the case three, uh, they, rather than the agile development, but they really wanted to have the uh, governance uh, controllable uh, the environment because they didn't have the governance and they didn't know that the security was really assured or not. So that was the, uh, the challenge they had. So in order to have the best governance and control and, and also to carry it across, the yeah, customer wanted to have the integral uh, environment. Okay, so not only for the agility, but and just like S bomb, the uh, safe codes uh, should be adopted by everyone in the environment, and also the container architecture development and also framework versions uh, are the same. Same, so you must be able to tell where and what is used. And once uh, the uh, uh, malware is identified, and then it needs to be amended. So that sort of needs is ever increasing. That's what I think. Yes, you're right. I think it is just like uh, you are inventing something new as a vehicle. So the uh, I think it is very important to share and carry across the examples. Yeah, you're right. So uh, continuously, please lead our the uh, DevSecOps industry here in Japan as a, an uh, department. Yes, thank you very much indeed for sponsoring our event. Do you have anything you want to advertise? Uh, uh, thank you very much indeed for giving this opportunity and i would like to uh, be a part of it next year in the following year okay thank you very much i'll be looking forward to hearing your new uh, cases in the future because our son from the nice is secure thank you very much indeed thank you very much next up well we are behind the schedule by five minutes but the next one is uh, rather short so we can catch up by hopefully uh, from uh, enter soft information systems IIT, uh, I think he's from in, uh, Institute of Technology in India, Hyderabad, uh, Mr. Sri Chakradad. Uh, he's uh, uh, offering overseas and uh, uh, third party outsourcing service for uh, security and uh, uh, penetration test services. So it's a pre recorded session. Please listen. Hello everyone, thanks for having me here. My name is Sri Chakradar. I'm CEO of a cyber security company called Entisoft. Today I'm going to present uh, about uh, you know, how organizations can take leverage of uh, you know, by offshoring their penetration testing services. Why organizations should uh, outsource or offshore their penetration testing services in, general spe in generally speaking security services to third party vendors. Predominantly from the global perspective, there is a mixed response from uh, business leaders and stakeholders whether to outsource offshore a security service to third party vendor or not. Unless And there is no mandatory rule that you need to offshore or outsource your security services unless until if there is a regulatory requirement or you know compliance that demands that one of your uh, assessment has to be carried out by a third party vendor. And there are several other driving factors why organizations should outsource their uh, security services or off offshore their security services. One important factor is the niche and the technological methods that the penetration testing service providers can provide. For example, an organization can have different methodological approaches different solutions in identifying loopholes in a given infrastructure 
or given organizations public facing IT assets. The second driving factor for any organizations to vouch for the third party penetration testing vendors is the skill set. In terms of the skill set you have to identify what kind of certifications these individuals possess and how qualified they are. We, there are multiple certification or accreditation bodies for example SANS is a very well known university uh, in terms of uh, security certifications and they provide certifications like GPEN etc. And OSCP is one of the you know offensive security based uh, you know uh, certification which proves the metal of a penetration tester from a practical perspective. So these certifying bodies they don't hold the certifier for a brief period of time they have to recertify themselves for every now and then. In this way their skills evolve on a timely basis and they keep up with the you know technological uh, advances happening across the globe. Like vulnerabilities evolve on a daily basis in the same pattern the certifying bodies allow them to learn more and more methodological ways to identify certain vulnerabilities. The two other driving factors uh, for an organization to you know take the leverage of offshoring their security services both cost and compliance. It is a tedious task and it is a uh, technical liability that one can say to train a you know uh, group of penetration testing penetration testers. There is a lot of effort involved in training them you need to purchase tools you need to certify them and there is a price that you have to pay there is a cost specific cost that is involved and there is no guarantee that this penetration tester is going to stay with you for a longer period of time because uh, there are some stats which says or which presents that for every qualified cyber security professional there are two jobs available all the time and the rate of unemployment is zero. Hence having said that retaining of this talent is also a uh, complex task. The availability of these kind of resources is very less. Hence keeping that cost and you know training and everything in mind this is one of the driving factor for the organizations to offshore their security services just to the right vendor who has the right amount of talent and right amount of capability in this aspect. The second aspect which I am about to cover is compliance. Compliance depends upon the region like for example it's always better to go for the uh, uh, local expertise of going with certain compliance maintenance for a, a company who has their foreign direct investment in a uh, different country and they have to adhere the laws and regulatory aspects they have to go through the process of compliance and it's better always to it is always better to go for the right uh, right individuals who know this knowledge of processing the compliance or uh, you know designing the framework for the compliance and also the pool of expertise you have to identify <laughs> え、このコンプライアンスの実現ができるのか確認する必要があります。コストについてですが、税務です。こちらも重要なコンプライアンスの the uh, region where the average salary of the individuals is less in that particular segment and uh, that is another driving factor for why organizations should leverage the penetration testing services or security services for a particular 
you know, uh, or uh, country or you know, organization, third party organization. In terms of compliance, compliance. コンプライアンスについてです。コンプライアンスは、まあ、地域によって異なっているということで、えー、こと、えー。主観的です目的は個人のデータをさまざまな地域横断的で保護することにあります。例えば GDPR を例にとりますと、ヨーロッパ諸国は地域の境界を越えてデータが出ていくことを望んでいません。It's, it's not about、uh, just to identify the right vendor, but also it has to be an internal decision made by your teams, and everyone should come on to the、uh, objective to secure your assets and also not to disturb the ecosystem while it is live. In other words, You have to liaise with your stakeholders, business heads, tech teams in order to go for a penetration testing and commonly finding a you know, a ground to outsource or offshore this activity before offshoring this activity. It is always subject to while performing a penetration testing in house. Hence, identifying the fact that you already are aware of the situation and you want to outsource or offshore this particular penetration testing activity, you will come to know that you know, what are the、uh, impacts of your business more from an objective perspective because、uh, there is no、uh, you know, advantage for the Third party vendor to hide the vulnerabilities in a very objective way. Subjective to that, if you are performing a penetration testing in house within your ecosystem or by your own teams, they always,、uh, the tendency is not to hide things, but、uh, they always find out the work- workarounds to、uh, keep that particular loophole open for a more longer period. In my opinion,、uh, you may feel、uh, it is a Process of identifying threats and mitigating、uh, the vulnerabilities, and、uh, again performing a、uh, second level assessment to see whether those identified vulnerabilities are fixed or not. It might sound pretty straightforward, but this is a rigorous exercise. Do remember that. Now, when we go in depth of identifying your right vendor, because they The main aspect is they hold your data, they hold your、uh, application, they hold your、uh, ecosystem, everything they have access to. Inherently, it is better to always choose a vendor in the right format. You don't need,、uh, you don't need to find a random penetration testing company、uh, just to also offshore your uh, you know, uh, testing services. It is always、uh, good to go through a process of、uh, you know, identifying the right vendor before you outsource your penetration testing activity.、Uh, few of those checklists、uh, we can always、uh, go through the process of identifying whether they are legally bounded to their region or not, whether they have all these certifications, what they have mentioned, and their credentials, their penetration testers' credentials, their CVs. Go through their profiles and identify whether they have the capability or not. And you can always request those credentials with their IDs and you can do a third party check before you know, offshoring or even outsourcing a、uh, penetration testing activity to a third party. Most importantly,、uh, be patient while、uh, assessing a particular vendor. 
in terms of whether by going through the references what projects they have done in your particular region if not what projects they have done in your specific business stream if you belong to fintech how many fintech companies they have covered you can always you know talk to their uh, clients or references that you can ask and sign a basic NDA to finally after you know satisfying yourself with all the you know process of identifying the right vendor the one important aspect that you always you know look for in a vendor is whether their ability to perform a penetration testing or not how do you do that you can always request them for a POC a proof of concept for certain vulnerabilities and once you are satisfied even if they are not if they even if they haven't identified the vulnerabilities but you can always know how their methodology and how their process and how their approach works with this we have come to the end of the presentation and i sincerely thank mr nirhara san and devsecops tokyo for allowing me to present myself in front of all these dignitaries thank you have a nice evening bye bye Thank you very much um, from the uh, Western countries. Uh, he, uh, this company has been receiving uh, different pen test um, activities and services. Uh, and there is a in progress as to de development and offshoring. And for example, from Japan, the pen testing is done in China or Vietnam. And uh, this company is the uh, largest uh, in size as to the getting pen testing. And also there are many uh, graduates, but uh, there are some pricing gap. Uh, therefore, uh, he has been providing such service. And I'm sure that uh, this uh, is a heightening uh, uh, trend that we see. Um, we are now earlier than we planned therefore let's have a 10 minute break and let's have um the uh, presentation of uh, mr kohei sakurai from um 350 so let's uh, resume devsecops days tokyo wa デブセックオプスを推進するためのコミュニティ活動に賛同してくださる多くの企業、団体から支援を受けています。プラチナスポンサー、NTTデータ、ブレインパッド、コグニティブリサーチラボ、ゴールドスポンサー、NRIセキュ
必要なのは何ができるかではなく何をすべきか社会があるべき姿とは何か次の世代にも続く本当に豊かな暮らしとは何かそれを見つめ私たちは行動する NTT データ「ビッグデータ」や AI 技術が脚光を浴びるデータの時代がやってきた巨大企業もベンチャー企業もデータを大きな経営資源と捉えビジネスに取り入れようとしています15年以上前からデータ活用の可能性をまっすぐに信じてきた私たち今こそ一緒にデジタルトランスフォーメーションで開けるドアがたくさんあると思うのです持続可能な未来につながる扉成長し続けるできること広がるデータ分析の民主化最適な意思決定挑戦できる未来ささやかな幸せにあふれた日常あの成長ですときめく顧客体験を磨き続ける世界豊かな社会意味のある仕事を作る誰もがビジョンにチャレンジできる誰も想像できない大きな成功イントゥリアンの目からウルコの瞬間を提供する製造の矛盾化子供たちの未来データかけるワクワクイコール未来できたらいいなを形に仲間の笑顔が未来の笑顔を作る未来は作るものだというふうに考えているので仕事を通じて新しい価値をですね想像すればですね日本がまだまだですね成長できる面白い機会を作ることができると思っているので、えー、かなり広範囲のビジネスをですね僕らはご支援できるんじゃないかなというふうに思っています医師が世界を守る。テクノロジーは常に進化する。インターネットが人々の間に広く普及し始めてから、さまざまな技術が加速度的に進化し、派生し、広がった。気がつけば、私たちの暮らしは便利さという名のもとで大きく様変わりしてきた。テクノロジーをどう使うか。それはその人間自身に委ねられる人はいつの時代も人が作り出した矛盾にとらわれている善か悪か勝つか負けるか傷つけるのか守り抜くのかそのパラドックスに常に挑んでいる今やビジネスだけではなく日常生活においても IT の力が不可欠になり全てがネットワークでつながる時代24時間365日社会全体が常に IT の引き起こすリスクと向き合わなければならない時代の変化を見極め新たな知識を蓄え培ってきた技術と経験によって決して負けられない戦いに挑み続けていく恐れずに進もうあなたの揺るぎない意志がこれからの時代を守っていくその仕事で人類の豊かさを確かなものにしていくんだ。さあ、プロフェッショナルとしての誇りを胸に、この社会を前進させていこう。その意思が世界を守る。NRI セキュアテクノロジーズ。コグニティブ CTF は誰でも楽しくセキュリティを考慮したプログラミングが学べるゲーミフィケーションプラットフォームですすでにソフトウェアエンジニアとして活躍している方もプログラミングに興味のある中学生、高校生、大学生でもどなたでもゲーム感覚でお楽しみいただけますコグニティブ CTF は政府機関の研究開発プロジェクトとしてコグニティブリサーチラボと東京大学、京都大学が共同開発しました。軍事大国の現役サイバー兵士が取り組むような難易度の高いものから、初めてプログラミングを学ぶ中高生の初心者の方でも楽しめるものまで、多様な問題を取り揃えています。
コグニティブ CTF に取り組むことで基本的なコーディングスキル暗号解読フォレンジクスリバースエンジニアリングバイナリ解析などに関する問題を解きながらハッカーとしてのスキルを向上することができます悪意を持ったハッカーがどのように攻撃してくるかについての知識がなければソフトウェアの安全と安心を保つことはできません現代はあらゆるソフトウェア開発者にハッカーとしてのスキル習得が必要になっているのですぜひあなたも一度コグニティブ CTF でハッカーとしての腕前を試して楽しくスキルアップしてみませんか QR コードを読み取ってぜひ参加登録をお願いしますどなたでも無料でお楽しみいただけます。インターネットの発展は私たちの生活を便利に豊かに変えました。今では水やガス、電気と同じくらい生活に欠かせない重要なインフラです。会社や学校、病院、銀行や工場。ありとあらゆる場所とシステムがインターネットにつながっていますそんなインターネットがサイバー攻撃の脅威にさらされているなんてあってはならないと私たちは考えます私たちはサイバー攻撃で使われる脆弱性や攻撃手法を日々研究していますその結果なんと直近1年間で約30件のゼロデイの脆弱性を発見しました私たちは悪意あるハッカーが攻撃するよりもずっと前にお客様のシステムのセキュリティホールを見つけてご報告します私たちはこれまで先進的なセキュリティ技術を研究し知識を共有してきました私たちはこれからも企業とシステムを利用する全ての人をサイバー攻撃から守ります目に見えない脅威から暮らしを守る日本を守る全ての人に安心と安全なインターネット HRD グループは科学的なアプローチで人事や組織の改革を強力に支援しています今多くの企業がデジタルトランスフォーメーションに取り組んでいるのではないでしょうかデジタルテクノロジーを活用することにより営業やマーケティングの見直し業務プロセスの自動化がさまざまな企業で実現されていますでは人材や組織に関ししてはどうでしょうでょ一人一人の才能や個性に合わせた適材適所の実現や効果的なコミュニケーションの実践はデジタル化とは無縁の勘と経験に頼っているのが現状ではないでしょうかこのような勘と経験に頼ってきた人事や組織の課題もデータにより解決する時代になってきています私たちの提供するディスクとプロファイル XT は科学的検証に裏打ちされた人材測定ツールです一人一人のモチベーションの源泉やそのポテンシャルを見出最後の動画うちの会社にあったから別にデブセックオプスデイズ東京はデブセックオプスを推進するためのコミュニティ活動に賛同してくださる多くの企業、団体から支援を受けていますプラチナスポンサー NTT データブレインパッドコグニティブリサーチラボゴールドスポンサー NRY セキュアテクノロジーズ GMO サイバーセキュリティバイイエラエシルバースポンサー五四三。はいでは、えー、再開したいと思います。Thank you for coming back. デブセックリズムダセッション。Now it is 3:52 Japan time. So let's resume the session. So we have a speaker from BrainPad. Uh, we have a speakers from BrainPad for the three consecutive years, and BrainPad also sponsors the event. We have、uh, Mr. Kohei Sakurai, and uh, uh, he is uh, going to uh, talk about the necessity of DevSecOps in a business con context. Do we have Sakurai san on the line? Yes. 
Thank you. I am Sakurai. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sakurai, please share the screen and start your presentation, please. Do you see the screen? Yes, we do. Thank you. Once again, I am Sakurai from BrainPad. I am going to talk about DevSecOps that the leading company of data science things and this is the necessity or significance of DevSecOps in the utilization of data in a business context. Let me first introduce myself. Once again, I am Kohei Sakurai from BrainPad. I am in charge of consulting in a company and there are a little bit of experience I want to introduce. I have experience in engineering, particularly uh, building infrastructure environment. Uh, I started from there and Azure and including the Azure, uh, the three the major clouds. So I encouraged our clients to move to the cloud. So that is the main theme of my consulting. And I joined BrainPad and I have been involved and engaged in uh, uh, building uh, architecture on the cloud and I give consultation about how data should be used. Not only the, the system, uh, we need the people to do the analysis. So uh, what would be an ideal state of the organization and what will be a data architecture that organization should have. These are the couple of areas that I have been promoting. And a little bit of my personal aspect, I love watching sports. So as all you know, I watched the, the, the soccer World Cup, the Japan team, and also play golf. So these are the things that I enjoy during weekends. And in the early morning, I practice golf. I go to do the half round while um, my kids are still sleeping. In the afternoon, I play with my kids. I uh, uh, take a nap and then I enjoy beer and a dinner. So I enjoy really my life during the weekends. Uh, really, I'm enjoying my time with my kids. Uh, but today, uh, I will show my professional side of myself. I will talk about uh, DevSecOps in a, a context of uh, business data utilization. So as it was mentioned that we have the speakers from BrainPad for the three consecutive years. Uh, the, the year before last year, we talked about the challenges in DevSecOps and some good uh, examples from ML and AI, and we talked about what we were going to promote. Last year, uh, in a second uh, appearance, we talked about how DevSecOps can be achieved, and uh, um, the operation under the concept of first decide as we put forward, and also uh, how uh, we can uh, really try DevSec ML Ops. So these are the, the contents that, are, that we have talked about during the DevSecOps Days Tokyo in the past. Uh, today, I would like to uh, talk about how uh, DevSecOps uh, should be uh, achieved for the data utilization in the business. And I will also talk about the approaches that, that you can take. These are the agenda items. I will start with the uh, the basics of DevSecOps and significance of DevSecOps, why we need it. And in order to achieve Dev DevSecOps, there are good examples I can introduce. And then I will conclude with the summary. So to start, I would like to introduce the company BrainPad. It has been almost 20 years since we founded our company since the company was founded. We have been consistent with the uh, data related business. Analytics innovation company is how we see ourselves. So data utilization for the business uh, will make a 
uh, difference in a society. That is our vision and purpose. And we have a lot of experiences that I want to introduce today. So just to recap, I think uh, from the, the morning, you have been hearing about DevSecOps. So it is just a quick recap. So we are working on DevSecOps, but uh, uh, it is all about close collaboration among operations, security, and development, and activate uh, efficient uh, cycle. And we have to really engage security in a, a whole process. So without slowing down development, uh, you want to uh, bring security into the process. So software development area, uh, we have seen the, the good progress. Uh, however, the companies that I work with are not necessarily in a software development. And we have some clients who are engaged in uh, information management. And uh, uh, DevSecOps is uh, advancing in the information system uh, market or industry. So there are uh, the requirements from head head office um, and the IT members um, are working on DevOps. So there are help desk, uh, the contact center uh, to take inquiries. We, they have to understand what is happening. And, and that has to be reflected in the development. So the tools are used to issue the tickets to achieve the collaboration. So operation development and management. Uh, so this concept is relevant with a whole phase. And, and then there's a development and a development uh, result should be reflected in the environment. So the, uh, in a, a development, um, the environment, a staging environment and production environment, those should be applied. So source code uh, is executed uh, after the, the def defining the test items, and it can really accelerate the development. So the concept of uh, DevOps have been uh, uh, well uh, uh, grained or have penetrated in these areas. So, so we here and we do see uh, IT uh, bringing the value for the businesses. So data is said to be the fourth asset for the business. So under the circumstances, many companies are using uh, digital. So we are entering the, the era of DX. So there will be uh, more data that you have to handle so from the big companies to uh, startup companies, uh, the data has to be utilized very well. And this is one example. Uh, let's take uh, e-commerce industry as an example. Uh, there's a great progress in the data utilization. So there's a uh, behavior data, uh, purchase history, uh, the view history of the websites and transaction uh, history. And based on that, recommendations are made for the consumers and contents are offered. And the, the physical stores, where customers are located and what kind of the uh, products the consumers are interested. And there are IoT technologies that can capture such a data. And as you aggregate the data, it can be used for signage and unmanned uh, stores. And when consumers visit the stores, uh, you have a, a good idea what uh, recommendations you can make as a store. So this is all about now here me for the customer's perspective. So if the company can offer such a value, uh, it means that you are adding a value for the customers. So it's all about applying the uh, a whole kinds of different data to the business. And that is the uh, essence of digital transformation. So as you uh, use the data, it is important that 
uh, you know, you are using the data for the businesses. And there are two important points. Uh, one is time to market. So as I said earlier, so uh, you want to offer the right products at the right timing. It means that uh, you should do it for the uh, customers. But at the, se at the same time, when you start a new business, uh, you want to understand what kind of system, what kind of data you need, and you want to have these data and system put in place and available when you need it. And, and this has to be business-driven, uh, not technical-driven. Traditionally, uh, many companies were saying they want to make a good use of IT, but you have to change the mindset. You want to identify what kind of the business businesses you want to uh, engage, and then you identify what kind of the techniques or technologies you need. And by acquiring uh, feedback, uh, you can make an improvement on the technical side. So this is about the reason why you need DevOps or DevSecOps. But uh, when you utilize the data, you don't want to forget security measures because you are handling very important data, uh, data leakage and data quality. These are the uh, very important aspects. When you handle data, uh, there are uh, the, the mistakes uh, made by uh, people and there may be some uh, the attack from external uh, attackers. And when you get the uh, personal information, uh, you have to really think about to what extent you can get the personal information and how you can use it. Uh, and also uh, the amount of the data and quality of the data, they also have to be taken into account. Uh, otherwise, even though you have a massive data, uh, you don't know how to use it. Uh, you don't want to find yourself in such a position. So uh, you have to have a reliability. Otherwise, it will lead to distrust by the customers. And it will lead to reputational risk. And there will be a deterioration of the uh, uh, corporate value. And you may not be able to sustain your business. And you want to have the data utilization uh, foundation. And actually, uh, we have a lot of inquiries in order to uh, think about the, uh, uh, the architecture. Uh, you want to think about how you acquire data, how you process and store the data, and uh, build the models and automate the process and analyze and uh, link in the data. So this is the whole process you want to think about. Let's think about data acquisition, you know, the uh, the core system and from what system you want to get the data to make a real contribution to the business. So these may be the challenges that you may have. And once you acquire the data, uh, you want to think about how much data you want to store and where, and you have to think about the requirement for uh, data storage. When you have more data and then you want to think about the requirement for data mart or performance, how, how much performance you need. So this may be another challenge you may face. And in order to use the data, you want to understand what kind of analysis you want to do. And as you use the environment, are you going to use a cloud environment, on-premise environment? Do you have a robust security or what? you want to do to operations. So you have to think about all these items. So when you start with studying a constellation like this, then you may be late. The, you may not achieve good time to market. And that is the situation you may find yourself in. And that is why uh, we are offering a service as a smart strategic platform. It's called uh, SSP. So this is the, uh, the the service we offer. And in order, these are the challenges to utilize the data in the business. Although you want to utilize the data, but you do not know how to develop the infrastructure uh, and the basis for the data. So these are the realization uh, strategy to utilize DevSec in the uh, 
data in, in the business and uh, what kind of data to be used, what kind of architecture to be adopted and what kind of security countermeasures uh, are we going to introduce and how we manage them. And then uh, we have got the knowledge in all these areas. So uh, utilizing all of those knowledge, uh, we have made a standardization. And uh, based upon this standardization, the uh, uh, functional requirement, non-functional uh, requirement, uh, designing, architecturing, and also testing in the, in the implementation, uh, they have been tested upon the standardization and platform. And, and uh, if you want to have the data analysis uh, environment, as of the introduction, and the after the uh, implementation of the uh, standardized environment, you are able to utilize this platform and and all the testings have been automated therefore and if you are to modify the development environment as of the development timing that you are able to run the similar the same uh, the, uh, testing process and then you'll be able to continuously monitor and supervise the uh, development de development process Okay. That means that the SSP is the data infrastructure with the universal functionality, and that is equipped with the very fast finishing process. And you want to utilize it in the business, but the you want to have when you want it. And in that sense, if you want to utilize the infrastructure for the data, you will be able to get what you want when you want. And in order to utilize the data, then you you, you need to uh, realize the uh, quick uh, action. So from in the agile services, uh, starting from the design to development, and the, all those activities will have to take place very rapidly in the agile fashion. But inside Japan, as you can see, since we've been talking to various kind of countries, but the in order to insource those activities, although they have the IT department inside but that they are not able to develop or even if they are able to develop they have no uh, no management uh, department and or sometimes they don't have the sufficient uh, talent members so oh, the, there are very few uh, companies who have got the uh, internal resources to cover all those areas to it, it is very difficult to, to develop the uh, in-source uh, team so and so to utilize uh, the uh, DX promotion, and the and these are actually becoming the inhibitors. So to you need to have the environment to utilize the data, and the uh, system is not the only solution. But in order to best uh, utilize the data, you need to have the organization, and also you need to have uh, the resources as well uh, for those. As we said in SSP, uh, we are to provide the uh, system environment, but that is not the uh, the thing. Uh, that analysis and also the uh, countermeasures to be taken, all those are included in the Agile team, uh, which provide the services and that needs to be organized. And that's what we are uh, are recommending. And uh, as said, SSP uh, is. Uh, based upon the dev set up and from the development to the management uh, from the system and the, uh, from the application and the engineers are able to utilize all of these and under circumstances where they can utilize all of them yeah they are supposed to use the data and the uh, analyst of the data uh, will use them and and also the account measures will be uh, implemented or will be planned uh, so that's done in the data recycling or reutilization team, uh, which is part of the agile process, and that we'll be able to improve the uh, kind of measure or, or the activity process speed. The, uh, we have got the uh, split and silo or uh, uh, functionalities such as planning or data side of the infrastructure. You've got the uh, silo. Uh, but uh, with the virtual team, you are able to form uh, the team, and it needs it can be run, and you need to have the environment to run. This, and that is very important. And and from the uh, development to implementation, from analysis uh, to implementation, uh, they will be a, uh, uh, they will be covered and. Uh, in in a consistent fashion 
And as a summary, you can see, uh, since we've been talking to various kind of uh, companies and uh, to apply the various kind of data, that is the intrinsic, intrinsic nature of a DX. And to utilize the data, the current customer needs will be extracted and that will have to be applied to your own business right away. And in order to utilize the data, of course, you need to consider the security or data quality that will have to be taken into consideration. And also the data utilization environment needs to be assured. Then you'll be able to focus upon the functionality implementation. Uh, to make it happen, the system is not the only answer, but that the data reutilization must be promoted by uh, forming the agile team involving various kind of stakeholders and, and they promote the data reutilization uh, to be applied to the businesses. And that sort of in source uh, activity would be supported by us. So, I think the brain pad has been taking all those activities. So, and that we and you would like to utilize the data we uh, utilization and that uh, is discussed, uh, incorporating the DevSec up perspective and uh, within a limited amount of time. Thank you very much for uh, being, listening to my presentation. Then I would like to accept several questions. Please submit your questions through the chat. And I have a question while waiting for the others question to be submitted. Since I'm an expert, so I have nothing to ask, but on behalf of the audience, if I may ask one question. And generally speaking, when the service is developed and if you are to cover the security area, I think you are learning and you are understanding the importance now. And the robust intelligence, uh, intelligence made a presentation upon the AI robustness in the early part of the morning session. And uh, they are making the tool to uh, endorse uh, uh, the one of the functionality. And also, as the brain pad is doing, data security is being assured. So maybe data scientists or non engineering data scientists are including them, the uh, development and the speed and the security importance are very understood. And uh, thank you very much. So, specifically from the customers recently, especially in specific data utilization, uh, have you been informed of the incremental uh, data? Uh, utilization risks, or uh, did you see those changes in the market? Yeah, thank you very much for your question. I uh, think data has become uh, so huge that the uh, security countermeasures are being asked by quite a lot of people. And as indicated in my presentation, in the, the data extracted by the system uh, versus the data we can extract from our application, these are the only ones, but uh, there are uh, open data or the data shared uh, uh, through their ties among the companies or the data to be purchased, procured from the outside parties. So it's very easy to acquire data from different sources, but to what extent uh, we should handle the data and how we can maintain and, and how we can uh, maintain the security and what would be the better data and then what kind of communication requirement we should be adopting. Those are the questions and the security countermeasures that people are questioning because of the ever increasing size of the data. So do you see any specific uh, area of the industries uh, who are questioning those questions? I think maybe EC site uh, owners, maybe, and because they have got more and more customers, they have got more and more data from the uh, media outlet. And also the manufacturing companies are asking many questions because they are able to obtain the data through the manufacturing process. Or maybe they want to get the user's voices from the SNS in order to reflect their voices upon their production of manufacturing. Those are the questions raised by those stakeholders. Okay, then in the SSP, what would we like to do in the future? in terms of the uh, development policy or in terms of the evaluation. SSP itself 
uh, is uh, currently called uh, deployed in the AWB and others uh, two major three platforms. So you are able to introduce this. So considering the uh, security cannabis, uh, I think the FISC uh, compliant uh, services or the uh, other services that as, as complied with must be provided and so that the customers will be able to enjoy the best benefits of the security and protection. And SSP is just a system, so they need to have their people or the agile team to be formed inside a company. So this is, we can provide the internal team forming assist and also on the, those other things we are working on right now. Okay, uh, from Rainpad, uh, is there anything you want to uh, promote here? Any solicitation or whatever? Uh, we are, are recruiting quite a lot of people in the engineering and also for the in order to promote the re data recycling, and uh, and also I think uh, we've been. Uh, requested for the implementation of the counter measures, but uh, there are quite a lot of people are asking for the internal insourcing activities. So, so in that sense, that we really would like to have the uh, variety of manpower and human resources to cope with those needs. I think you've been providing the services to their training services, and so you are. Uh, offering the uh, comprehensive services, services uh, uh, which I am a part of. Okay, then anything you want to add? Oh, our company has got the uh, Doors blog, which is our own media, and where I discuss the data governance or the analysis uh, tools. Uh, utilization, uh, they are picked up in my seminars, or, or sometimes I actually uh, share my blog articles. So, so I'm going to cut and paste the uh, dwarfs uh, link. So, so, so I just uh, let, let me know the link, then I will cut and paste in uh, YouTube. So please support us well next year once again, the same event. Thank you very much. Then. Once again, we'd like to have a short break. And afterwards, uh, uh, from the uh, 35 minutes past four, Maria Platt is to be invited from UK to have his presentation. So we're going to resume from uh, four th we're going to have a break up until 4.35. デブセックオプスデイズ東京はデブセックオプスを推進するためのコミュニティ活動に賛同してくださる多くの企業団体から支援を受けていますプラチナスポンサー NRI Secure Technologies GMO Cyber Security by Yerae Silver Sponsor HRD Profiles Startup Sponsor Robust Intelligence Richelka Security Koen America Taishkan Keizai Sangyo Show 総務省、文部科学省、デジタル庁、サイバーセキュリティ戦略本部、カーネギーメロン大学ソフトウェアエンジニアリングインスティテュート、カーネギーメロン大学サイラボ、コグニティブCTF。世界から届いた食材が彩るディナーテーブル約束の場所に時間通り安全に到着する交通機関どこでも安心して受けられる医療や薬遠く離れて暮らす家族に送る誕生日のプレゼントその日常は人や物をつなぐ仕組みで支えられている。お客様と社会とそして。
世界中に広がる仲間とともに新しい仕組みを作りつないできた世界は常に変化を続け時には想像もしなかった困難を私たちに突きつける必要なのは何ができるかではなく何をすべきか社会があるべき姿とは何か次の世代にも続く本当に豊かな暮らしとは何かそれを見つめ私たちは行動する NTT データ「ビッグデータ」や AI 技術が脚光を浴びるデータの時代がやってきた巨大企業もベンチャー企業もデータを大きな経営資源と捉えビジネスに取り入れようとしています15年以上前からデータ活用の可能性をまっすぐに信じてきた私たち今こそ一緒にデジタルトランスフォーメーションで開けるドアがたくさんあると思うのです持続可能な未来につながる扉成長し続けるできること広がるデータ分析の民主化最適な意思決定挑戦できる未来ささやかな幸せにあふれた日常あの成長ですときめく顧客体験を磨き続ける世界<笑>豊かな社会意味のある仕事を作る誰もがビジョンにチャレンジできる誰も想像できない大きな成功イントゥリアンの目からウルコの瞬間を提供する製造の矛盾化子供たちの未来メーカーかけるワクワクイコール未来できたらいいなを形に仲間の笑顔が未来の笑顔を作る未来は作るものだというふうに考えているので仕事を通じて新しい価値をですね想像すればですね日本がまだまだですね成長できる面白い機会を作ることができると思っているので、えー、かなり広範囲のビジネスをですね僕らはご支援できるんじゃないかなというふうに思っています世界を守る。テクノロジーは常に進化するインターネットが人々の間に広く普及し始めてからさまざまな技術が加速度的に進化し派生し広がった気がつけば私たちの暮らしは便利さという名のもとで大きく様変わりしてきたテクノロジーをどう使うかそれはその人間自身に委ねられる人はいつの時代も人が作り出した矛盾にとらわれている善か悪か勝つか負けるか傷つけるのか守り抜くのかそのパラドックスに常に挑んでいる今やビジネスだけではなく日常生活においても IT の力が不可欠になり全てがネットワークでつながる時代24時間365日社会全体が常に IT の引き起こすリスクと向き合わなければならない時代の変化を見極め新たな知識を蓄え培ってきた技術と経験によって決して負けられない戦いに挑み続けていく恐れずに進もうあなたの揺るぎない意志がこれからの時代を守っていくその仕事で人類の豊かさを確かなものにしていくんださあプロフェッショナルとしての誇りを胸にこの社会を前進させていこうその意思が世界を守る NRI セキュアテクノロジーズ「コグニティブ CTF」は誰でも楽しく。セキュリティを考慮したプログラミングが学べるゲーミフィケーションプラットフォームですすでにソフトウェアエンジニアとして活躍している方もプログラミングに興味のある中学生、高校生、大学生でもどなたでもゲーム感覚でお楽しみいただけますコグニティブ CTF は政府機関の研究開発プロジェクトとしてコグニティブリサーチラボと東京大学京都大学が共同開発しました
軍事大国の現役サイバー兵士が取り組むような難易度の高いものから初めてプログラミングを学ぶ中高生の初心者の方でも楽しめるものまで多様な問題を取り揃えていますコグニティブ CTF に取り組むことで基本的なコーディングスキル暗号解読フォレンジクスリバースエンジニアリングバイナリ解析などに関する問題を解きながらハッカーとしてのスキルを向上することができます悪意を持ったハッカーがどのように攻撃してくるかについての知識がなければソフトウェアの安全と安心を保つことはできません現代はあらゆるソフトウェア開発者にハッカーとしてのスキル習得が必要になっているのですぜひあなたも一度コグニティブ CTF でハッカーとしての腕前を試して楽しくスキルアップしてみませんか QR コードを読み取ってぜひ参加登録をお願いしますどなたでも無料でお楽しみいただけます「インターネットの発展は私たちの生活を便利に豊かに変えました」。今では水やガス、電気と同じくらい生活に欠かせない重要なインフラです会社や学校、病院、銀行や工場ありとあらゆる場所とシステムがインターネットにつながっていますそんなインターネットがサイバー攻撃の脅威にさらされているなんてあってはならないと私たちは考えます私たちはサイバー攻撃で使われる脆弱性や攻撃手法を日々研究していますその結果なんと直近1年間で約30件のゼロデイの脆弱性を発見しました私たちは悪意あるハッカーが攻撃するよりもずっと前にお客様のシステムのセキュリティホールを見つけてご報告します私たちはこれまで先進的なセキュリティ技術を研究し知識を共有してきました私たちはこれからも企業とシステムを利用する全ての人をサイバー攻撃から守ります目に見えない脅威から暮らしを守る日本を守る全ての人に安心と安全なインターネット HRD グループは科学的なアプローチで人事や組織の改革を強力に支援しています今多くの企業がデジタルトランスフォーメーションに取り組んでいるのではないでしょうかデジタルテクノロジーを活用することにより営業やマーケティングの見直し業務プロセスの自動化がさまざまな企業で実現されていますでは人材や組織に関してはどうでしょう一人一人の才能や個性に合わせた適材適所の実現や効果的なコミュニケーションの実践はデジタル化とは無縁の勘と経験に頼っているのが現状ではないでしょうかこのような、ちゃんと経験に頼ってきた人事や組織の課題もデータにより解決する時代になってきています私たちの提供するディスクとプロファイル XT は科学的検証に裏打ちされた人材測定ツールです一人一人のモチベーションの源泉やそのポテンシャルを見出すことで組織や人材の課題を解決します全世界でこれまでに6000万人10万社日本でもこれまで120万人以上の顧客が効果を実感しているソリューションですこれからのデジタル時代の企業における改革の本質は人と組織のトランスフォーメーションにあると私たちは考えています HRD グループのディスクとプロファイル XT が組織や人材の改革を可能にします効果的なコミュニケーションによる組織力向上に興味のある方はディスクで社内の適材適所の実現や人材のポテンシャルを見出すことに興味のある方はプロファイル XT で検索してぜひ一度ホームページからお問い合わせください
、えー、では、えー、休憩が終わりましたので。Now, uh, we finished the break. I would like to move on to the next session, but. Well, this is the second time that we got the trouble. The next uh, presenter, um, who was the uh, Mario Platt uh, son, he has not arrived here yet. And I am contacting him, but they're wondering what is happening. Uh, we are going to change the order. What was supposed to start from five after five? We would like to uh, do the um, Mr. Nicholas Shannon's uh, presentation and waiting for uh, Mr. Mario to arrive. He is uh, from the UK and it is uh, 7 30 in the morning. My engineers, uh, they um, stay uh, late uh, up until late at night. Uh, maybe he might uh, not uh, wake up um, yet. Or maybe something um, bad is not hopefully happening in any case. Uh, uh, not able to contact him, uh, therefore, uh, sorry about that. We are going to change the order, the uh, Nicholas Shannon session to start. Okay, we, we are going to introduce uh, Nick. And then I think it's been three years in a row for him. And then let me just briefly introduce him. He is uh, in charge of the Air Force and the Space Forces. And he used to be the chief software engineer for the uh, US Air Force and also US Space Force. So he was the, the very first software chief of these two military ent entities. And the uh, Kyle Fox used to serve for the US Air Force and also he uh, was uh, in charge of the DevSec Ops uh, for the uh, uh, ballistic missile or and the nuclear bombs and so forth. And the uh, Nick uh, used to promote the overall uh, modernization in conjunction with Kyle Fox, he said, in those entities, he said. So that's his profile. And he's the uh, initial uh, Air Force Chief uh, Software Officer. And also, and he has got the Chief Software Officer uh, was a title given for the first time in the US government. And there are several other Chief Software Officers, but he was the very first guy who was titled. And it's been three years in a row. Uh, to attend this session, so you know his name if you attend this session in the past years. And now, and we uh, invite the Nick, and, and he is going to introduce the theme how the uh, US uh, defense uh, organization has shifted into the uh, DevSecOps. Everybody, I'm so excited to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. <clears throat> Today, we're going to be sharing a little bit of the story behind the uh, Department of Defense adopting DevSecOps. It's going to be an interesting discussion, I think. Uh, we're going to share some numbers with you so you can see what sticks, what works, what scales. Um, so, you know, with that, let's get started. So, why does DevSecOps matter? Well, first, we need to go back to the timeliness aspect of this. and to be able to move at a pace of relevance, both in terms of competing, in terms of your business, but also in terms of cybersecurity, you need to be able to fail fast, learn fast, but don't fail twice for the same reasons. And so you're gonna need to be able to learn and do that in a controlled fashion. Uh, and, and failing must be uh, you know, something that you uh, are ready to do. Otherwise, you're not gonna be able to uh, move fast and you're not gonna be able to learn and you're gonna see more or more of the, the same. So. Really, it's the foundation of the future of your velocity uh, for many different things, including cloud, software innovation, uh, AI machine learning adoption, uh, how to scale, and uh, how to be flexible as well. Of course, for us in the DoD, uh, we cannot be left behind. You know, China, Russia, North Korea, uh, they are massively adopting DevSecOps. And it's really the only way to build software in 2022. And... Uh, in one year, uh, back in uh, 2020, <clears throat> deploying DevSecOps, the Department of Defense saved about uh, 100 years of time. So it's a mind-boggling number, uh, really, with 27 DoD programs. On average, we save between 12 to 18 months of time per program, per uh, five-year cycle for what we call the continuous authority to operate, to continuously accredit the system and release multiple times a day. And then, you know, when it comes to the continuous feedback loop, um, we saved 12, uh, 8 to 18 months of time per program per five-year cycle. 
that's really enabling your fast feedback loop. So, you know, you're not building software in a vacuum with your end users. So, um, for us, of course, we also had to bring the hardware loop testing, uh, to be able to have a real, uh, digital replica, what we call a digital twin of the system we're building. So we know exactly how the system is going to behave, uh, before we even bending metal. So let's look at some numbers, right? Um, and why does DevSecOps matter? Well, we've seen 106 faster um, lead time from uh, development to production, uh, 208 faster uh, um, code deployment. Uh, we saw uh, a seven times less uh, failure rate, 22% uh, less time spent on uh, rework, 50% less time spent on uh, remediating cyber issues, uh, a mind boggling 2,600 time faster recovery, mean time to recover, uh, particularly important, obviously for weapon systems. And then, you know, development costs are reduced by 40% on average. So you can do more for the same amount of money. Um, and then you see, uh, employees being 2.2 times more likely, uh, to recommend the organization as well. So that's a pretty, uh, great, uh, capability to be able to attract and also retain, uh, talent as well. And, and we know how difficult it is to, to find uh, people right now. So, uh, you know, the move we're doing really is, is this waterfall to DevSecOps. And if you look at, uh, the logical process, you know, of course, <clears throat> went through agile, that then DevSecOps moving from monolithic architectures to microservices, uh, often physical servers to, uh, uh virtual Ooh. machine and now, you know, containers, and then, you know, uh, hosted to clouds, but for us, it really means cloud native. So that means also running on, uh, you know, weapon systems at the edge. And so, you know, it's not just, uh, clouds, it's also cloud native environments. And, and for us, that includes, you know, being able to run, uh, these, uh, uh, Kubernetes stack on top of, uh, uh, technologies that are of often 50, 60, 70 years old. So that's something, uh, interesting to keep in mind. Uh, so let's look at, at one of the case study that was really kind of the beginning of the story here back in 2019, you're comparing, uh, you know, SpaceX back then and, and F-35, uh, SpaceX has nine vehicles, F-35 has one with several variants, um, developers. Uh, uh, SpaceX at the time at 200, um, 4,000 for Lockheed with F-35. Um, SpaceX was very modular and containerized. And so that enables reuse of code between the nine platforms. So 80% of the code is shared between the nine platforms and uh, only 4% of code is shared between F-22s and F-35, for example. So it's really despicable. And you will see also a 50% defect rate. Uh, so that effectively meant that 2000 of the developers were completely useless. Um, and looking at the velocity now, SpaceX was able to uh, release software the day before the launch, now hours before the launch with uh, 17,000 build of software a day, 300 loop testing a day, and of course, um, uh, fully containerized. And that has the full ability to automate the testing of the software updates on the hardware three times a day to make sure they're not breaking anything that's critical. What you see here also when it comes to, um, F-35, of course, is an average release cycle between, you know, one to, uh, seven year on average. So that's, uh, uh, that's not a lot. So, um, that tells you kind of the importance of modularity and flexibility and reuse. The first thing we've done in 2019 in 45 days, we put Kubernetes and East on F-16 jets. Uh, on the legacy hardware, something that used to run Ada and C now would run Python, Go and, and Java, for example. And that was a great demonstration that, hey, we can do this on legacy systems as well. And then we moved to 2020 and 2021. That's where we realized, hey, you know, um, we can now make this the default for all Air Force and Space Force programs. And so we, we took another example, the U2 uh, jet, which is even older than the F-16. And we were able to not only put the DevSecOps stack with Kubernetes and Istio uh, on the on the jet, but we also were able to do that in 12 days, and uh, we were able to fly the jet. Uh, but more importantly, we created AI machine learning uh, containers to be able to automate the management of the sensors. Those sensors used to be managed by the pilot. Now they can be managed by the AI machine learning, um, and we were able to demonstrate receiving over the air update of the containers with no impact to the airworthiness of the aircraft. So decoupling the flight control and the sensor management, if you will, 
of the aircraft. So that was a massive uh, win as well. Um, when you look at uh, the, the DevSecOps layers, we kind of cut it in um, you know, layers by separating and decoupling things to be able to run our DevSecOps stack anywhere from the edge to a cloud, to a classified cloud, to a, to a jet bomber space system, nuclear system. And so the infrastructure layer is separated. Um, then we, we put on top the, the platform layer with Kubernetes. We had multiple distributions of Kubernetes we could run on top of it. And then we completely containerize our uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery, CI/CD pipeline. Um, and that really gives us the ability to treat it as cattle and, and move fast. You'll see about that as well. Um, about a thousand containers now uh, in terms of different capabilities we can run on top of uh, Kubernetes. And then we put the service mesh on top to be able to get uh, uh, Istio with uh, the full enforcement mode uh, to uh, really enforce uh, zero trust. That effectively gave us at the application layer an inheritance about 90% of the NIST cybersecurity controls. And so, uh, you know, the team can now focus on, on, uh, on, uh, on that, on the, the Delta instead of, uh, uh, you know, having to do the entire cyber stack. And as you can see on the left here, we have this uh, continuous monitoring stack that uh, uses uh, what we call the sidecar container security stack, which is really a bunch of uh, capability that are running often as a sidecar container on Kubernetes, completely automated and injected by Kubernetes, regardless if the, the development teams is thinking about it, uh, to get centralized logs and telemetry and monitoring and enforcement of zero trust uh, with also uh, behavior prevention. We'll talk about that as well. So if you look at the one example of a DevSecOps stack, and again, keep in mind, we have a thousand plus containers. So this is just a tiny uh, you know, piece of the puzzle here. Uh, obviously we have a lot of uh, different options, uh, but you can see here, we have quite a, a lot of tools. And so, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna need to orchestrate that across dev test staging and prod and for us across multiple classification levels. So that's obviously a problem. If you're running these as virtual machines, there's going to be drifts, there's going to be uh, differences. If you want to completely have the same environment across classification levels and, and development environments, you don't want any drift and you want to, you want to have full GitOps automation of everything. And so we embrace the concept of GitOps and infrastructure as code, configuration as code to be able to automate the entire process from A to Z, uh, to instantiate a replica of the stack. And so uh, that really gives us um, the insurance that there is no drift between environments. So that was a, a big win running all these as containers on top of Kubernetes. All right, so now we'll talk about the three modern cyber uh, posture pillows. Um, there are, uh, you know, different concepts around it, but uh, uh, the first pillow is about what we call moving target defense. What that means is really, uh, you know, we treat everything as cattle. So for people that don't know what the difference is between cattle versus pet, you know, a pet is a virtual machine. You give it a name, you care for it, you heal it when it's uh, uh, sick, and uh, you're going you're gonna to save it and uh, try to keep it up and running. Uh, versus cattle, you know, is uh, a container and you go behind the barn and you shoot it many times a day to go back to your mutable state. So you're not attached to it. You don't give it a name. It's numbers and it moves fast. And so, you know, for us, the goal to be really resilient and prevent malicious actor to retain a foothold into a stack and potentially laterally move to the crown jewels, um, we want to have the entire stack treated as cattle. And so you'll see here, um, everything is immutable every four hours, we kill the containers and the stack. But ideally, you want to have your entire stack being treated as cattle, maybe only your load balancers would not be. Uh, but your entire stack, including your platform layer, Kubernetes, the nodes, and so on, uh, can be completely killed regularly and go back to your mobile state. Uh, so that ensures you have no drift between your code and your production environment runtime. And so everything is uh, everything has code, no human in production, no drift in production. GitOps is the foundation. Your source code becomes your crown jewel. Um, we pull, we don't push. That means the production and staging environment pull from Git multiple uh, times, you know, per per minute or whatever, and uh, it's not that that ensures that uh, uh, you know the CI/CD pipeline does not have the keys to your staging and production environment to mitigate cyber threat. 
Uh, so it's a pull, not a push. So that's the first uh, pit up. Move, moving target defense, cattle, uh, go back to immutable state, kill things regularly. That that really uh, prevents malicious actor to to move laterally between um, you know your your dev environments and your production environments. But also, once in a production environments, they have a tough time retaining their their um, access because we kill it every four hours, so they lose everything they've done every four hours and go back to uh, immutable state. So. The second uh, poster uh, is the uh, pillow uh, of the modern cyber poster is zero trust, and zero trust kind of became this bloated thing, um, and it's it's you know it's a struggle for people to understand what it means. So going back to you know when we created, um, you know with uh, the work we've done both you know with Google and the, in the software um, alliance with uh, software defined parameter and SDP, right, and, and uh, my work at uh, the Department of Homeland Security, we really had in mind the key aspect of, of, of the enforcement here. Um, first is a device, right? So we have device enforcement. What really that means is we're looking at the, the state of the device, the patching levels, what endpoint protection is using, if it's running, you know, a mobile uh, device management for mobile devices, and so on, right? So that's that's kind of the device enforcement piece. We assign a, a, a strong identity per device, so we know you know who you who use what device. And then um, the second aspect is, of course, the the strong identities when it comes to people, uh, person entities, and non person entities uh, for systems and microservices. And so, you know, this is very important. Obviously, a lot of people forget about systems and having short lived uh, certificates to be able to authenticate on a need to know basis um, is essential. The third pillar uh, of zero trust is the data centricity with uh, labeling and micro segmentation down, down to the uh, cell level. So for example, for us, the, the who could be top secret, but the what would be secret. And, and so in the, in the same object, you could have fields that are labeled and you only get to see the labels you're supposed to be able to see. Uh, based on the component risk of the uh, identity of the user and what he's supposed to have or she is supposed to have access to, and then um, of course on the device uh, state as well. So the device state, based on the device I'm using, if I'm using a personal device versus a government-approved device, I don't get access to the same things. And so there is a what we call a, a dedicated uh, software-defined parameter a per device user uh, combo, and so. Um, it's not software defined networking. We use a concept called uh, a segment of one, which is micro segmentation, where each, like I said, device and user combo gets a dedicated network and they cannot laterally move to things they're not supposed to be able to see. They cannot even scan the network. They, they cannot see what's not already whitelisted in that uh, segment of one. So it really reduced the attack surface, reduced the ability of a malicious actor to move laterally to the crown jewel. On top of that, you know, we're going to use the service mesh to prevent lateral movements by enforcing uh, east, west, north, north south uh, traffic down to the container level. So, uh, you know, with Kubernetes and, and, and Istio as a service mesh, we can uh, whitelist container A and it's stuck to, to B and so on. And so it's very granular and precise. So that limits the ability if a managed actor gets access to one of the container to move uh, to, to another container that's not whitelisted. And then, of course, with the moving target defense, every four hours we kill the container, so they lose everything they would have done. So it's harder for them to elevate privileges and get to the control as well. So let's look at the third pillar of modern cyber posture now, a uh, very essential piece of the runtime piece, which is uh, the continuous monitoring with behavior prevention. And so we, um, we must enforce that prevention by using uh, runtime capabilities, looking at behavior drift between um, you know normal behavior and new behavior down to the container level and so it's very granular and precise and uh, looking at uh, things like commands being run data being exfiltrated ports being open that's never been opened before and so we kill the container when we see that go back to immutable state and alert the team and, and, and that's a really uh, powerful uh, mitigation um, that's a SEC of DevSecOps. A lot of people don't know. Uh, SEC is not just, hey, I'm going to do some static dynamic analysis on my on my uh, DevSecOps pipeline. 
Uh, the SEC is a runtime security. Effectively, your DevSecOps stack runs in production. Uh, Kubernetes Istio is the foundation of your orchestration. And then, of course, you're going to have the runtime, continuous scanning and monitoring, not just of CV scanning, but more importantly, of those uh, behavior uh, detection and prevention capabilities to see what's going on in, in runtime. And then we add on top of that, uh, the enforcement of provenance and integrity of the containers uh, by using, you know, uh, checksums for integrity and, and signing uh, containers for provenance. So we know exactly where they come, came from, which pipeline, and so on. So all of this is obviously a lot of information, very complex, very technical. You know, a lot of people say, hey, you know, uh, tech is easy, culture is hard. I don't agree with that. I think people that say that often are not technical and they don't understand the the complexity of the technology. In fact, I would argue that uh, culture is hard because tech is hard and because you have to reinvent yourself. Uh, people struggle with that and they have a tough time doing it and it, it makes the adoption even harder. So so diminishing the, the complexity of tech makes no sense. That's why for us, you know, continuous learning was essential. We have a hundred thousand people we need to train. To train. So, you know, continuous learning was the, the key. And so we created, a, a created curriculums you go on software that they have that mail slash training, you, you'll find that. Uh, and then of course, uh, you know, we released also on Learn with Nick, uh, we release new videos every week and new content. So we have a lot of great content looking at culture and, um, you know, technologies like, you know, DevSecOps, Kubernetes, you know, uh, container or service mesh and so on. So it's, it's very um, short and sweet videos. You know, it, it's even stuff that could be used for managers that want to be, you know, dangerous enough to know what they're talking about. But you know, without struggling to understand what's what's uh, being described, uh, uh, but it's 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 very powerful in terms of really understanding the bigger picture and uh, the challenges in adopting all these technologies as part of a, a large organization and how to get you know people to um, you know embrace the idea of change and learning and 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 things like that. Uh, the other piece is, you know, in investing in learning. Uh, we gave an hour a day to our people to learn. So, um, you know, whether it's, you know, you're getting 30 minutes from the company and 30 minutes on your own time. The fact is you need to invest in yourself. You know, people spend so much time uh, doing other things that are, uh, you know, quite quite frankly, a, a waste of time. So invest in yourself, do it right, you know, and spend the time. And get the right certifications. You know, there are a lot of great CNCF certifications. There are not just those certifications like in cyber where you just read a book and you get lucky and you, you, you know, you can answer questions and pass without really knowing much uh, practically about the subject. So, you know, that's something to think about when it comes to uh, certificates, the uh, CNCF uh, certified Kubernetes application developer, uh, certified Kubernetes security specialist, uh, certified Kubernetes administrator, and uh, the T-Trait um, certified Istio administrator for, for, for Istio uh, are great uh, options to really demonstrate not just that you uh, you read books and stuff, but you actually can do the things you're talking about here. And that's just great value. And honestly, there are nothing like this on the market. So, you know, that's something to, to think about if you wanna, if you wanna get certificates that will really uh, validate your expertise. All right, so now let's take a look at uh, really what it takes to run an enterprise DevSecOps team in a large organization. We created the team called Platform One, which is really this enterprise team that's providing services back to the development teams. And, and what we try to do is to bring both free services that can just bring the foundation of DevSecOps, but also pay-per-use services, right? Because if you act as a as almost like a startup in the government, you want to not be too bloated. You want to grow with that option, but you want to have the foundation to be able to build capabilities that will be accessible in terms of uh, speed and pricing, right, to the uh, uh, DoD teams. And so we created first repo one, which is a source code repo, kind of the GitLab repo with all the container source code and pasteurized code, Kubernetes distribution and so on. Everything is on repo one. So, you know, we contributed the largest contribution back to open source from a government standpoint. So if you want to check it out, uh, go on repo1.dso.mil and you'll be able to see all of the source code of, of Platform One or most of the source code of the key capabilities behind the DevSecOps team at Platform One. Uh, the other uh, uh, team that we created is Iron Bank. It's effectively kind of the Docker hub of uh, DoD with hardened containers. Uh, it's using the 
uh, you know, it's called the DoD Centralized Artifact Repository Iron Bank, and uh, we have a, a thousand plus containers there. We harden, sign, and uh, scan containers, look at the risk, and and then provide it back to uh, industry. And so you'll find on ironbank.dso.mail the ability to to even see all that and and download the containers as well. It's all open source. Of course, you have to pay the licenses for the commercial products, but um, you know this is all. Uh, hardened containers for both open source and and some many many uh, commercial products as well. So those were free services we provided to the teams. The next services we brought is Big Bang. Big Bang is our DevSecOps platform. Is Kubernetes with um, a lot of the baked in security settings. We talk about the service mesh and you know things to uh, really enforce security in terms of continuous monitoring, the sidecar stack. Uh, runtime uh, security and and so on. Um, it comes as a modular stack, so people can reuse it. It's also open source; you can reuse it. You can also contribute uh, your containers back to Big Bang to be able to uh, maybe sell your capabilities to uh, the Department of Defense. So this is a very uh, flexible and uh, turnkey DevSecOps option to run anywhere from a cloud standpoint to on-premise. And to for us, you know, weapon systems as well. Then we have Polybus. Polybus is an instantiation of that uh, uh, Big Bang stack as a service run by Platform One that's reserved for DoD teams, so where they can pay, uh, you know, a, a fee per per developer per per month and get access to uh, Polybus to be able to um, really access a turnkey or really accredited uh, DevSecOps environment, so they can deploy and have a full stack um, hosted at different classification levels uh, with what we call a continuous uh, authority to operate, to be able to release software multiple times a day. Uh, the average now is 21 times a day on, on Teams on Platform 1, which is pretty good. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a multi-tenant environment, kind of the SaaS service with dev, uh, test, and production. So that kind of gives you a little bit of insight. You know, we, we have a lot of dedicated videos on Learn with Nick about how we deploy all these uh, uh, capabilities and give you more detail and architecture details as well on how to do that yourself. If you uh, want to learn more about DevSecOps and innovation in general, we have a show every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern uh, where we have guests and uh, you know great people showing up to share with us a little bit of insight on their work, whether it's uh, you know government officials all the way to you know CEOs of different companies. That are building, you know, technology uh, products, and so check it out. Uh, we also on, on LinkedIn and YouTube, at YouTube.com/slash Nicolas Chelon. Um, and then, you know, learn with Nick, learn with you, You'll find all these created videos and uh, a lot of culture information, a lot of um, you know, cybersecurity step-by-step uh, -step guidance on zero trust and, and things like that. Um, you also see on the software.lab.mil.com. Uh, software.dev.mil slash DSOP slash documents page, you're going to find architectural documents and a lot of uh, deep dives uh, in the, the tech stack we talked about today. And on the software.dev.mil slash training, you're going to find also a lot of training content. Uh, Repo One, Iron Bank, and Registry One, which is uh, just a, a harbor um, to access the Iron Bank registry. Um, so you, you can find these and, and go connect. If you want to create an account, uh, it's free. Anyone can create an account. Uh, you just have to go to login.dso.mil and register and create an account. So with that, I hope this was uh, useful and that, uh, you know, you were able to learn uh, something today. Uh, you know, of course, if you have always any questions, you can always reach out to uh, to us and wanted to thank you uh, for all the time. And, um, you know, I hope we were able to prove that uh, if the Department of Defense can move to DevSecOps with massive amount of legacy and complexity and, and safety and airworthiness risk, uh, so can you and, and pretty much any company can do that if the largest behemoth of the world with 4 million employees and 800 billion of, fu of funding a year uh, has been able to, to get there, uh, so can you. So uh, stay safe and uh, uh, thanks for the time. Thank you, uh, Nicholas. So he is on a business trip, so he joined the event with the video. So, so run with Nick, the uh, Nicholas talked about during the video. So it is a video where you can learn DevSecOps. So in a chat, 
you have the, the link, you see the link. So please check, check out the link. And please hold on. I would like to introduce Run with Nick video. So, so I can uh, look at the, uh, the contents uh, because uh, I, I have the uh, authentication. There are 44 sessions, and this is the video for developers, and there are videos for operators, uh, site recovery engineering operators, and a video for uh, uh, cybersecurity experts, CISOs. There are 44 sessions, a whole kinds of the videos. So it talks about what the DevSecOps is, and this is one example. And there's another video about micro learning. So you will find a wide range of contents, uh, how to videos. The, so how, how maturity should be measured. So there are 44 contents like this, and it continues to grow. And yes, you have to pay for the service. But uh, I have a coupon code, which is uh, Tokyo2022, uh, the capital letters, and you will get 40% discount. So this is only available for the participants of DevSecOps Tokyo. So that is a presentation by Nicholas. Uh, thank you. So uh, the, the, the defense department has uh, the massive uh, budget, but uh, they were able to move to uh, DevSecOps. And he said that uh, if DOD can do it, you can do it. If you need more information, uh, you can uh, check out Learn with Nick and other contents. Thank you. Now, Mario Platt, Platt has arrived. Well, actually, he was late because of some uh, trouble. Hi there. Hi there. So how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. So we have uh, about uh, um, 1,600 registrants, and there's still concurrently uh, about 200 people are viewing uh, this session. And mm -hmm. I heard you're talking about uh, how to make up the great team in the DevSecOps. You know, sometimes their uh, DevSecOps is misunderstood, like, uh, oh, Dev DevSecOps is about only the cyber cybersecurity specialist wants to um, say something to the developers team or something, you know, those misunderstanding. And then anyway, the team collaboration is required. So in that right. context, I, I heard you're talking about such team structure and a culture and, and such things. And the other sessions, uh, other um, speakers also touch with the importance of the culture and, and also team and talent and an organization and such things. So um, I believe you will, uh, you know, audience will learn a lot from the, from you. No, thank you. Um, should I share my screen? Yes, please. Yep, I can do it now. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much for, uh, for having me. Um, my name is Mario Platt. Um, I'm um, uh, the Director of Governance, Risk and Compliance for, uh, for Security and Privacy at LastPass. Um, and I'll be talking today about um, uh, how to evolve security in, uh, in your context. Um, so the motivation on why I created this talk to begin with was um, sometimes we take um, too much of a generic approach, uh, the kind of chasing capabilities um, in our DevSecOps journey, um, if you can call it that. Um, and I thought it's um, sometimes useful, uh, based on my experience, um, to think of a few archetypes uh, and how they relate with security and use that as a driver to what we call DevSecOps. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about here. Um, so I've been working in security for about 20 years. I started as a penetration tester and product security tester uh, back in the late 90s. I've done more than 10 years of engineering, um, and I've been mostly focusing on governance, risk, and compliance since about 2014. Um, so I've been uh, helping uh, this model that you'll hear about today. Uh, is a combination of um, uh, my experience consulting with companies of different sizes, all the way from government to companies with 10 people, and uh, some of the patterns that I've uh, identified by working with, uh, with these teams. So 
do we even want to uh, DevSecOps? Um, so there are usually two schools of thought on this uh, with regards to um, DevSecOps and the, even the security industry, how the security industry sees DevSecOps. Um, so all of these are people that I highly respect um, and, uh, and I agree with all of them. So, but they usually fall in one of two camps, right? Those advocating uh, for DevSecOps, and they usually have arguments um, talking about the collaboration between the different teams, and there's something as a point in need, right? Uh, whilst the engineering teams are building uh, security into their practices. Um, so there are also those that are less impressed uh, by the use of um, DevSecOps, um, and they seem to focus their arguments on the, the possibility of, of getting siloed, right? Uh, that it's, it will still be another team dealing with the security thing, and that it's obviously, as usual, it's um, a word that the marketing has picked up, so everyone's using um, the word DevSecOps, whether they're doing it or not. Um, and also uh, about fear in relation to their current role identities. Right? Uh, people that don't like the use of DevSecOps tend to have those um, kind of concerns um, that they want security to be in the hand of people that are building things, not necessarily in a governance function that lives far away from um, uh, uh, completely detached from um, uh, where that ownership um, of, of developing code sits. So in order to talk about it, um, I developed this um, DevOps security archetype model. Um, so this was, as I mentioned, built on uh, exploration with my peers in, the, in consulting with organizations, um, small, big government, um, uh, many different ones, uh, and also how understanding how the security unicorns, so the, the companies that, do secure, that seem to do security really well, uh, how they approach it, how they do it differently. So in this model, we have uh, three basic archetypes. So we have Dave, uh, the rainbow maker. Um, and um, basically Dave is measured uh, how in rewarded on delivering features, right, in stable platforms. And so he overall has a, a focus on speed, right, but also stability because he's the one being on call when things go wrong. Um, so they've got a natural incentive for things not to, uh, not to break. Um, so he wants to ensure that he can support the business in making money um, and the helping um, is going to try to remove any impediments uh, to that speed, to that development speed. Um, so obviously he's not paid to do things in a reckless way, but sometimes that's what it happens because of the, um, uh, of the pressures and constraints that they're under. Um, so Rick, he's a reference to how most people outside of compliance tend to perceive control functions. Um, and security still has a big kind of um, reputation for being the department of, uh, of saying no, right? Um, and they tend to usually create policies and procedures uh, that um, uh, uh, Rick expects to be adhered to at all times uh, to keep the organization compliant to a standard uh, or to be able to evidence due diligence when our clients ask us questions or the regulators. Um, so, um, the problem with that is that usually that guidance that um, that they provide doesn't really is not contextualized. It's largely uh, good good or best practices, and that uh, sometimes they don't do the work of trying to translate uh, and translate that into the organization. And um, so they don't really understand business operations, right? Because they usually live far away from it. And so Rick, uh, he's measured and rewarded for identifying and managing non-compliances on passing audits uh, successfully, and generally for avoiding bad outcomes, right? If um, uh, we don't have many audit points, then usually uh, it's perceived that um, uh, Rick has done a good job. So their focus uh, of this archetype is largely around um, equality. But the, the problem is that it's usually a biased and very, very narrow view of what quality is right um, and finally we have Stu um, is the, the the top of this model um, so it's a reference to those uh, companies and individuals that have good embedded security practices in their engineering process and so they have both ownership and agency so they feel like they're in control they can make decisions about it um, over what security looks like in their product and how much they do it. Um, and that's uh, how we're holding them accountable. So security is generally perceived as another element of the quality assurance uh, practices, um, as is performance, as is cost, and any other metrics that they are measured on. Um, and security is never something that someone else does for them, right? It's something that, it's, that they perceive as part of their work, 
Right? So they, what they've ensured is that uh, quality and speed are um, uh, not mutually exclusive, uh, but they are mutually supportive. Right? And the, the faster they can do more testing, the faster they can do um, can develop more software. Um, the more they are, they have also the assurance that it's being done to the to the standard that they expect and require. So what we're going to do now is um, have a look at all of the of the um, uh, archetypes with a bit more detail in the, how can we help uh, the organizations like this. So usually uh, organizations around uh, rainbow makers they tend to have a similar set of challenges and the organizations that work a bit more like uh, like rick like the gatekeeper they tend to have particular challenges that tend to be uh, relatively um uh, stable uh, or uh, expectable um so a big part of how the rainbow makers are perceived by the uh, by the gatekeepers um is um, claims that they're negligent, right? So they don't care about security, but it really fails to realize that no developer creates insecure code deliberately. No one comes in the morning and say, I want to write bad or um, insecure code. So we should assume that people mean well and that they are producing the best quality artifacts with the current knowledge that they possess, right? The visibility they have in generally the constraints on their work Right? Uh, such as uh, how much um, security capabilities can I have immediately available to me, um, the culture in terms of uh, how we they make sacrifice decisions when they're choosing between A and B. So all of those things relate to, to the challenges that they face. Um, so what they really have is a lack of situational, situational awareness right, with regards to the security of the things that they are producing. Right? And this is mainly a process and a social practice problem Right, and failing, potentially failing to account for the cognitive load uh, of what is already a difficult practice of developing good software. And it's those uh, that are failing them. It's not them failing organizations. It's usually these things failing uh, these people. So usually they have um, a, a standard set of, uh, of challenges that I tend to find. Uh, one of them is that they usually don't have uh, security telemetry integrated. So they don't have the tools that would tell them that there, uh, there are some vulnerabilities that they should be doing something about, right? That usually doesn't, doesn't exist, or it's very uh, narrow in terms of the feedback they get from CICD. They will generally avoid engagement with compliance or infosec teams as they tend to think that um, uh, those teams are misunderstanding uh, the context or even what the scope of their job is. Um, they usually complain that um, um, compliance teams don't really understand what it takes to get the job done. Right? So they see as people that mandate them uh, to do things. They, there's no real collaboration. Right? So they usually see compliance teams two times a year when they are preparing for audits or, or in the annual awareness courses or things like that. So there's really no good collaboration and ongoing um, uh, collaboration between the teams. <laughs> Apologies. Um, so there are no agreed or insecure baselines, baselines in place or modeling of threats, uh, right? So it's not something that they do. So the teams don't get a shared mental model of what uh, what security means to each of the of the product teams. So the next one is not a security thing per se, but um, there's usually limited automated testing overall. So the practices that we could leverage to integrate security into, the, into their workflows if they were more mature doing um, automated testing. And so they're not there. And so they you usually don't get thinking about security in an automated fashion uh, when teams uh, don't do that for their own quality assurance purposes. You usually tends not to work, uh, in my opinion, and in my experience. Um, so there's no product level security reporting. Um, so security is kind of seen as an organizational problem, which leads it to being a bit abstract and reactive, um, as opposed to being a product thing, right? Something that we do as we manage uh, and develop products, where teams actually understand and are managing their backlogs according to relative prioritization amongst all of the other bugs and improvements and the feature work that they need to do. Uh, security is also generally perceived as um, uh, being someone else's job right? and uh, not something that the teams need to, ma to manage themselves. So there's the expectation that at best that someone needs to give them requirements that they need to work towards, 
uh, or worse. Um, so security being generally absent through the life cycle and seen as the things we need to do to fix the output of the pen test, uh, for instance, uh, where um, yeah, it's very reactive um, and this is something that usually tends to, um, to affect um, this, um, this archetype. So on the other side um, of the triangle, uh, we have the, uh, the gatekeepers. Um, so one of the big complaints that I hear from uh, from the rainbow makers in organizations, people that are trying to that are measured for for speed and trying to build good things for our clients, um, is that the gatekeepers are either thick or business averse or just difficult to to, to work with, uh, because they tend to come up with all strange scenarios on how things can go wrong that. Um, um, often the um, the um, uh, the other teams, the rainbow makers, they get um, they don't really see themselves or their work kind of reflected in um, in, in those documents, etc. So what likely is happening is that these gatekeepers they lack of understanding of how uh, control reliance, um, particularly the form that we usually have now with the controls in DevOps environment, uh, they usually don't understand how that works. Uh, and how that affects the software development lifecycle itself, right? Um, and how we could leverage automation um, to, to do security better and more consistently. Right? Uh, but the bigger problem is really because often these teams or these individuals, they were successful in uh, on-prem, non-continuous integration environments, uh, often they bring uh, the wrong threat model to the conversation, right? And that's uh, also something that helps in... Um, uh, the um, the rainbow maker teams not um, being able to see themselves reflected um, in the in the policies and processes they're required to to follow. So there's the one of the issues here is the team topology and understanding how uh, that team topology needs to evolve, right? The evolution um, uh, of that team topology, um, and usually there's poor traceability on what engineers do and compliance objectives. Right? So. It's very good that we are doing secure engineering or security engineering, uh, but if we don't have that uh, performed in a way where the compliance teams can consume uh, that information in a way that allows them to be more effective and not asking for screenshots and things like that, uh, when all that comes, um, then they're not getting the, the full benefit, right? And this is usually a problem with the security programs that are uh, pushed or driven uh, by gatekeepers. So some of the, the essential characteristics are they, they will usually expect or want to have um, gated processes uh, or review boards. Um, so it's uh, something along, if you uh, come here, um, if you need something approved, there's a meeting that happens every two weeks and you need to wait for the next one because they'll talk about it then, right? It's that um, kind of discrepancy between the tempo uh, of what development is doing and, um, um, yeah, and, the, and the gatekeepers. So they'll usually have very limited understanding of modern development practices, uh, and they don't trust uh, by default their engineering teams. Right? Um, they don't have trust in automation. Uh, they can they are not aware on how they can benefit from the short feedback loops. Um, so no matter what you do or evidence you could provide, they would still prefer to have a pen tester, for instance, check their application um, every single day or for every release, uh, even if that happens multiple times a day. And um, usually they'll develop policies which are verbatim copies of security standards like ISO 2701 or 2702 uh, without really doing much of the work to understand the context that they need to, to operate in. Um, so it removes or contributes to, for the rainbow makers not having a sense of agency and ownership over the security things that they um, that they're re requested to do. Uh, and because we've had a recent paradigm shift in co-evolution of practices in software development, uh, they're bringing a uh, on-prem mentality to how we build and are securing uh, cloud systems, which doesn't always work. So they haven't understood how distributed systems lead to availability, how immutability relates to integrity, or how designing for ephemerality um, can uh, help support us in our confidentiality objectives. So still in the teams, they're okay. They've got a, a great engineering culture and the, they are a learning organization. So what I mean by learning organization um, is uh, how Andrew Clay Schaffer um, talks about it. Um, so he refers to it as organizations become graduate studies in the skills they require to be successful. Right? 
So it's not about being kind of good generic experts, either around the sending our context, our environment, and doing the best we can to, to support it. Um, so there's true collaboration to establish practice, good practices, and then there's trust that the teams are rooting for the same objectives, that uh, and they've got the right incentives to keep on doing uh, secure software. So for these unicorns, usually security is embedded into their practices, right? Independent of what the policy or the process says, it's embedded into the way they do their normal work, right? They're not seen as something separate from product or service quality. Um, so teams understand the threat models of their applications, uh, the failure modes um, that usually happen. Uh, their process can see the security end-to-end. -end. So it can see this what should be feedback at the IDE level, right? When uh, someone's selecting a new uh, dependency as a developer, or how much security um, in which tests should run after every commit, uh, as opposed to in a QA environment along um, full integration tests and other things that um, we can take a bit longer uh, to do our security assurance. So there's good engineering process into how um, uh, security gets integrated into their process. Um, so compliance is code, right? In that they keep us, they don't send a spreadsheet that rainbow makers need to fill, uh, but they uh, are um, expressing the security requirements as code, as tests that the software needs to pass, uh, as they uh, as any uh, other aspect of uh, unit and integration testing, because that's how developers make sure that their code is doing what it's supposed to do and not breaking other things that it shouldn't break. And um, so there's less of a command and control ivory tower or hiding behind the keyboard, sending emails from compliance, and there's more kind of true collaboration um, yeah, and constant iterations uh, to build up the security posture of, over time. So they're not constantly fighting an audit gap um, so knowing that um, we've got uh, 10 other problems and the, they all need to get fixed, but they keep on iterating to make their, their products uh, more secure. So those were kind of the, the challenges that each of the archetypes um, usually tends to, uh, tends to face. Um, but we can help them kind of go on that journey, kind of going up that triangle. So usually addressing um, the security telemetry, thinking about well, there's a lot that can be done with open source, um, but um, understanding secrets, if we are storing secrets in code, if we are uh, using uh, static code analysis, uh, dynamic analysis, uh, those are all things that these days, um, dependency scanning, um, configuration hardening, basic things uh, that can be done in CICD, uh, most of them even without significant investment using open source. Um, usually they have a problem with a product management, uh, not prioritizing security. So th there are different re reasons why this uh, often happens. Uh, but um, usually what I, what I tend to see is that uh, if I go into an organization as a consultant, uh, what I used to do, um, if I go into, um, into an organization, I will ask um, 10 engineers and each of them will tell me straight out of their head 10 things or five to 10 things that um, they could be doing better in, in terms of security. But, but I tend not to find those on their backlog as I do with their bugs, as I do with um, with everything else that affects their product. Right? So this is what I usually call um, um, leveling the playing field, right? Usually security is not leveled for the um, for this archetype in particular. Usually security isn't leveled in the organization right? uh, because um, things that affect other areas will be on their backlog. Security typically isn't, but people know the things that they should be fixing or at least a good portion of them. Um, so the security expertise is often also missing. Um, yeah, it's not identified um, or it's not um, in the places where it needs to be. Um, so it fails to account for cognitive load uh, in incentives and business priorities. Um, there's usually also poor process assurance. So on the things that they already see themselves as accountable for, for instance, um, securing uh, your CI/CD system, um, even those things, they tend to be not very well threat modeled, um, or we don't use those opportunities of things that uh, people already see themselves as accountable for um, to kind of drive the security program and drive them to care and show care for, for security. And there's usually a low sense of agency and ownership right? um, because of, of this um, uh, low expertise and lack of telemetry. It's hard to make people feel accountable for something if they can't see it, they can't manage it, they don't have the processes and the visibility to do a better job, right? Um, so helping um, 
uh, Rainbow Maker teams or the archetype, um, these are usually some of the things that we can start on helping them uh, go up the triangle. Um, the same similar thing with um, with regards to to the gatekeepers. So usually the assignment of security responsibilities is a problem. Uh, they will tend to have uh, they will see themselves as a, um, their job only being to create policies that someone else needs to to figure out how to implement. And so there's a lot of command and control um, when uh, writing a document and expecting the world to change, uh, which is not usually how uh, things go. Um, so they haven't really understood how um, uh, being capability providers uh, is something that is very important for security teams um, in modern software development, so that people can actually consume artifacts in an easy way. Um, so pretty much in line with what the, what Nick in the previous talk he was talking about, right? Having those uh, ready things that we can consume to make uh, the the work of security uh, easier for for the people that need to do it. Um, so they will they will usually you'll see the security budget being spent outside of the realm of the development process. So no real focus on the developer experience of security. Right? Um, in the if the tools that we are buying and we buy a lot of tools um, that are not fit uh, for CI/CD, uh, then usually we end up having uh, the experience associated the developer experience associated with security is going to be bad. And if that um, if we keep on providing a bad service um, in terms of um, security capabilities, people will try to avoid uh, doing all of it. Right. Um, so stopping with those gated processes and out of band approvals um, is usually something that helps them uh, go up the triangle so figuring out how to um, provide how to get the assurances that they require but in a way that is more automated that we can uh, do a better job of integrating into the workflow um, policies often aren't written as code or expressed as user stories um, so it's something that happens and that they um, yep they don't get much input uh, and they don't get used as artifacts um, as part of the development process. Uh, there's usually a command and control ivory tower um, type of approach. Uh, we just keep saying that security is important, whether uh, it's more important than other things. I don't think it is. Uh, they still need to have a business at the end of the day, and that's what their job is. Um, so, but um, usually this is a problem with the with this archetype. And there's usually inertia um, because of the, the 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 success of the past model. Um, so having been good at securing securing on-prem environments, it doesn't make you qualified to secure cloud or uh, microservices and orchestration architect based architectures. Right? Um, there are different threat models. Um, so a lot of times we've got uh, the the teams that are uh, doing this type of work. They have um, they used to be technical, uh, and they bring a lot of outdated threat models into into the conversation. So the main thing here between these uh, these two uh, archetypes is really what the artifacts that we use for communication. So something like a OASP uh, application security verification standard is usually good for gatekeepers. Uh, they usually like the the format you can put it on a spreadsheet you can take uh, things against it uh, but usually for rainbow makers that tends not to be a format that they like to consume information uh, so something like the OWASP cheat sheets uh, that provides uh, snippets of how to do authentication well um, considerations for different uh, programming languages so th those those are the types of artifacts that um if we share them with rainbow makers they will have a better understanding of what it means to them in their own context and this is often missing. Often we have um, the, the gatekeeper teams just giving people um, the, um, the spreadsheets um, and then expecting things to, uh, to get done just because we share the spreadsheet with them, right? which does not usually happen. Um, so the main thing in going back to the original theme of um, uh, trying to think in terms of our context, right? It's very easy to say if to do um, DevSecOps well, you need to do these five things or these 10 things. Uh, a much harder part of the job, but much uh, more useful, in my opinion, is really understanding where the organization is. Right? Obviously, if you are a bank that has been doing security in a certain way for the past 20 years, it's not only the internal teams that are used to a particular experience, uh, all of those artifacts that are currently produced uh, are being used in uh, showing the market that you are being diligent in how you approach security so you you can't just change these types of things overnight 
development. And this is um, usually the challenge is figuring out, so where, do I, where am I and where do I start, right? And that's um, um, what we'll talk about here. Um, so in, usually uh, for, um, uh, for gatekeepers, in their view of the world, what is uh, preferable uh, would be a penetration test and code reviews after every commit by a security person. Because right? then we'd have uh, immediate oversight and things uh, in their view of the world, usually the current world worldview, um, that's what good security looks like. Right? But um, the, the work of trying to understand in context how we can improve um, security outcomes is really understanding what are the worldviews and what's within the realm of the, of the preferable or, or the probable, um, which is understanding what's the next step, what's an adjacent possible in the view of the stakeholder that shows that we are going in the direction that we need to go, becoming security unicorns, uh, but um, in a way that brings them onto the journey and doesn't feel like uh, inadequate. Uh, completely inadequate to them. So what I suggest is um, starting with threat modeling as code or with very specific use cases on, pol um, um, on policy as code, for instance, checking your uh, cookies. Right? Um, so most pen tests that I've seen in my life, usually the, cookie, well, the, the cookies have some are perceived as not being secure, right? So using uh, using that example as a first um, client or a first use case uh, to introduce automation into our CI CD systems, uh, making sure that we are checking the cookies and they have all of the settings that we expect them to. Right? And that proves the concept of automation, right? To gatekeepers, they see uh, something that was a problem. Uh, now they don't feel like it's a problem anymore um, because they can see that it's being enforced. People are getting feedback and it's getting them bought in uh, to different ways of doing things. That we can then kind of think further ahead on getting these integrated uh, SAS and DAST in CICD, integrating with GRC tools directly uh, once they feel comfortable that um, uh, they can manage uh, all of that output and have the conversations they need to have with the auditors. And uh, eventually doing full on uh, false positives, exceptions as code, um, so that developers have the best integrated development experience possible while still uh, doing our security processes or security chaos engineering. Right? Uh, but this is a process. You wouldn't start with fully integrated false positives as code. Uh, there's usually um, a, context, a contextual work that we need to do to bring the other stakeholders in the journey uh, for us to, uh, to get there. And it's the same thing for, and usually the constraints are trust in the teams and process. So anything that we can do to build the trust, uh, to build trust is going to be what, um, what will get the gatekeepers uh, bought in into doing things differently. Um, the same thing applies to, um, to the rainbow makers. Um, so meeting them where, where they are. Usually with something like a stride, right? That we can e easily uh, um, in 15, 20 minutes explain to someone that is not a security professional, uh, usually get enough to do a, a simple threat modeling session, right? Uh, using the four question framework, for instance. Um, so starting with the, the thing in process assurance around the things that they already own and they already see themselves as uh, responsible for, right? So using, you own uh, Jenkins or another CI/CD system. Let's uh, let me help you make a review or threat model of that particular system. And so, picking up the things that they already know, it's part of their job or it's their responsibility to use as a Trojan horse to introduce uh, good security practice. And then we can think about um, how can we. Uh, um, move on from there. How can we improve on this? And so having making a baseline tooling, um, even if copy paste of Docker commands that run security um, tests, things like that. So anything that can make we can make people um, experience security in the easiest way. Some policy as code on things that they own. Eventually. Um, to get to a point where they are being part of a risk analysis, if that's what the gatekeepers need to, to have happen, fully owning their security backlog. Uh, but uh, again, it's this approach of let's understand where teams are, let's give them a bit more that is within what they think is probable or plausible um, so that they, we can expand the worldview of what possible means um, and then work with them step by step, um, helping them um, yeah, do security in a more integrated way. So this is usually a, a, an issue with meaning, right? Uh, it's because it's not really just about the technology. And um, so this is one of my favorite code, quotes from uh, Imran from practicaldevsecops.com um, that um, he used to say in a DevOps world, a pen test is not for finding security issues, it's to improve process. 
right? And whilst we are in a, in a, in a stage where we are mostly uh, trying to find the issues and, and fix them, um, we're not really doing DevOps, right? We're not doing DevSecOps. So the way we finish this uh, is um, thinking about the, this team topology, uh, the team topologies concept and how we can evolve over time. So we really, most of the time, we really know, need to go back to basics. So uh, figure out governance mapping, how we can, when they do a test, how can I uh, tag it with uh, compliance, um, um, ISO 701 or ASVS, what does it help me do from a compliance standpoint? And after we do all of those joint things that we understand each other's world in the process and how we can inform each other, then we can go to a more facilitative uh, approach, eventually providing something as a service when it's well-defined, we know how to manage um, exceptions, we know how to do all of those things. But this is something that often we need to go back to basics with each of the individual teams, work with them to improve them, and then go back to work with a different team and then come back. So as a final note, um, so should you DevSecOps or not? Right? So in my opinion, um, secure DevOps is a matter of trust um, by the gatekeepers and agency by the rainbow makers. And if we're doing things to foster both of them, uh, then we're going to have secure DevOps. Because at the end of the day, I don't think it is an issue of, uh, of the practices themselves. I think it's mostly an issue of meaning, right? I think that uh, DevSecOps up to a point may be useful to for both the rainbow makers and gatekeepers of the organizations to kind of come together um, and have a language to share some of their concerns and start building uh, things a bit more integrated way. And then, at, but then at some point, uh, just calling it anything other than DevOps it will potentially hurt um, uh, ownership and all of that. So the issue is not really one of, um, of the practice necessarily. I think it's more one of the meaning, but it is a meaning that I think all uh, security teams should focus on probably starting with the DevSecOps so you can tap into that body of knowledge and share good things with your stakeholders, but eventually knowing that um, DevOps should be doing things securely um, by default and not uh, through a different name. And uh, that is me. Thank you very much for, for having me and happy to, to answer any questions. Thank you, Mario. Um, I Especially I will take, in, take it in mind the last one that uh, you 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 put you know and uh um we have a little bit behind the schedule but uh, let me ask a question to you um when i uh, when i talked with a security manager at apple that uh they um he, she said that uh, they even in, in the apple they have a struggle of the or challenge uh between such you know you mentioned the team <clears throat> you know the different uh, incentives or different motivation yep. in the different role and teams. And uh, for, for example, security teams finds found about you know 500 vulnerabilities, but uh, you know dev team has the, their own priority in not only the protecting the the code, but also they have to enhance the usabilities or you, you have to be competitive against the you know competitor services. So um, when when I talked with her, that uh, Apple's uh, senior manager of security, that she. Uh, strength the importance of the uh, having the common goals uh, that when you know um, you know there are all, always trade off you know you have you have to prevent or you have to protect but you have to also be um, aggressive also so uh, what is the what do you think is in that situation what is the uh, most uh, needed thing in in the DevSecOps team to realize you know that you know uh, keep up with the pace of the relativity to the market and also um, 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 keep up with the, you know, uh, bad hackers to find out mm -hmm. some news or there was any, anything else, you know. So what, what is the <clears throat> best thing, the, the most required thing? Yep. So the the challenge, as you mentioned, is usually the problem with um, uh, with conflicting goals, right? Um, so people are measured on an, on a certain type of criteria, um, and obviously it can gets really hard to, uh, to to do something else. So there are different ways that I've seen in the market overall uh, that work on trying to to address that. Uh, but at the end at the end of the day, um, the all of them share one thing in common: is that you need to have a practice that tells you. Uh, when you should be doing security work and when you shouldn't. Right? And so that can either be through uh, SLAs, right? Uh, where you've got internal teams that they know they've got a particular SLA and they use the, the, 
the the act of managing the SLA uh, the adherence to the SLA as the the driver on um, uh, to to the security, um, or um, uh, for instance in SR, uh, companies that are good with site reliability engineering with SRE, um, you ha we have also uh, metrics and mechanics such as uh, error budgets. Um, that also help inform how much security should I, uh, how much reliability in the reliability world should I be doing? And they know that when things go up above above their error budget, that they know they need to spend more time doing reliability uh, related work. Right. So uh, any answer? There are many different answers that I think work uh, well in different contexts, but all of them have this thing in common: is that you need to have a, a, a practice in the a. a, a Manage, management of a metric uh, that helps inform uh, between all of the stakeholders that are involved that uh, you should be doing security work now, right? Um, yep, yeah, that, that would be my answer. And usually that doesn't, doesn't exist, right? Um, either we have this, we've got a lot of tools and tell us a lot of things, um, but um, they're not necessarily agreed uh, with, uh, with the product managers. Um, and so it becomes difficult to, to have them uh, be prioritized. So if they're not well tagged in terms of metadata in the backlog, then we can't do good reports on how um, uh, much security work we, uh, they have on the backlog. So usually those are kind of the, the management things that happen around uh, the ability to, 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 to do that um, successfully. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mario. It's, it's nice meeting you and uh, let's keep in touch. And yep. probably, uh, please come back next year also. Thank you. Bye -bye. Enjoy Thank the rest much. of the conference. Thank you. Bye. Now uh, we overrun a little bit, but uh, lastly, we would like to invite uh, the software cyber security related uh, policy trend. We invite the Director of Cyber Security Division, Commerce and Information Policy Bureau, um, at METI, uh, Mr. Okuda. And he uh, spent some time, uh, even though he's very uh, busy, uh, as we planned, uh, we would like to have uh, 45 minutes up until 6.30. So the uh, floor is yours, uh, Mr. Fukuda. And thank you very much uh, for joining here. For whole day, we had the AI security related topics and economic uh, security uh, law has uh, in, been introduced, and the same thing happened in the US. What is going to happen with the SBOM? It is better to integrate SBOM and cyber resilience and the different uh, topics uh, have been uh, mentioned on how to utilize DevSep Ops team is another one. Now, as a policy and act uh, from the uh, government uh, perspective, um, uh, they are thinking and with that, uh, how the local government and the company should work on. So what the uh, company, uh, sorry, the government is thinking uh, is uh, serving as the foundation. Therefore, I'm looking forward to listening to your uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction. I'm Okuda from the METI. As uh, Mr. Nihara said now, in the field of the policy, cybersecurity is a very new field. Likewise, the uh, U.S. government and ourselves, while we are uh, in uh, debating ourselves, uh, we are thinking of the uh, policy uh, creation. At some point of time, um, not uh, the established um, uh, security policies are available, but uh, while uh, there is a constant change of uh, the landscape, uh, we are trying to create a new policy and what is the uh, most uh, suitable uh, as a policy which we need to think of the current situation. Therefore, uh, this is something that, that we have in our mind at uh, all time, and we'd like to have a good communication with the uh, various uh, people and uh, try to uh, review and study the policies that is important. Today, I'm going to share with you the policy related to software for what we have thought and what we have done, what we are going to do. And these are the things that I would like to explain today. Again, uh, it is appreciated if you could uh, provide us uh, various feedback. Uh, I would like to um, take uh, your screen and share the uh, materials.
今これで資料はちゃんと見えてますでしょうか、はい So, in the beginning, I'd like to talk about the importance of software security. This is uh, uh, self evident, but、uh, how we perceive it, and、uh, I will look at also different trends in different countries because、uh, policy is not a standalone only for Japan. So, we have to look at overseas trends as well. So, I'd like to introduce our perception so far. And at the METI, what we have done in the past was、uh, to work on the、um, use of OSS. And we have established、uh, some guidelines. And for SBOM, i like to take some time to talk about SBOM today in my presentation. And I will explain what we have done so far. And lastly, for the IoT equipment, we have done various initiatives. So I would like to touch on those as well. So that's、uh, uh, the outline of my talk. In the beginning, in April this year, the METI has、uh, sponsored. A、uh, industrial cybersecurity workshop、uh, together with the private sector people as well as、uh, experts and、uh, academics. So, this is an annual event、uh, to share information and have discussions on the recent trends. And in those meetings, especially this year, because of the Ukraine situation as well as the Um, uh, cyber、um, activities, so which was accelerating these days. And、uh, we have put together these messages、uh, from the、uh, workshop. And、uh, for the private sector to take measures, the government's leadership is quite important. This is something that we have repetitively stated over and over, but uh,、um, with uh, four items、uh, we have、uh, proposed. For number one, two, three,、uh, there are some details that、uh, you can find in this slide.、Uh, so we have prepared and uh, uh, those details. And、uh, first of all,、uh, number one, we would like uh, uh, the private sector to take、um, appropriate cyber securities in order to get prepared for、uh, events and incidents. So that's the first uh, item uh, of recommendation. And another point is for SMEs, especially, even SMEs have to take the security measures these days. And uh, because, uh,、uh, because of the limited resources, it's difficult for SMEs to work on security. However, Despite that,、uh, a government would like to prepare a support package, like a cybersecurity support package, together with IPA. Therefore,、um, uh, we would like、uh, the SMEs to utilize those support from the government. Especially for this year, we have added the fourth point.、Uh, this was an added new point. So, this is about the IT service providers. Uh, they have to be responsible for the、uh, products and service securities. Naturally,、uh, this is something that you are already trying to do. But in fact, there were several different incidents、uh, taking advantage of the vulnerabilities of the products so, of, provided by the IT、uh, vendors and the service providers. So, when these、uh, events happen,、uh, please、uh, take care of the, your clients and、uh, notify the clients and help the clients counter those attacks. And、uh, in the right environment,、uh, please proceed with the、uh, development work. And so,、uh, so DevSecOps is one of the initiatives that、uh, you can take uh, in uh, practicing these things. So, those were the messages、uh, from the workshop. So, regarding the product service security, securing security for products and services, this is becoming more important. Globally speaking, this is from the Quad、uh, Summit meeting Japan, US, Australia, and India.、Uh, premiers、uh, got together to have a、uh, summit meeting. Earlier this year, and、uh, in that meeting, cybersecurity was、uh, becoming an、uh, important theme. And、uh, last year, around September, there was a summit meeting where cybersecurity high official meeting was to be set up. That was agreed upon in that meeting. And based on that agreement, uh, uh, discussions were held in each country. And in May this year, as you can see here, the Quad Cybersecurity Partnership was uh,、um, 
put together and uh, uh, common principles were put together. And uh, uh, one of the pillars is uh, software security. And there are four pillars here, and one of them is software security. So we have agreed to work together on those, and uh, uh, especially in the two areas listed here. One is the standardization of baseline security and uh, implementation of those domestically. And uh, we put together some standards and uh, um, uh, tr try to uh, uh, comply with them uh, in each country. And also the economic uh, integrity is important because uh, uh, each country work uh, on their own. It is not economical. Therefore, we are working together in government procurement as well so that we can be more efficient together. So as we create the new standards, uh, the implementation of these standards uh, would be in this way. Uh, one of the ways to do that is uh, in pro government procurement, we'd like to come up with the standards uh, common to uh, among those four countries so that we can uh, promote software security. So we are going to ensure integrity uh, among uh, the four countries. So uh, those are the um, important points from the um, uh, common principles. And uh, based on those, uh, it, is, it is important to monitor and uh, prog the progress in each country. Uh, the premise is here. Uh, there are various different incidents uh, uh, happening, unfortunately, these days. So that's one of the premises uh, background. Uh, so these are just uh, some of the major incidents uh, we have seen recently. For example, the first one is solar winds incident in the US. The presidential uh, order uh, was uh, issued uh, soon after this, and uh, uh, network uh, surveillance software uh, was implanted with the malware. And uh, because of that, uh, there was a wide range of uh, uh, users who received uh, this uh, malware. And also Cassia uh, incident is another one. This is uh, based on a prevalent uh, system. And um, in those prevalent systems, uh, vulnerabilities was taken advantage of by the attacker who did the ransom attack, ransomware attack. And there are other types of attacks as well. But uh, uh, the impact of those attacks uh, is uh, becoming more diverse and uh, extensive, especially in December, there was an Apache, uh, Apache Log4j uh, vulnerability attack. So including this, uh, so for the common software and uh, general purpose software, they are taking advantage of the uh, weakness of the software. So uh, these uh, indicate that we have to take measures with those uh, uh, generally available software packages. So this is from the US. In May last year, the presidential order was issued and there are various initiatives to be taken. So that's why in May this year, the direction was shown. And for each one of the uh, items, uh, there are a specific schedule. The each uh, uh, ministries and agencies, uh, they have uh, clarified a timeline for the measures. And one of them is the security improvement of the software supply chain. And then, uh, as you can see, um, this is consistent with uh, what I have talked about uh, in the quad earlier. So the software development related uh, standards are to be crafted and uh, SBOM uh, disclosure is something that we have to discuss as well. So that's also part of the uh, this. And uh, with the labeling uh, indication, the pilot uh, system will be put into place. And uh, that was also agreed upon in May last year. And also uh, based on this uh, presidential order, in order to uh, work on the software supply chain security, NIST has been preparing various guidelines and also uh, those uh, are used in the actual government procurement activities. So the directions are becoming clearer uh, from the government side in the United States. And if you look at it specifically for the software developer, these are the procedures summarized in the guideline. And that is provided as a framework 
uh, by SSBF and that is incorporated into the SP 800-218. And also this is about the software supply chain security assurance guidance. And you can see the uh, NIST uh, is taking action in accordance with this guidance. And in September this year, they have uh, they have incorporated uh, these actions for the uh, governmental procurement in the memorandum of action. Uh, understanding has been issued in this regard. There are two points in that MOU. The all the uh, governmental organizations before the use of any sort of software uh, must be uh, able to identify the uh, uh, the suitability and adaptability uh, of SSDs, and also the certification uh, will have to be submitted by the uh, software vendors. And, and uh, the, uh, uh, also the, all the outcomes that actually matches the uh, certificate uh, should uh, be uh, uh, available uh, for the relevant organizations uh, by the uh, software vendors uh, and uh, and uh, this is uh, com um, comprising the various kind of softwares, and uh, there, there are a list of the target uh, softwares, uh, softwares shown on the bottom of the screen, as you can see. And in EU as well, cyber resilience regulation has been submitted, and, and so far, uh, since the uh, regulation has just been submitted and it's going to be discussed before its approval, so we need to closely uh, watch uh, what, uh, is, uh, what is going to uh, occur. And with this regulation, uh, later in the 2023, it's going to be effective and it will be applied in the 2025 and later. Uh, for the software security uh, uh, regulations are included in this uh, draft. Uh, including the digital products, the certification uh, system is going to be incorporated. Let's say the adaptability, the announcement, and so forth. So CE marks uh, will uh, be adopted, and that will have to be uh, submitted by the vendors. And so vulnerability now uh, will be used and uh, incidents must be detected, and uh, those uh, will have to be reported to the NIS uh, within a matter of 24 hours. That sort of uh, mandatory requirements are being included in the uh, draft version of EU Server Resilience Regulation. So if you look at those individual countries, uh, their policies, uh, they have got the uh, compatible the elements, and you can see uh, for each uh, case, uh, the uh, risk uh, is actually measured, and you can see those uh, classification is applied. And SBOM or OSS uh, management are included in the requirements, and that's also touched upon the uh, EU cyber resilience regulation. And uh, the other countries are also considering and uh, taking into uh, the si similar perspective, uh, perspectives in their regulations. And under the circumstances, the as they met what we have done so far in order to comply with the other countries' regulations, this is what uh, we have done so far. And in the METI, uh, starting from the 2019, a software task force has been put into place for in order to cope with the uh, cyber security. And the other guidelines uh, have been studied in the uh, study group. And we have established a task or software task force in, in it. And one of them uh, is, has reviewed the uh, software, including the OSS. And, and and in order to cover the vulnerability or in order to uh, have the appropriate countermeasures. And we have got some derivative uh, responsibilities, but when we established the uh, task force back in 2018, and the SBOM uh, utilization uh, discussion has been started in NTIA, that is the reason why we have started this similar discussion in our group study group. And we have come up with the, uh, some of the outcomes through our discussions. 
And that summarizes here that about the OSS uh, management vessels and the uh, case examples. And in order to utilize OSS and the uh, what kind of attention and caution should be taken, that's summarized. And the uh, license management and uh, vulnerability management, supply change management, organization, and uh, community activities, they are uh, sorted out in those criteria. And all the uh, companies have got their own examples or cases that are uh, being summarized into this. And in case of license management or vulnerability management, and uh, some of the companies have already cited examples in, uh, listed in there. And also, in order to have the uh, better control over them, they have started, the, some of the companies have started establishing the uh, system. I know that the system uh, architecture structuring has been started, and uh, by, by introducing them, uh, some of the com companies are able to refer to, to improve their uh, system. That's what we are doing. So in this way, uh, we have uh, different documentations and what is written here are specific examples. Uh, for those cases, uh, you see the details here uh, with the specific company names as well. So with many companies, uh, we have got uh, cooperation from them so that uh, um, we are gathering together different case studies. So please uh, do uh, take a look at these uh, because some of the cases may be helpful for your company's case. And uh, this year in April, sorry, in April last year, this was disclosed and we have added some more cases in August this year. So if you're interested, uh, please uh, look at this. Uh, we are updating uh, those uh, uh, from time to time. So please look at the August updates as well. Next is about SBOM and uh, how we are discussing the use of SBOM. And today there were some discussions earlier in this uh, uh, seminar. So uh, regarding uh, what SBOM is, I like to skip this and uh, using SBOM uh, the companies can uh, work on vulnerabilities more effectively. That's what we are hoping. If it's not just SBOM, but uh, license management is quite important. So many companies are focusing on this area. So including those uh, initiatives you are already taking, uh, please also consider SBOM on top of uh, uh, what you are already doing. And uh, uh, we are, the government is trying to put together a framework uh, to indicate uh, and show what uh, kind of usage is uh, useful for the companies. We would like to show that uh, more clearly going forward. And uh, in reality, at the METI, uh, the work we are doing at the moment is that uh, we want to demonstrate this. So last year and this year, we have done some demonstration projects uh, on a trial basis. Uh, we asked some of the companies uh, introducing uh, SBOM and uh, uh, to identify the possible challenges and issues for those companies. And the last year uh, a demonstration project, uh, as you can see, the impact of SBOM is to be uh, understood clearly, uh, visualized and so forth. That's what we try to do. Of course, there are some costs incurred. So cost benefit analysis should be done on SBOM introduction. So in four areas, we have uh, done this. One is uh, uh, the comparison uh, between uh, doing the management with SBOM and without SBOM. So what would be the difference? And so we uh, provided a tool so that they can see, uh, compare the case with and without SBOM. And the uh, results of these uh, experiments are summarized here. So using SBOM, there is a positive impact. That is the result so far. 
and of course uh, uh, by using creating s bombs for the uh, creation uh, the uh, discovery of uh, vulnerabilities company can reduce the time to do that and also but the more parts or software uh, they have to manage the impact positive impact of s bomb will be larger that is another finding and uh, also for the initial introduction of s bomb uh, it is a uh, quite substantial uh, the burden is quite substantial so unless we minimize this the companies cannot uh, introduce s bombs so effectively and enjoy the benefits so this is a possible challenge uh, that the government would like to tackle and at the bottom there are four issues that uh, we have faced one is uh, the optimization of s bomb usage model as i said earlier already there are various initiatives initiatives already taken by the companies therefore for all of the sectors and industries we are not uh, trying to introduce s bomb in an equal manner so rather than doing so depending on the situation of each sector and industry the government would like to show how to use and when to use uh, uh, when to start s bombs so we are uh, quite uh, uh, aware of these differences in the introduction of s bomb and another point is the environmental uh, setup when we talk about s bomb uh, what kind of uh, uh, item uh, in what granularity in what format and uh, with what uh, naming part naming convention we have to uh, introduce some guidelines on these points before the introduction of s bomb and as we do so we would like to also figure out the arrangement of contracts responsibilities and cost sharing uh, mechanisms as well and for the automatic uh, tool, uh, automatic uh, creation tool of S bombs, it will be critical for the companies to use the tools for automation. And that was the result of the demonstration last year. However, when it comes to how to use the tools and uh, for the actual use of the tool, especially for free of charge tools, uh, there is a certain know how the companies have to gain in order to get used to using those tools. So uh, by helping companies with these things, we would like to reduce the burden of the companies uh, in the introductory stage. And number four is about the in, uh, alliance with other countries, uh, international standardization. We are monitoring the progress in the United States so that uh, we can have an agreement and alignment, uh, not only with the US, but also Europe and other countries as well. So those are the four areas of uh, challenges we have put together. And based on that, this year, this fiscal year, for each sector, we uh, implemented uh, trial and uh, demonstration projects because the progress is different from sector to sector and uh, industry uh, characteristics are different. And that's why. And uh, we would like to accelerate uh, this uh, in the medical equipment as well as automotive sectors. So for those sectors that uh, we have chosen and we have conducted the demonstration projects. And this is all about software, but uh, for software area, uh, the issues and the challenges uh, are very intricately uh, uh, related to one another. So we have uh, uh, clarified some of those challenges uh, for those sectors and the companies. Later on, I would like to touch upon this a uh, little bit, but for the medical equipment uh, sector, uh, the regulation uh, is very dynamic. So we are really working together with those uh, private sector companies uh, in the medical equipment. On the other hand, for the auto sector, uh, auto sector is not that much uh, uh, advanced yet because uh, um, in terms of the owners, uh, uh, car owners, uh, individuals, pretty much. Therefore, uh, we are covering the areas only up to the manufacturers of automobiles. But one characteristic there is that uh, in the case of medical equipment, the suppliers of medical equipment, uh, their uh, layers are not that uh, complicated. But in the case of auto sector, uh, there are tier one, two, three, and the four uh, very um, detailed uh, uh, layers of uh, supplier chain. 
uh, because of that, that there are some more issues and the challenges that, that we are likely to face. In the case of uh, software, uh, I will talk about this later, but uh, uh, various different software uh, uh, products are uh, uh, ready and commercialized. So we would like to put together uh, those commercially available software packages uh, for companies. And then uh, in what areas are we working at the moment? Uh, this table shows uh, uh, the details. On the next page, there are more details, but uh, since we don't have so much time, so just verbally, I'd like to introduce the highlight. As I said, for the medical equipment area, the supplier chain is quite simple. So the demonstration project uh, involved the university hospitals so that uh, the uh, the uh, Kinki Rentogen Kogyo was the final vendor, and uh, we involved uh, those hospitals and uh, conducted the test. And as you can see on the right hand side, uh, there is the IMDRF guidance, so, uh, which talks about the use of S bombs. So we referred to those guidances. So, based on this, at the Ministry of Health, uh, they are trying to come up with the SBOM related uh, regulations. So we would like to monitor the progress on that side uh, for the legislation in Japan. So the uh, Japan uh, Medical Equipment uh, uh, Industry Association is working with us. In the auto sector, this is not the industry-wide uh, movement yet. We are just doing the demonstrations uh, uh, individually with uh, some private companies. But the final vendor is uh, um, that we worked with is Toyota. And uh, tier one supplier is Toka Rika, and uh, we involved tier two and third uh, suppliers, uh, including OSS vendors uh, on this uh, demonstration project. So that's uh, uh, still going on uh, as we speak. And uh, uh, for this area, there are United Nations uh, regulations, uh, which are trying to figure out the uh, SBOM related regulations. Uh, so uh, uh, we are referring to that in coming up with the regulations in Japan. Lastly, for software, we worked together with the Software Association. And as you can see, uh, company side, we worked with uh, Trend Micro Sakura Internet, Collabo style uh, and so forth. So for their software packages that uh, uh, we uh, looked at in the demonstration project, as I said, uh, based on the challenges identified last year, we have conducted these uh, demonstration projects. As you can see, uh, as a result of this year's uh, project, uh, we are trying to put together the know-how booklet uh, for S bombs. And that's something that we like to publicize and issue sooner or later. And in terms of the model for the use of S bombs, as I said, in the case of uh, medical equipment, uh, there is a, a good model that we are already coming up with. But in the software area, we don't have a model yet. But uh, we like to show some indication about how the companies can use S bomb um, among uh, the. Uh, software manufacturers, so we like to come up with that. And another is the trading model for the transaction or contracts. SBOM uh, introduction should be promoted. So we are trying to come up with some model of the contracts and so forth, so that we can promote the use of SBOM going forward. So uh, as we uh, finalize those documentations, uh, we would like to uh, release and disclose. Regarding the software, uh, and when we talk about SBOM, one thing we have to think about is uh, software naming, in what kind of uh, uh, standardization we can make for the uh, naming of software, because uh, SBOM creation uh, will be done pretty much by the tools. Uh, therefore, the um, actual SBOM to be created and the vulnerability information database have to be linked. And it is not realistic to compare one by one. So this should be dealt with by the machine. And therefore, uh, for the software naming convention, uh, the government is taking initiative to uh, come up with a naming convention because uh, we don't have those uh, right now today. So this is one of the tasks that the government is tackle tackling. 
So the comparison with the vulnerability database uh, in the United States, uh, there is something called the VEX. So the product suppliers uh, on top of the uh, SBOM, they make the VEX documents. This is the information on vulnerability, whether or not there's impact or not. And these will be disclosed and released so that the uh, SBOM uh, usage will be promoted even further. That's being discussed in the United States and in Japan as well, uh, the vulnerability uh, registration system is already there. So using this system, uh, the the vulnerability which is registered for those one way to use that is uh, you can using the ipa uh, organization and uh, we can disseminate the information uh, coming out of japan as well as overseas as well so using their website uh, we would like to provide the up-to-date information and uh, so in a manner that uh, the information can be uh, handled uh, by the machine. And uh, uh, also for the software naming convention uh, the government is working on, we would like to work on this uh, in parallel and uh, uh, trying to come up with the uh, guidance for the private sector companies. Lastly, IoT security measure is what I'd like to talk about. As to the IoT equipment, uh, the security kind of measures and requirements are very much needed. And uh, specifically, when you have the security incident, uh, approximately one fourth of the uh, companies have already experienced uh, the uh, security uh, incidents and they had to stop the IoT equipment, uh, OT system suspension uh, temporarily, and those products are lacking the uh, security countermeasures in and in some overseas cases the recall campaign had to be uh, done and, and that's disclosed so therefore including the development phase for the iot equipment the security countermeasures will have to be solidly uh, considered and uh, under the circumstances as many in the first place, uh, IoT SSF is uh, being established as a IoT security safety framework, and it was uh, uh, made public on the 5th of November, as uh, shown in, in you see the physical uh, space and the cyberspace uh, will be connected and infused in the society 5.0, and you can see the and that this uh, intermediate uh, layer uh, needs us to uh, utilize the IoT equipment in between. So with these IoT equipments, especially in the physical space, the information uh, communication and also the uh, communication from physical space to cyber uh, space and based upon the cyber space information uh, that would drive the uh, behavior in the physical space, those activities will take place and that will be exposed to the various kind of security risks where we need the uh, countermeasures. And, and there are major two concepts and one axis of the concept is the risk and how we measure the risk. Uh, the, the we have the uh, axis one and axis two uh, to evaluate the risks and the uh, incident occurred and then, uh, and the uh, difficulty to recover from it and 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 the other one is the uh, economic impact and uh, that one of them uh, could be the factor uh, so that has got a major impact so we are looking at those level and also in the economic impact let's say if it is used by the uh, pan society that has the major impact so and that might have the final uh, financial impact larger than the others. So, and the security safety requirements uh, must be incorporated in, but the, uh, how to do it is the issue. We have got the uh, four perspectives. First is the uh, confirmation requirements for the requirements uh, before the operation and what kind of requirements uh, would be in place. And the second point is that during the operation, the physical to connect the physical and cyber spaces as system requirement must be confirmed. And the third uh, is uh, the other uh, operators and 
the uh, capability must be confirmed to uh, operate the equipment system and also the social framework to support others. And the first perspective is uh, to and now the responsibility to the products, but there is not just a product responsibility or and then during the product liability, I think the, uh, we need to identify the requirements of the uh, operators or and the, those or have to be combined with the, let's say, insurance keep and so forth uh, in order to uh, come up with the efficient uh, security scheme that is to be improved that's covered in this framework. And this is such a conceptual summary, so it must be very difficult to uh, have the clear picture. So in April, utilizing this, that we have uh, um, disclosed the use case. And you can see from number one through number six, we have got the various kind of use cases listed in the use case booklet. And uh, so you can refer to this use case, and then you'll be able to see this compilation of the use cases. And then uh, simply put in the use case compilation, let's say the solution for AGV uh, to be deployed in the plant. So that uh, when you think about it, what kind of stakeholders are involved in what kind of system is actually included in its composition, that's sorted out in use cases and the uh, dif difficulty to recover and also the uh, financial impact of these two will be assessed uh, for the risks uh, to be associated. That's all uh, completed in this use case. And, and please refer to it. And then if you are involved in the development or if you are using those tools, and then please identify the differences uh, from what you are using or what you are doing, uh, and then you'll be able to uh, uh, utilize it when you uh, use that in the framework. And those development guidelines are being developed. And, but in the real uh, world, it's very difficult to actually apply in the real world, so especially for the mid, small side companies. What kind of activities are taking place in that? specifically uh, have been uh, heard and, the, and by the mid and the small company. They provided the products to us and, and the uh, third uh, party is uh, verifying and and uh, they uh, often come up with the uh, more vulnerabilities compared to the uh, major players, IoT equipment, and especially when OSS version is integrated and or web uh, management screen uh, uh, tends to be more valuable uh, than that of the uh, major IoT uh, players. So looking at those facts and the realities, when they meet in small companies, when they develop the IoT equipment, what they need to cope with uh, is something we are summarizing here. The guideline is laid out here, you know, both inside and outside of Japan. We have got various kind of guidelines. And, and, and then uh, referring to those different guidelines, yeah, one of them is actually developed by the METI, but uh, those existing guidelines, especially, uh, that uh, would include the important elements for the mid and small size of companies uh, 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 would be a, a included and on the based upon the uh, feedbacks we got from the uh, survey investigation with, we have done. And then also you can see, this is the last theme, IoT equipment counter measures uh, have been promoted as a government policy, uh, such as the uh, government policy development or guideline development for the mid, -term, uh, mid, mid and small size companies. But actually, the, even uh, if we implement those kind of measures and policies, the, it is very difficult to reflect uh, the uh, kind of measure cost upon the sales price. And we have the uh, certification system, but the, there's no incentive for them to get them certified because of the cost and not to be effective of the product price. And so, so the profit of security countermeasures uh, must be implemented, but it is very difficult for the IOD equipment users. That's another perspective. So we uh, must be able to indicate the uh, security countermeasures taken into the IOD equipment for uh, the visibility of the users. And that's 
uh, we have a, for that we have started the discussion starting from the first of November, and we're going to have two more discussion towards the end of the year to be able to come up with the direction. And and of course, as I said, the uh, we it is important to know the current situation about the uh, globally other activities are ongoing, and then we are capturing those uh, uh, movements in overseas countries. And in the uh, United States, uh, the presidential order, you can see IoT Cyber Security Improvement Act of 2020 actually is specifying the uh, certification scheme. And it's been specifically proposed also in EU as well. Uh, so, and and in the wide uh, perspective, the uh, this the uh, compatibility uh, is also considered for the certification. And also in the UK, the uh, code of conduct is uh, developed uh, to base on, and they have started the uh, standardized uh, criteria and. And the standard, and in Singapore, in Finland, and also Germany, the labeling uh, system has been started in UK. So we know that uh, those. So we have just started what kind of countermeasures we should be taking as a government Japan. And I have just run through all the uh, current flows and the trends. And as I said in the beginning, the software security countermeasures are very important in the government's recognition. Uh, so from the policy wise, and then looking at the other countries' uh, policies, we are still uh, exploring and and how we can infuse the uh, development and also uh, the government uh, to be able to provide uh, their products uh, to the uh, consumer. That would be the major challenge for us. So joining with us uh, to go to the private sectors, uh, we would like to further promote the discussion in this area. That is all for my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your audience. Thank you very much. Now, a couple of questions I'd like to have. Uh, this is my observation before we ask the questions about that. Mr. Eguchi, a uh, uh, counselor, uh, has put an em emphasis uh, on this particular topic. And then uh, you have started quite a lot of uh, ac actions uh, in the past one year. Uh, so I think uh, I was very much uh, amazing. And I, I'm not sure if we could get the uh, quality slip, but there are three questions coming arise. Number one, uh, just like AMOTEC, that has got the huge uh, impact to the company. But the, uh, do you have the uh, guidelines to the non engineer employees? I think you have the uh, a lot of uh, use case uh, completion. So is there any guideline not uh, for the non engineers? That's the first question. The second question is about S bomb. Let me tell summarize. Uh, apart from the OSS, the commercial services uh, would it be in the S should it be in S bomb as well? And also associated with the second question. Have you, you, you have just, uh, you, you are verifying it. So, so what kind of management solution of S bomb have you used? So the, that's the, these are the three questions altogether. In the first place, uh, the guideline uh, for the general public, that's not issued by the METI and as an official guideline, but the IPA is uh, actually issuing the guideline for the general public. Uh, what we are saying uh, to the general public uh, from the uh, METI is that when you develop the uh, talent uh, inside the companies, uh, the, uh, always you need to have the IT governing office, uh, but department, but uh, up in the other uh, business uh, departments or functionalities, they they need to come up with the elements that they need to pursue uh, from the security point of view. And uh, that uh, needs to be conveyed uh, by uh, the uh, governing IT uh, functionality. And of course, and, uh, in order for that, the skill set required to uh, be complying uh, with those requirements uh, should be clarified. Let's say uh, one of the business 
uh, you know, cannot start the uh, crowd uh, without knowing the risks associated with it. So, so they must be equipped with the uh, skill sets and also risk. So those are the things that we are uh, recommending to all the companies and also as to SBOM uh, for the commercial use. Of course, yes, it's within our target, and that's what we're discussing. And also, uh, and uh, we, and Yuji uh, Hiro uh, is uh, using the commercial uh, product uh, together with a collaboration uh, with some kind of a company. So I think. And then we have got the uh, naming convention issue. We've got a lot of issues still, but then that's what we need to promote. And as the management method, we are using the uh, several tools. And, and if it is the uh, paid tools, a synopsis of black product uh, is used in, our, in, in order to verify. Uh, so including the tool, those tools that we are currently sorting out our observations and we have started the uh, using the new other uh, tools. So, and then we'd like to capture all the uh, know-how in, in the use case uh, completion. Thank you very much. And the uh, uh, one another question is coming. Uh, it's a, a rather challenging. DevSecOps, do you, for DevSecOps, do you think the uh, leadership is important? And, and it's, it's not, the a leader uh, of this area should be the uh, MIT. Is that the case? Can we regard you as a leader in this area? Among all the government agencies, I think the NIST is the one to be a solicitor, but the, uh, maybe the software kind of measure, it needs to be uh, led by the MIT. But the government agency, is it just okay for the government agency to take a lead? That's not enough, I think. We have got a lot of uh, pol policy issues and also uh, whereas the uh, private sectors are very much active. So we need to collaborate between the uh, private sector and the government, government agency. So in that sense, then I think it's best to join hands, I guess, to cover the situation. And and I think as a natural course event, I think the uh, we uh, will execute our leadership, whereas the uh, private sector will take a leadership as well, uh, so that we'll be able to have the best collaboration. Uh, yeah, I agree. When I have a discussion uh, with the uh, government agency members, uh, there's no uh, time to come up with a framework. So, so whenever uh, those who are welcome, uh, to join hands. I think we might as well get ourselves connected. I've been called in by various kind of diet members of Congress members, but I know they will start working on with the private. Uh, I don't know if you want to mobilize the entire LB, LDP, it, it's going to be a very difficult task. So maybe the academic uh, professors or private sectors or congressmen and, and also private sectors and uh, government agencies, they all have to be engaged with each other, uh, maybe globally so that we'll be able to come up with the outcome. So in that sense, uh, please continue to support us. Uh, so in that sense, I think maybe the uh, use case compilation is uh, our policy, but I think maybe it is something to spread the uh, private sector's uh, best practice. So I think the liaison between the government agencies and also the private sector is very important. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, presentation. Uh, please update yourself in the next year's uh, uh, session. And I would like to move on to the uh, final closing of the overall session today. And I would like to say goodbye to you. Thank you very much indeed for your contribution. Uh, thank you. So we understand uh, METI is uh, doing things uh, very quickly. So for the audience, for your companies, organizations, and schools, government agencies, uh, we hope you continue your initiatives. And this video will be available with archive. So please do watch. And this is third year to do this. So I, what I want to do is really um, 
uh, penetrate uh, the concept of the cyber resilience and DevSecOps. And we see a lot of progress. So this is what I said earlier. So in many places, there are a lot of people who are, are working on this, and those dots are, are connected, and we can we can we can do something greater in a, a geopolitical or situation among uh, Japan and uh, among the uh, U.S. and uh, China. Uh, Japan plays a very important role, and cybersecurity is very important. Needless to say. And then the, the cognitive uh, fight, and then and then the, the physical warfare, and there are, are all kinds of the conflicts, and uh, cyber security and software security uh, will be very important based on uh, uh, all kinds of the aspects. So that is kind of the era that we are in. And I hope that uh, we continue to offer such a learning. So once again, this was the uh, third year. Uh, next year, uh, maybe earlier timing, we want to do this. And uh, Hassan said that uh, we want to uh, actively offer training for the people in Japan. So based on uh, what is going on, uh, we would like to think about what we can do once again. So those sponsors who support this kind of the community, I would like to introduce those sponsors. Uh, first, NTT Data, a BrainPad, Cognitive Research Labs, NRI Secure, GMO Cybersecurity, ERI, HRG, uh, Profiles, Robust Intelligence, Rich Luka Security, and the US uh, Embassy. Uh, uh, the METI and other um, ministries and agencies supported us. So we want to really continue doing this, and we appreciate your support. Uh, we are running uh, 10 minutes behind the schedule, but thank you for your joining. And those who watched uh, Saka World Cup game, maybe you need a sleep. Uh, but uh, please take a rest over the weekend. And based on the insights and input you got, and please think about what you should do uh, over the weekend and uh, next week. So uh, DevSec Ops Days Tokyo, this is the end of the event. Thank you for your participation. DevSec Ops Days Tokyo wa DevSec Ops o suishin suru tame no community katsudou ni sandou shite kudasaru ooku no kigyo dantai kara shien o uke teimasu. Platina sponsor NTT Data Brain Pad Cognitive Research Lab Gold Sponsor NRI Secure Technologies GMO Cyber Security by Ierae Silver Sponsor HRD Profiles スタートアップスポンサーロバストインテリジェンスリチェルカセキュリティ公演アメリカ大使館経済産業省総務省文部科学省デジタル庁サイバーセキュリティ戦略本部カーネギーメロン大学ソフトウェアエンジニアリングインスティテュートカーネギーメロン大学サイラボコグニティブ CTF「世界から届いた食材が彩るディナーテーブル」「約束の場所に時間通り安全に到着する交通機関」「どこでも安心して受けられる医療や薬」遠く離れて暮らす家族に贈る誕生日のプレゼントその日常は人や物をつなぐ仕組みで支えられているお客様と社会とそして世界中に広がる仲間とともに新しい仕組みを作りつないできた
世界は常に変化を続け時には想像もしなかった困難を私たちに突きつける必要なのは何ができるかではなく何をすべきか社会があるべき姿とは何か次の世代にも続く本当に豊かな暮らしとは何かそれを見つめ私たちは行動する NTT データ「ビッグデータ」や AI 技術が脚光を浴びるデータの時代がやってきた巨大企業もベンチャー企業もデータを大きな経営資源と捉えビジネスに取り入れようとしています15年以上前からデータ活用の可能性をまっすぐに信じてきた私たち今こそ一緒にデジタルトランスフォーメーションで開けるドアがたくさんあると思うのです持続可能な未来につながる扉成長し続けるできること広がるデータ分析の民主化最適な意思決定挑戦できる未来ささやかな幸せにあふれた日常あの成長ですときめく顧客体験を磨き続ける世界豊かな社会意味のある仕事を作る誰もがビジョンにチャレンジできる誰も想像できない大きな成功イントゥリアンの目からウルコの瞬間を提供する製造の矛盾化子供たちの未来データかけるワクワクイコール未来できたらいいなを形に仲間の笑顔が未来の笑顔を作る未来は作るものだというふうに考えているので仕事を通じて新しい価値をですね想像すればですね日本がまだまだですね成長できる面白い機会を作ることができると思っているので、えー、かなり広範囲のビジネスをですね僕らはご支援できるんじゃないかなというふうに思っています。その意志が世界を守る。テクノロジーは常に進化するインターネットが人々の間に広く普及し始めてからさまざまな技術が加速度的に進化し派生し広がった気がつけば私たちの暮らしは便利さという名のもとで大きく様変わりしてきたテクノロジーをどう使うかそれはその人間自身に委ねられる人はいつの時代も人が作り出した矛盾にとらわれている善か悪か勝つか負けるか傷つけるのか守り抜くのかそのパラドックスに常に挑んでいる今やビジネスだけではなく日常生活においても IT の力が不可欠になり全てがネットワークでつながる時代24時間365日社会全体が常に IT の引き起こすリスクと向き合わなければならない時代の変化を見極め新たな知識を蓄え培ってきた技術と経験によって決して負けられない戦いに挑み続けていく恐れずに進もうあなたの揺るぎない意志がこれからの時代を守っていくその仕事で人類の豊かさを確かなものにしていくんださあプロフェッショナルとしての誇りを胸にこの社会を前進させていこうその意思が世界を守る NRI セキュアテクノロジーズ「コグニティブ c t f は誰でも楽しく。セキュリティを考慮したプログラミングが学べるゲーミフィケーションプラットフォームですすでにソフトウェアエンジニアとして活躍している方もプログラミングに興味のある中学生、高校生、大学生でもどなたでもゲーム感覚でお楽しみいただけますコグニティブ c t f は政府機関の研究開発プロジェクトとしてコグニティブリサーチラボと東京大学京都大学が共同開発しました軍事大国の現役サイバー兵士が取り組むような難易度の高いものから
初めてプログラミングを学ぶ中高生の初心者の方でも楽しめるものまで多様な問題を取り揃えていますコグニティブ CTF に取り組むことで基本的なコーディングスキル暗号解読フォレンジクスリバースエンジニアリングバイナリ解析などに関する問題を解きながらハッカーとしてのスキルを向上することができます悪意を持ったハッカーがどのように攻撃してくるかについての知識がなければソフトウェアの安全と安心を保つことはできません現代はあらゆるソフトウェア開発者にハッカーとしてのスキル習得が必要になっているのですぜひあなたも一度コグニティブ CTF でハッカーとしての腕前を試して楽しくスキルアップしてみませんか QR コードを読み取ってぜひ参加登録をお願いしますどなたでも無料でお楽しみいただけます「インターネットの発展は私たちの生活を便利に豊かに変えました」。今では水やガス、電気と同じくらい生活に欠かせない重要なインフラです。会社や学校、病院、銀行や工場、ありとあらゆる場所とシステムがインターネットにつながっています。そんなインターネットがサイバー攻撃の脅威にさらされているなんてあってはならないと私たちは考えます。私たちはサイバー攻撃で使われる脆弱性や攻撃手法を日々研究していますその結果なんと直近1年間で約30件のゼロデイの脆弱性を発見しました私たちは悪意あるハッカーが攻撃するよりもずっと前にお客様のシステムのセキュリティホールを見つけてご報告します私たちはこれまで先進的なセキュリティ技術を研究し知識を共有してきました私たちはこれからも企業とシステムを利用するすべての人をサイバー攻撃から守ります目に見えない脅威から暮らしを守る日本を守るすべての人に安心と安全なインターネット HRD グループは科学的なアプローチで人事や組織の改革を強力に支援しています今多くの企業がデジタルトランスフォーメーションに取り組んでいるのではないでしょうかデジタルテクノロジーを活用することにより営業やマーケティングの見直し業務プロセスの自動化がさまざまな企業で実現されていますでは人材や組織に関してはどうでしょう一人一人の才能や個性に合わせた適材適所の実現や効果的なコミュニケーションの実践はデジタル化とは無縁のちゃんと経験に頼っているのが現状ではないでしょうかこのようなちゃんと経験に頼ってきた人事や組織の課題もデータにより解決する時代になってきています私たちの提供するディスクとプロファイル XT は科学的検証に裏打ちされた人材測定ツールです一人一人のモチベーションの源泉やそのポテンシャルを見出すことで組織や人材の課題を解決します全世界でこれまでに6000万人、10万社、日本でもこれまで120万人以上の顧客が効果を実感しているソリューションですこれからのデジタル時代の企業における改革の本質は人と組織のトランスフォーメーションにあると私たちは考えています HRD グループのディスクとプロファイル XD が組織や人材の改革を可能にします効果的なコミュニケーションによる組織力向上に興味のある方はディスクで社内の適材適所の実現や人材のポテンシャルを見出すことに興味のある方はプロファイル XT で検索してぜひ一度ホームページからお問い合わせください。<音楽>